to Miami, the home of beautiful beaches, stunning skylines and great nightlife, the perfect holiday destination. But this weekend, we're not on holiday as a new era of triathlon is born in the USA. It's the ultimate test of our sport, that 100K sweet spot where the good and the great unite. Imagine Olympic champions, world champions, Ironman world champions assembled in one race, competing across the globe multiple times a year for big money and for the chance to be crowned the T100 world champion. Stop imagining because it's right here. Swim, bike, ride. Power. Pain. All over the world. Ultimate athlete. Speed. Endurance. Relentless. The overall champion. Everything you've got, leave it out there. Well, Miami may be the destination, but it's the Homestead Miami Speedway Circuit, most commonly the home of NASCAR, that is the first venue of what feels like the start of something very, very special in triathlon. And joining me on this special occasion, we have two legends of the sport, Marinda Carfrey and Jan Fredino. Between them, they have six Ironman world titles and Jan Olympic gold medal as well. 
welcome both of you to Miami on what is going to be an historic occasion. Rini, uh, we were treated a little bit last year, weren't we? The PTO put on some fabulous events. They're very much up the ante this year, haven't they? Oh, absolutely. And this T100 series, it feels special. Uh, this is the start of something new, and I think the athletes are feeling that. Eight races this year, so uh, lots of opportunity for us to see head-to-head -head racing at the top level. Exactly. And, and yeah, on social media, you know, I do see what everyone's up to. You possibly said I could come out of retirement for this. It's that good. It is that good. It's amazing what if we've put together here, what we're seeing. You know, the first time there is actually a sense of a series leading to a world title. There is certainly something very exciting, bringing together the long distance, the Olympic distance, and having the mix of it all. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It is, isn't it? It's the start of something special. It's the start of a new world championship series in triathlon. It's bold, it's brave, it's exciting, it's new. Let's see how it plays out. OK, well, 20 contracted men and women will be here across the eight venues we have to look forward to. OK, remember as well, if you're contracted, you can do six out of the eight races. If you're Olympian, though, and you're going to the Olympic Games in Paris this year, you only need to do four, plus that grand final, of course. It's about the big money prizes as well. Seven million US dollars is the prize purse for the season. And if you win the whole thing in November, well, you get a very cool $210,000 as well. Money on the line, but it's not all about the money, of course. Rini, just explain how much we needed this in triathlon, bringing everybody in one place. Yeah, I think the competition, uh, the head-to-head -head racing, and, and the viewers getting a chance of that season-long narrative, uh, watching the best athletes go head-to-head -head so many times throughout the year, I think it's fantastic. The prize money is obviously the cherry on top. Uh, that's unprecedented precedented in our sport. So to see those numbers is always, uh, always fantastic. But more than that, just the opportunity for these athletes, and uh, it's just a, a golden era for triathlon. We get to really put the triathletes on the map, really kind of stoke the fire between these rivalries. How exciting is that, Jan? It's very exciting, but I think it's not only exciting for the athletes themselves, I think it's also very exciting from a spectator's point of view. We've got 16 of the top 20 men here, and you know, that would have been one golden race in a previous season, and we've, we've got eight more coming. It's going to be absolutely spectacular, and I am very much looking forward to it. Exactly. Well, we all start, don't we, this weekend in the USA, but the T100 series is truly global. I mean, the glamour of some of those locations, but they're all going to bring something a little bit different, and especially starting here, Rini, as well, in this kind of uh, velodrome-type NASCAR circuit. And then we're going all around the globe. Which one are you most excited for? Oh, that's a good question, Rachel. I'm excited for today, honestly. This one's right in front of us. Uh, obviously, very different racing. Uh, this one, then going on to Singapore, will be a very different course. So, uh, And that's the beauty of this as well. We're going to get racing at different sort of courses. So. The athlete who is most well-rounded is going to be crowned that world champion. Have you looked and thought which one's the most challenging? We're going to Vegas too. How exciting is that? Vegas is going to be <laughs> right up there on my list for sure. Um, but you know what? I think dealing between the tropical climate of Singapore, actually today it's pretty humid and hot out there on this kind of course, which is technically demanding. Um, you know what? I, I have to go with Rini right here and be, be in the today basket because it, it is just that good. It is indeed, and it's uh, 81 degrees right now. It's hot, and it's going to be hot on track as well. Well, the venues are glamorous, but if they didn't get you excited, well, I'm sure the superstar triathletes will. I'm born to win.
is the who's who of this sport. We have everybody here. It's a sweet spot, as I said, this 100K distance. And you can see right now, that's the 20 contracted athletes in yellow. That's who's taking part today. Pretty much everyone has opted in for this one, Jan. Who have you got your eye on to, to give a good performance in the season opener, really? Well, it is a season opener, so we're going to have to see what has happened. I've heard some good uh, rumors of athletes who've come through healthy, most of them actually. I mean, of course, an old rival and friend, Alistair Brownlee, he's up there, who's bringing a lot of titles to this, uh, to this group. But then, you know, all eyes, I think, are on Magnus Didlef. He hasn't won one of these yet, and he is going to be out there and in full force. Well, Sam Long apparently wants the title of the strongest legs this weekend. Let's see if he can do that as well. <laughs> uh, really, let's uh, go over and see who, in terms of the women, are competing out of the, the 20 contracted athletes, of course. In yellow, that's who's here this weekend for the season opener. Uh, loads of talent in the lineup. Yeah, I think headlining this field is Lucy Charles Barclay, the reigning Ironman world champion. But we have such good talent coming through. We have Paula Finlay. She races well here in Florida. Uh, she's kind of my uh, pick for, for the win. I'm going to put it out there. But uh, Emma Pallant-Brown in really fine form, been tra training down in South Africa. Uh, she's hopefully going to handle the heat a little better than she has in the past. Uh, we also have just so many other great athletes. Uh, Kat Matthews, obviously Daniela Riff. Uh, the goat in the fem on the female side. So uh, we're in for a real treat today, guys. We are indeed in first. Sam Long has strong legs. Emma Pallant Brown, she does as well. That PB <laughs> in the 10K was something special. Can she convert today? Well, it's not just the three of us who you have at company for this weekend. We also have the man who is very much the ears and the eyes of triathlon. It's Jack Kelly, and he's down at the start for us. So we're here at the swim start and I've just been having conversations with the athletes up in the athlete tent right before the swim start. Talking to Aaron Royal and Sam Laidlow in particular who said there was about a group of five or six of them who got together and discussed that we need to make this swim hard to get Magnus Ditliv, Jason West, Sam Long and some other strong runners like Yuri Kulin out of the race. The swim straight, it's 500 metres or just short of, maybe 490 metres till you get to the first turning boy. So Sam Laidlow, Aaron Royal, Ben Canute, Rico Bogan, Alistair Brownlee plan on making that really hard from the start. So maybe look for them to get in single file and try and really stretch the race out to break the, the hips of people like Magnus Titliv and Jason West. I think maybe more this field than other races that you've seen, the swim's going to play a really big role just because of that, because everyone expects Jason West to have the fastest run of the day. Everyone expects Magnus Ditliv and Sam Long to ride through the field. But if Alistair Brownlee, Sam Laidlow, Aaron Royal and that group, group have, like, things go their way, they won't even see those guys. So watch for this swim start to play a pivotal role in the race. I love that. It's starting already, isn't it? The fact that people are getting together and going, how do we beat X, Y or Z? Jan, uh, were you the like, kind of person that would get together and say, how are we going to beat such and such? I think I was more on the receiving end of that banter. Okay. But, <laughs> <Get her. laughs> to be honest, I, I, I can see that very much being the narrative of the season. You know, people are going to try and get a, uh, uh, a gap to Jason West. He is just that, at the moment, that much stronger of a runner. And I think that's going to be the tactic every time he's on the start line. Get a gap. How much is that gap? And then it is up for us to sit back, grab some popcorn and watch that gap shrink. We need some nicknames for them as well. Obviously, Jason West, the steam train. He is phenomenal. Watch out for him on the run. Obviously, we're bigging up the men here. Really, women, they go a little bit later on today. They have to wait. But in terms of conditions, is that better that they go after the men for them? You know, I think uh, the heat will obviously come down. It's going to still be very humid for the women. Um, obviously, they won't have the sun uh, as they'll be under lights, uh, which is really unique in our sport. Uh, and the wind, I think, is going to kick up. So the wind, I think, is going to play a real factor out there on the bike today. And the conditions, we've mentioned them already. It's, it's pretty hot out here. It's very windy. But in terms of when you go into the bowl, the velodrome, that I like to call it, the cauldron even, it gets even hotter. It goes up about 20 degrees. And that track temperature is pretty hard to deal with. Emma Pallant Brown, she's had difficulties here in the past. past. Uh, Jan, just tell me how hot it feels when you are running in there on this NASCAR circuit. Yeah, you've obviously got the air temperature, but then you've got, the, as you said, the temperature reflecting off the asphalt. It is going to be steaming hot out there. I think the most tricky thing today on this course, with the amount of hairpin bends that we've got, is going to be going with the wind, getting a lot of speed, making sure you don't get blown away, and then turning, and somewhere in the middle of that turn, as you hit the apex, the wind direction is going to change. And then you have to accelerate either into the wind or out of the wind. Um, it's technically demanding. 
Yeah, the wind is definitely a factor. Rhea and I are definitely struggling with it a little bit at the moment, but the time is now. A little bit of history is about to be created because it is the first time we're going to get going on the T100 World Tour. The men are ready. So without further ado, let's hand over to the starter. He is the two-time world triathlon champion, two-time Olympic champion from Great Britain, Alistair Brownlee. Twice a runner-up at the 70.3 World Championships from the United States of America, Ben Canute. He is your reigning Ironman world champion from France, Sam Laidlow. A 12-time champion of the half Ironman distance from the United States, Sam Long. A 13-time champion of the half Ironman distance from Belgium, Peter Himerick. He is the defending champion here at the Homestead Miami Speedway. From the United States of America, Jason West. Winner at Challenge Roth. Third at the Ironman World Championships and currently second in the PTO World Rankings. From Denmark, Magnus Ditlev. And a new era of triathlon about to get underway as the very first T100 about to take to the water. They're all in line, ready for the starter's command. And there they go, the swim dock pushes back. Well, the men are in the water for the very first T100 World Tour event. It comes to you from South Florida and Homestead Miami Speedway. I'm Rick Allen, and I'll be with you for the next few hours as these athletes give every ounce of energy they have to beat the best of the best. I'll be joined momentarily by the two you saw earlier, two of the greatest to ever tow the line, Jan Fredino and Rennie Carfrey. To identify some of these athletes, you see right there, difficult as they just come off of the pontoon for the start of this race, but we'll be able to point out a few of the athletes by swim caps. Magnus Ditliff has the orange swim cap. Matisse Magier with the purple swim cap. Jason West has a blue swim cap on today. The yellow swim cap, the two-time Olympic champion, Alistair Brownlee. In the green, the, young, the youngest competitor by the way, in the triathlon for the men, Rico Vogan. Aaron Royal expected to be one of the best and out front early 
in the swim has the pink swim cap and Ben Canute will have the red swim cap on to identify them in the water. They will go two and a quarter laps. And so they're coming up on their left. Just momentarily, they will get to what will be the Aussie exit. They're going to swim right past it this first time and make one complete lap before they will do an Aussie exit. And at that point in time, we'll be able to give you a little better clarification as to who's out front. As we see right now, Sam Laidlow is leading this pack. We see that pink skull cap, the swim cap on Aaron Royal. He's third back right now, but the green cap of Rico Bogan, the 23-year-old, right now right on the heels of Laidlow. Again, Laidlow, the so reigning world champion. There's that awesome yeah, exit that we talked about. Line. It'll be on their left here as they come up right to it. They won't well. go that direction yet. So the right pass it this first time. We'll take a look at the track map as to what is happening here. The swim is, as I mentioned, two and a quarter laps where they'll do the Aussie exit between that first and second lap and then on to the bike course. So on the bike, we've got 22 and a half laps. It is technical, especially considering the wind at the moment. As soon as these guys hit the apex, they're going to be faced with changing wind conditions and it's going to be on. And then onto the run course, obviously 18 kilometers. And this course here is unique in that there is nowhere to hide. There is no shade. Uh, so it's really going to get heat up down there on the, on the tarmac. You were just out there. Obviously, the, the wind is going to play a big factor does it play a factor right now as they're out there swimming? Absolutely does. They're now going out with a tailwind and they're going to be turning uh, into a headwind and that gets choppy. When you're sitting, you know, four or five feet back, you're probably more protected in the pack. So it actually might be even trickier for someone at the front to lead the pace as they're going into the waves and breaking them for the rest of the pack. And again, this event is called a non-drafting event. That's really only for the bike. Out here, you're going to try to take advantage of any legs or any type of a wake that you can get into to make this swim easier. Yeah, absolutely. You want to find some fast feet and you want to stay right on them. And uh, it'll be a real factor, as, they, as Jan said, when they turn into the chop and it is tougher going back against the wind. And Jan, you referenced earlier that normally the strategies were trying to figure out how to stay in front of you. But in this situation, are some of these athletes thinking we've got to break away and take advantage of this strength, like an Aaron Royal who could get out there, put enough gap between himself and potentially Ditlev that will give him a little bit of an advantage when they get to the run? Well, you know, Aaron Royal is someone who's so strong in the swim that you have to factor in that he also bases his bonuses from his partners on swim preens. So first out of the water is quite a tom common term that we use in triathlon, and that's his goal in every single triathlon to come out because he is also financially incentivized. And the level here in general is so high that I would expect a big first pack because everybody's trying to create a gap to Jason West. That is the narrative of the race, I think, early on. It's what everyone's trying to do because they all know if, we, if, if it's on, if they get off together with Jason, well, then the race is likely for second place. Making the first turn as they've been to the end of the lake that is here in the infield of There's Homestead nice Miami Speedway. By the way, the very right deep. Uh, the reason that lake is there is because there. when That's they needed right. to put the banking for the racetrack Second around the racetrack, there. they needed dirt. The and so they dug he down and kept right digging down the until the they got enough dirt to make the banking for the racetrack here, and that's what created this lake that these triathletes are working through now. It's amazing. We would never ever think it's such a deep, deep diving resort, whereas these guys are just floating on the surface. Aaron Royal here coming into his own. You can see he's lengthening out his stroke, and he's really getting to a comfortable place. I mean, we're not even halfway into the swim, but he's setting, settling into a long, hard rhythm. It's single file all the way for, for the field, um, which, which is unique this early on, you know? I think he's definitely trying to prove a point. First race of the season, it's on. Into the waves a little bit here for this lead pack. 
And you just see Rico Bogan there uh, going across the back of an athlete. Uh, that athlete who's in front of him, I don't know the name of that guy, but see, he's kind of pushing Rico off the feet and Rico had to jump over him to get back over to the other side. That is not fast swimming. Uh, so Rico either needs to settle on his feet or try and get up around him. And so out in front early as they've made the first turn and heading back to where they started, it is Sam Laidlow, the defending world champion. We'll see if he can hold off the hard competition as we continue. Laid low in front of Royal, as well as Rico Bogan. So the youth there, you know, Rico only 23 years old. Jan, I know you did your first triathlon when you were 19. Rico already competing at a pro level, at a very high pro level at that young age. Surprising, or is that maybe the new triathlon? It certainly feels like the trend is going that way, that everybody is, you know, getting younger and younger, having to make less and less experiments, the science of training really coming in to help, you know, make less mistakes. Back in our day, I feel like we did a lot of, you know, silly old school kind of mentality. Lots helps, lots used to be one of the credos in the group. Whereas training right now is much more measured, it's a far more calculated approach, and it gets results, and definitely makes sense from every other standpoint. You know, when you're younger, you recover faster, you can do crazier training volumes. And Rico is just one of the examples. I mean, if you look at Sam Laidler, he's not much older, and both of these guys are world champions. So, um, yeah, definitely very impressive to see that trend as to earlier, you know, even 10, 20, 20 years ago. Are we seeing, uh, for example, in the red skull cap, Ben Canute back here, he's getting an advantage from these four athletes that are in front of him, correct? I mean, he's staying right in that draft, so to speak, in the swim. He is, but from this angle, I have to say he's not looking comfortable. He looks like he's having to muscle his way through. You can see he's got his sleeves rolled up because, of course, having your aerodynamic sleeves and your race suit um, these athletes are all wearing two suits for those of us new to the sport. So the black suit that you see is a swim specific suit. Sam Laidlow has got a blue one. But underneath that, they've got an aerodynamic suit that is suitable for cycling and running. And that's what they will compete in for the rest of the race. And, you know, there is definitely a disadvantage to having your shoulders covered with an aerodynamic material, but that's not necessarily the best material for swimming. So it feels a little bit like Ben is having to muscle his way. Normally, I would also assume to see him a little bit further up, but maybe Sam is just putting on a relentless pace here, and he's actually looking extremely smooth. We were expecting the first lap to be around 11 minutes, uh, coming up on nine and a half minutes now, and they're getting close to the turn buoy, uh, which they'll turn back toward that Aussie exit. This is when they will take advantage of the Aussie exit. Uh, when they come back by it this time. Rennie, was that named after you? Aussie, Aussie exit. exit? <laughs> uh, no, I think it just uh, was founded in Australia. They started using <laughs> that Aussie exit. And so uh, certainly nothing swim related is uh, anything to do with me. But we're actually seeing a couple of packs start to form now. And I think as they round this, uh, this turn here, we will see uh, some, some packs really start to form. Coming up on the completion of the first lap. Again, it's two and a quarter laps here at Homestead Miami Speedway in the lake. Once they make the turn here around this buoy. So these buoys have been put in since the start. They weren't there in the beginning for these athletes to have a clear start. And it's also quite remarkable what very often you see in other races is that it's a very short turn until the first buoy, and then they've got a hard turn. And what you can see here is right now you see four athletes trying to go on top of each other trying to pick the shortest line around this yellow buoy and it gets into a tumble dryer kind of motion um you know fists can fly unintentionally generally but everybody's trying to get the shortest way to make you know the least amount of effort necessary to get out in front of this pack but it can be a little brutal around these boys and here we already see three athletes at the back and that's very Mag fast magnus distance. ditliff uh, just off the back there 
Yeah, and with more on that, let's go down to the guy who has a bird's eye view of this. Jack Kelly is right there watching what's happening in front of him. Yeah, so it was about 600 metres in, maybe 650 metres in, where there was a bit of a split from 10th and 11th to 12th. So Jason West was sitting in 11th position. Magnus Ditliv was sitting on his feet. And then about 650 metres in, that broke. And then it broke fast. So in the next 200 metres, they gained about 10, 15 metres on Magnus Ditliv. And you'll see that on the drone footage now, that that gap... The guy who's at the front of the back group of that gap, that's Magnus Ditliv there in the orange cap. And then right at the, the back of the front group is Jason West. So that front group, it's strung out. It's, it's about 12 people, 11 people. But Jason West is, he's there. And Jason West there is a position that I don't think Sam Laidlow, Rico Bogan, Alistair Brownlee and Aaron Royal expected or wanted him to be. So that's the big dynamic that's playing up at the moment. Magnus Ditliv has been dropped from that front group. Jason West is there. So Magnus is actually working that second group, uh, leading that second group, which I think, you know, as Jack mentioned, there's a few names in here that maybe we weren't expecting to see in these positions this early in this race. Well, uh, uh, to be frank, I would have expected a big front pack here. I was honestly thinking it would be a double digit, 10 people at least in the first pack. And, you know, Jason West is somebody that can hold on to that pack. His trouble is more on the bike. So for him to hold on on this kind of course, I would think is, is going to be tricky. There's going to be some, some big power being put out, some aggressive cycling, especially Alistair Brownlee and Sam Lalo. Between the two of them, they, they love causing a bit of havoc on the bike. <laughs> and they will certainly continue to push the accelerator as we approach the first of the Aussie exit. Jack, talk us through it. Sam Laidlow's first out of the wall. Aaron Royal right on his feet. Rico Bogan, he's just tripped over. It is very sandy. Alistair Brownlee's next. Ben Canoe. We've got Daniel Backergaard. Jason West and Matthias Margier are in that group. They're the two big people you wouldn't have expected to be there. And at the back of it, Yuri Kulin. No one would have expected Yuri Kulin to be there. David McNamee's out next. He's about 15 seconds back. That's where Magnus Ditliv is. Magnus Ditliv is out now. He's 20 seconds down on the lead group. That's a big gap because that gap's only going to continue to grow and that front group, having seen who's around them, will be motivated knowing Magnus isn't there. Magnus didn't look that good. I think the main thing there is going to be how far back is Magnus, right? Like yeah. the, the stop clock will start as soon as he gets out of the water and it'll just be, well, how long will it take? Or how much is Magnus going to have to work to catch up to that front group? I don't know about you, Rini, but right now I'm feeling the lactic, lactic acid coming you know, you have that brief moment, and this is the brutality of an Aussie exit. You've got all the blood pumping through your arms and upper body. Then you have to get up, and it feels like it just slips into your legs, only to trick you because five seconds later, you're jumping back into that horizontal plane, and that pain just sort of gets distributed around the body. And it really is a unique point to apply the pressure. We've, we now see a change in the lead as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's Aaron Royal now in the lead. Aaron Royal has made the pass on Laidlow, so he's out in front. It, and it's taking them out of rhythm, too. So they've been in a rhythm for an entire lap, and then all of a sudden, you've got to come out, you jump back in the water, and then you have to get back in that rhythm. But as you mentioned, we see Aaron Royal has taken advantage of that Aussie exit and has made a push to get up in front of this pack. Now, is that a good thing that he's leading? Because he doesn't have any help anymore. He's not in that draft. Well, I think it may just as well be a tactical move on Sam Laidlow's behalf because he did exactly the same thing in Nice. You know, I was with him there and he let us out for the first sort of half and then he saw me pull up next to him and he instantly just went and sat on my feet. So he is playing a tactically smart race and, you know, with Aaron, you can be sure that the pace is going to continue to be on and I think they're just working together and sharing the overall workload on this swim leg. Yeah, I think also, as you said earlier, uh, Aaron Royal has a uh, financial benefit if he gets out of the water first. So uh, he might be taking his turn there and trying to uh, gain that bonus uh, at the end of the swim. And, you know, for a lot of experts, Magnus Ditliff looks like a strong contender, obviously, for today's race. He can't wait for T100 year one from Miami all the way to the grand final. Um, I've actually been really uh, looking forward to this one here in Miami as it's a, a race I've uh, done previously uh, as part of uh, Clash and actually also doing it on a racetrack. I've done Daytona a lot of times and I've always uh, loved the concept of 
having everything uh, like so closely packed together on one venue where we swim uh, inside the track as well and I think it makes for some great racing and some great uh, television as well and so that's actually one of also just because it's the first race of the season is, is always special and then of course looking uh, ahead throughout the season I think uh, the grand final uh, because of the field is going to be spectacular. I really like to measure myself against the best guys and you have that racing here all the time but I think the grand final will be like one, uh, yeah, just everyone racing. So Magnus Ditliff, we heard him speaking there uh, and discussing what he's looking forward to this season. As far as personality goes, I would say Magnus may be a little more of an introvert. Sam Long on the other end of the spectrum would be the extrovert in that group. Is that kind of a good comparison between two? Yeah, I mean, I think Magnus Ditliff, he, he's, a, he's a young, talented guy, and he's very quietly spoken, as we, as we saw there. Um, but don't under, underestimate this guy. He is a weapon. And... And that's why these these men are, are, are pushing so hard. They want to stay as far away as possible from, you know, Jason West, but he's still in that group, and uh, Magnus Didliff. I honestly think he's just very calculated as well. He's somebody who measures every effort. His training is known for its methodical approach. And, you know, he's he's out there, even in his interview, sometimes he gives off the feeling he's, he just doesn't want to waste any energy right here. And he is putting all his focus and energy in there to light up some firecrackers by race time. Right now it's Aaron Royal that is out in front of the field here in Miami. There's not a group up there, they're not sitting on each other's hips, which isn't great anyways. They are strung out and these athletes are doing everything they can to help hang on. Again, we mentioned the skull caps or the swim caps that these athletes have on so that we can make sure who they are in the water. And right now that pink swim cap of Aaron Royal is setting the pace uh, just about a half a lap remaining uh, in this swim as they're going past the Aussie exit on the other side of the lake. We have Rico Bogan right there on Aaron Royal's feet now. Sam Laidlow has slipped back into third. I think, as Jan said, a calculated move from him to conserve as much energy as possible but stay within contact of the lead. Looks like Alistair Brownlee uh, is back there. It looks like fourth right now. Uh, and are we surprised by this? I, I, Alistair Brownlee, here's a 35-year-old who is so well, uh, as far as awards are concerned, he has been so well decorated with his career. But this, for him, he said, this is the perfect situation for me uh, because we have eight events that I can go out there, I can focus on. This distance is great because, as you mentioned earlier, it brings people from the longer distance, the shorter distance, brings them together to kind of the sweet spot. And Alistair Brownlee's very excited about being a part of the T100. Absolutely, and so he would be. I mean, his racing style is aggressive, and, you know, with him, it genuinely makes a difference to the 70.3 distance and having three kilometers less to run <laughs> for his pace that he sets, because he genuinely, he, he doesn't differentiate between Olympic distance and this. You know, he's just someone who is on the gas all day long. Here, sitting in fourth, that's a very typical Alistair kind of move. He will never, ever miss a front pack, but he also won't lead it out. That's just how he is, how he swims. He's he's very calculated in that way. And, you know, I think he's in a, in a, in a good position. From what I've heard, he's had a very good winter. He's had no injuries, which is the first time in a long time since November. He had a bit of bad luck racing in December in Bahrain where he got a puncture, but he has consistently been able to get in his work, which has been his downfall over the last years. So, you know, personally, I'm obviously excited to see him race, but I think there'll be a lot of fans of the sport who, who will be looking to see him take back some of the prowess that he used to command on the sport again rick allen with you and we're moving back through the field here to see where sam long is and he is in that last pack there at the aussie exit he was about 142 behind the lead that's that's a lot of time but for the strongest legs in triathlon maybe too not too much but yeah he's sitting um in that pack i think he might be in the lead yeah in that pink suit he's the the lead of that uh last pack but again that's going to be 2.30, uh, between 2.30 and 3 minutes, I would, has, I would guess, by T2, T1. 
Jack Kelly joining us. I, we should have timed you from you were down at the Aussie exit and got up here in I think about four minutes, which pretty impressive from how far away you were. Okay, we've got the second pack working here. I mentioned Jack Kelly uh, is a part of our broadcast teams, made it up here into the commentary booth. And Jack, you've been noticing some things here in the swim that are standing out. Like we talked about uh, before the start of the race, Rick, that front group really strung it out. We saw Sam Laidlow go to the front of the race from the start, and it was single file within like 200 metres, which that, that doesn't happen very often that the whole race becomes single file. This back group is probably the biggest, uh, like, you know, the, the group here is, you don't want to say they're out of the race, but they're a long way back because of that. And it's got Sam Long in it. It's Leon Chevalier as well and Arthur Horso. And that, that gap was 145 back at the start, at the start uh, of the second lap. But to me now, it looks like it's, it's also almost two and a half, three minutes. It looks a long way to me. Um, and you can see that front group is still really strung out, Jan. So. Look at this. this. is Rico Bogan saying, hey, I want to take over this race. A little strong sprint here at the end of the swim. Well, he's uh, received some comments uh, of people saying that he only won a world championship because the field wasn't deep enough. And I think he's out here to prove a point. And genuinely, that is a very, very good source of motivation. As these athletes just passed each other on the other side, Going back to Sam Long and, uh, um, and, and, and his companions, I mean, they are a strong bike group, but it is going to be tricky for them to make up this kind of time. It, it's a lot of time very early on, as the front is also, as we know, dedicated. They're committed, and there are no slouches waiting around for anyone to make up time. This is a good group pulling away here. They're going to be going from the water temperature, which right now is 27.4 Celsius or 81. Point three degrees Fahrenheit out onto the racetrack which right now the racetrack temp is a hundred and ten degrees Fahrenheit that is 43.3 degrees Celsius so very warm racing surface which they are going to transition from this water onto the bike yeah I think uh, they probably won't notice it just at the start but as those laps start adding up it's just going to get hotter and hotter I mean I've, I think they'll welcome the breeze but uh, yeah you, there's no hiding when it's a hundred over a hundred on the pavement so we've got Rico Bogan coming out of the water first. Uh, Aaron Royals there with him, Sam Laidlow. Rico Bogan really strung that out late. Alistair Brownlee was out fourth there. I think the interesting thing will be when they see, see Jason West and Mattis Margier and maybe uh, not expecting them to be there with them, what they do in this group. We know that Rico Bogan, uh, Alistair Brownlee, Sam Laidlow are all really motivated usually to ride hard. And I think having Jason West and Mattis there will motivate them even more. Enrico Bergen, very concentrated here. He's already taken on nutrition, so he's had a little gel that he's carried with him. It's about 100 calories in that. And just making sure he stays topped up on the energy. He knows what's coming, but incredibly in control. You know, he's running out to get all these things. He's pulled down his first layer, his swimming layer. He's about to get changed, put on his helmet, first out on the bike as well. And um, this is exciting to see from the young world champion. Jan, you've got experience of being in this front group. This is where you lived. Alistair Brownlee, very notorious for pushing the pace early. Can you talk to me about these dynamics at the start of the bike? How hard is it? Who's known to push? Who'll sit in? Well, Jack, you see, I'm also notorious for stuffing up the first transition. So unfortunately, I very <laughs> often lost that advantage that I had there and then was the one trying to push to stay in the front with these guys. Um, that's why I'm so impressed with Rico. He's just getting it all together. He's already in his shoes before the first turn. And, you know, this is really where we're playing cat and mouse to see who's coming. Magnus Ditlev just out of the water there. And he's not looking overly energized. I mean, we know he's going to be extremely strong on the bike and it, it, it's early days, but I am very impressed with what this first group is putting together, especially young Rico Bogan off the front here, just allowing himself a little bit of breathing room for the others to actually catch him and spend extra biscuits, as we call them, um, that the other ones, you know, extra matches that they have to burn. And that's uh, Rudy Von Berg getting on the bike there. We uh, have Peter Heimrich and Come on, Peter. Magnus Ditlev, both getting on the bike there together, along with Clement Mignon. So a strong, very strong bike pack there, but I think uh, uh, the cream of the crop is Magnus Ditlev. Brad Weiss just oh, off the back. Sorry. Yep. sorry. J Brad Weiss just coming out of the water there, just off the back. He would have really loved to have been in that group with Magnus Ditlev. 
He's a very, very aerodynamic cyclist, a very good climber, obviously, power to weight ratio, but he's got a few seconds to make up here on the first group. And you trained with Vice, uh, that South African background, uh, got you guys together. Is there, you know, secrets you can tell about him, his, his training? I mean, does he do something out of the ordinary or was he pushing you when you guys were training? You know, to be honest, th there aren't many secrets. I think the secret to anything is consistency, and he is somebody who's very motivated. He's always in a good mood. He's he's a happy guy to be around. He's been one of my favorite training partners. Um, you know, he's a family guy. He's got a young daughter, and they're probably back home watching right now and cheering on Daddy, uh, as they should be, because he, you know, like all of these guys, dedicates their life and his life to to athletic excellence. Rennie, now that we're on the bike, let's talk a little bit about the rules here. This is where drafting you cannot do. You have to stay 20 meters apart. If you want to overtake another athlete, you have to do it in a 45 second period of time. Otherwise, you've got to drop back and get that 20 meters again if you can't complete that pass. But there's penalties for that. If you're the first time that you have an infraction there, it's a three minute penalty for any kind of drafting. The second time, you'll also get that three minute penalty. The third time, you're disqualified. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're seeing Sam Long here on screen uh, making his way into transition. Um, but yes, uh, going back to drafting, it is not allowed. And we do have Race Ranger in intact here in this race where the athletes will have a, a light on their bike that will go red or flash when they get in those draft zones. So it's, you know, a, another way that the athletes can police themselves. Obviously, there are draft ma marshals out on course that will be uh, following along with the athletes and make sure everybody is uh, evenly spaced and, and, and not, you know, trying to get an unfair advantage. I think that's the, the main thing here. No one's trying to get an unfair advantage. And if they are, then yes, there will be penalties given. <laughs> and we heard the crowd favorite there. Sam Long, uh, crowd cheering him on as he was able to get on the bike and out onto the course. And there's some tricky parts to this course, too, because when you have the wind behind you, you're going to be carrying more speed into a turn than maybe you would normally anticipate. And a lot of people mention when they come to this racetrack or Daytona, where we've seen a triathlon before, because it's flat, they like to stay down in the TT position uh, as long as they can. But there are certain points where it's hard to stay in that position and still be able to uh, take over, like we're seeing now, another athlete through a turn. Martiz Magier, as I think we expected, taking the lead. He's a very aggressive cyclist, along with Alistair Brownlee coming through. And this is what we expected. You have to remember here that due to the rules, it is very crucial. These athletes are only passed on the right. Um, everything else would be an infringement. And coming through these chicanes, um, which... Some of them have a banking, some of them have an angle. It is absolutely crucial to stay aware of where you are and that you only pass on the right because anything else could result in disqualification. There is the odd case if it's dangerous to pass on the right through that chicane that you can pass on the inside. Uh, so they will not be giving penalties on the odd you know, occasion that that happens because again, the name of the game is whether you're trying to gain an unfair advantage. So normally, yes, if it's a straight course, but because this has that chicane through there, uh, they will not give a penalty if the athlete is, um, you know, just in the wrong place. Right. They mentioned, the officials told us that if they don't make a habit of it. Yes. You don't do it over and over, it, it won't be called. But if you do it over and over for an advantage, you would get called. So we've seen some interesting things start developing here. This league group, Matthias Margier, just like the US Open last year, as soon as he gets to the front of the race, he goes and pushes the pace. Yuri Kulin's still in it. Uh, we saw Jason West just on the back end of it, but he's not there quite yet. Probably the two most interesting things were that Sam Long is three and a half minutes behind, which is a long time when you've got a motivated group of you know, almost like 15 athletes, as you can see here, working together. That makes it harder and harder for him to catch up. Magnus Ditliv was a minute 15 behind out of T1. So, you know, that's a that's a fair way back, but it's probably about where we expected, really. And because he'll be able to see this big group, it will motivate him to get back up. They're not gone and forgotten. They're right there in front of his vision on this course. I'll give you the rundown of the top 12 now. We've got Margerie up front, Bogan, Brownlee, Royal, Coolen. Then Canute, Kulhaas, Jason West, Barnaby, Laidlow, McNamee, 
and Bakagard. And those are the top 12 right now. That was that group that we saw on the screen. Yeah, and it's amazing how much it's spaced out in such a short time already. Of course, you have to factor in 20 meters. And that's why it's also crucial, you know, to place yourself strategically along the way. But Matis here putting on the pace already, trying to split this group. And we are now technically on lap one. So, you know, he's going to make sure you can see that field spread out. It's already tearing after the fifth rider. And that's going to be quite something. I, you'll kind of expect Sam Laidlow to probably lose a few seconds in transition one just because he would have been putting on his socks. Um, but then he makes that time up very, very quickly. The road course here, or the uh, bike course right now, is 3.55 kilometers, just over 2.2 miles that they travel in about five minutes uh, is what they're turning a lap here, uh, which is blazing. So we really have seen the first big split of the bike here. We've got a group of five out in front. We've got Matthias Margier, Rico Bergen, Alistair Brownlee, Aaron Royal, which is a little bit surprising, but the, the big surprise packet is that Yuri Kjorn, who everyone regards as one of the best uh, runners in the field, has made this select group of five. So clearly we talk about what changes have people made in the off season and how are they going to come back into the new year? Clearly, Yuri Kuhl and Swim and Bike have both improved a lot to put him in this position in this elite field. Uh, and that, that group of five, when it's led by people like Matthias Margier and Alistair Brownlee, you know they're going to keep riding hard. In picture here, we've got Daniel Beckegaard. He is trying to make up some time as well. He is a very, very strong pool swimmer. He comes from a swimming background and has put down some phenomenal 1500 meter times, I think in the 15 minute range even. So very, very impressive. And he is leading Jason West on the charge here. And of course, the lead group will be hoping that he doesn't do too much work on <laughs> Jason's behalf. And that's, that's the fear right now of this field. Is Jason West is within striking distance at T2 one of the best runners in this field uh, that can reel in anybody who gets out in front of him within reason. Uh, we've seen it before, very strong runner. And when I talked to Jason earlier this week, he mentioned this condition, the weather conditions, actually favor him. He likes the hot, humid weather. He feels like that hurts his competitors more than it hurts him. Well, he is defending champion here in Miami, so he can race very well in these conditions, and I think he welcomes it. He's excited for this challenge. But uh, we're back with uh, Matthias Magier on, on screen there, Rico Bogan, Brownlee, Royal, Coolen. They're sort of forming a pack of five now, and then we have Canute, Barnaby, Laidlow falling back, which is a little bit of a surprise. Coolhaas, Backerhard, Backerhard, sorry, and West um, in that sort of what looks to be a second pack, but... Again, I think this is, you know, early stages and, and a lot left to shake out. And again, it's 22 laps on the bike here in the road course at Homestead Miami Speedway. Currently, Martis Marge out front of this pack. The young Rico Bogan running second. There are the top five all on screen, as we've mentioned. Matisse, Rico Bogan, Brownlee, Royal, and Kulin. You can see that Matthias has come to the front and he's really pushing hard here because you can see that in the, the fourth and fifth wheel, Aaron Royal's almost struggling to get onto Alistair Brownlee's wheel. He pulled off wide and he tried to sort of usher Yuri Kulin through as if, as if to say, hey, come and do a turn, help me get back here. Let's, let's like stay in touch with this group. But as you can see, that gap is forming a little bit um, and, and clearly the pace is hot. I can tell you there's some honest self-dialogue going on with <laughs> Aaron Royal right there. Very last second getting out of the aerodynamic dynamic position to avoid that little fixed patch that we just saw in that turn. They've actually poured a little concrete patch and it's a different surface in the light. I personally found it to look quite intimidating because it just, it just looks slippery. But Aaron Royal staying in the aerodynamic position until the very last second, second just to try and not drop that wheel. There'd be some serious inner dialogue going on. And funny enough, I'm looking at Rico Bogan. Every screenshot we've seen of him, he is fledging his teeth. He has been fighting, and he's just begging for Alistair to come around him right now because Matisse is just, he is stomping on the pace 
and laying down his pace early on. And let me tell you from experience, that's a very honest pace. How mental is this right now for these athletes? Matisse is trying to do something that I think a lot of people out here didn't expect. And for them, are they questioning, all right, should I be going with him? Should I stay at my own pace? How much mental is playing into this game? Personally, I think Matisse is somebody that right now is actually in a comfortable position himself. He is doing his own thing. He's come out and he knows he's gone through winter and laid down the law on training and he is now laying down the law on everybody else in this field. And he's focused on not overexerting himself. He's probably, you know, even leaving a little bit of en energy in case someone like Magnus Ditliff comes around down the line. Interesting to me is what Alistair is thinking right now. Is he waiting to create a gap so that he could break Rico early on to come around him and let enough of a time gap create? But it's certainly forming and, you know, well, in this camera angle, it always looks like they're too close, which <laughs> right. which they wouldn't be. Honestly, it's, it, it's a distorting angle. But Alistair, I think, is playing a surprisingly tactical game uh, and not just simply following Matisse. Yeah, I think you're right. I think Alistair seems to be playing a bit of cat and mouse there. Uh, he wants that gap to widen so that he can jump in. But honestly, I think Matisse Magier is just having an incredible day. And here we go. Alistair Brownlee making the pass here. Uh, Rico Bogan just going to try and hold on for as long as he possibly can. That puts Brownlee into the second spot now, and he begins to give chase to Matisse out front. Brownlee running in that second spot now. There's a few of those patches we see uh, through the turns that, Jan, you referenced uh, maybe just visually a little uncomfortable trying to avoid those potentially because they don't look like the other surface that you're racing on and riding on. Well, when you're riding the course, most of these turns are actually banked, uh, which means that they have a slight angle which allow you to lean in and take a more aggressive line that they wouldn't allow for a flatter kind of turn. But, you know, Alistair has waited here for the technical section because it's obviously easier to carry speed if you're confident, especially having your arms closed out in front of you. It is much harder to take a corner uh, very aggressively, as we see Alistair exactly doing exactly that, getting out of his error position in order to take this corner a little bit more aggressive, looking around and, you know, trying to close that gap to Martis out the front. Here's how he got into that second spot. This would have been with the wind behind him coming into this turn, going back into the road course off of the oval. And we mentioned earlier, you must pass on the right, and that's exactly what Alistair Brownlee did. And here he is now slowly closing that gap. You see, um, you see Yuri Kulin and Aaron Royal at the back now closing that gap over to Rico Bogan. And it looks like it's an early breakaway for the two boys at the front, which, quite frankly, I don't know about you, Jack, but I've, this is something I expected to see. I mean, Alistair Brownlee and Matthias Margier, if you had said, tell me two guys who are likely to be off the front, you know, 15K into the bike, they're two pretty high up on your list. We've seen it before from both of them. Matthias, obviously, when he raced you at the US Open, Jan and Alistair Brownlee, every, every race he's ever done. Uh, and interestingly <laughs> enough, they're, they're keeping Magnus Ditliv at that 1 minute 10 back, which is an indication of how fast they're riding because we all know how fast Magnus rides. Like, he is, he is that kind of guy who does tend to build into his rides. He sort of starts a bit easier and works into them late, but it's, it's still obviously indicative of how fast they are riding. Yeah, complimenting to that, I was speaking to Alistair, and Alistair actually told me that Matisse is the one rider that's impressed him the most in his career. You know, I was kind of expecting Sam Laidlow to probably be on here, but that's because I forget that he always puts on his compression socks in transition one. So he's got um, trouble with his calves and, and, and a little bit of an injury issue with, the, with his feet, and therefore he always puts his socks on in transition one. There is some aerodynamic benefit to that as well, uh, but for him, it's mainly something he has to do in order to keep his calves in shape and, and, and get them run ready. And this has obviously cost him here because, you know, the pace is hot. These guys would be pushing serious power and, you know, making sure that they stay away from someone like Magnus. 
Do you think with Sam Laidlow being 40 seconds down from the lead here, Jan, and Magnus Dibley being that minute, minute 10 back, will Sam sort of conserve, wait for Magnus to come past and then work with him to get back to the front? Would that be on his brain at all, or is he just riding within himself and doing his own thing? You know, it, it, it's always early days, and it's the first race of the season. So, you know, there's been a lot of speculation what Sam's form has been like. And, you know, his swim is obviously an early indication, but he is a very, very good swimmer who can get to a high level with, I think, a limited amount of training. But in his bike, we are not quite sure right now if it's his actual fitness this early on in the season or if he is just playing the tactical games and indeed waiting for someone like Magnus because he is capable of riding with or even out riding on his day, someone like Magnus Didlev, of which there are very few in the world who are able to do that. Alistair Brownlee, uh, when he was training for this T100, he said, you know, you've got to use the time you have as effectively as you can in your week. And so this event, uh, the first event of the year, really showing who had the best, I guess, winter season and winter training uh, that took place. Alistair Brownlee, you know, one of the biggest names in triathlon. He burst onto the scene as a real prodigy, but now he's relishing the role of that elder statesman. I certainly is feel um, an older athlete now and I'm in uh, the twilight days of my career for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, across endurance sport, triathlon on the whole is a young man's game. I was um, the best in the world as a 21-year-old, effectively, and it's now 15 years later and uh, I'm still racing. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it's a case of endurance sport. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it does tend to, to favour young people, but yeah, hopefully, you know, with um, age comes experience and um, I'm obviously trying to leverage that as much as I can to, to perform as well as I can. It'd be very special for me to uh, be the first ever T100 world champion. I, I uh, feel like I haven't performed as well as I would have liked to at long distance racing, so um, to, to do that would at least uh, fulfill that itch to some extent. And yeah, as I said before, I think it's really special that it has a, a world title as part of the series, and um, I'm looking forward to trying the best I can to see, see if I can win. That again is, you know, to almost an athlete, everyone has said how unique this is, but is necessary and needed for the triathlon, the T100, a distance where you all come together. We have, as you guys both mentioned at the start of the show, the 20 best athletes that will get together at different venues around the world and have a world champion. And that's just hasn't been uh, available to these athletes for years. And so now, this is that opportunity, and it was great to hear from Alistair Brownlee saying, you know, that's one of the things that would be great for him if he could walk away from this season and call himself the T100 Triathlon World Tour Champion. Yeah, Alistair Brownlee just has such a, you know, an amazing resume when you look at it, but in the long course racing, he's been very hit, hit or miss. He's either really on or he's, he's really off, and, and I think a lot of that has been due to injury over the years. Um, I just hope he can have a healthy, strong season and we can see Alistair you know, doing what he does best, and that's you know, win races. So uh, these two men here are pushing away from the rest of the field now. It looks like a 25 to 30 second gap to Bogan, Royal, Coolen, Laidlow. Uh, so, oh, sorry, Laidlow's a little further back there, but... Yeah, the, that just shows how fast they're riding. You know, they have the gas fully on. And I think you said Matisse Medjia is metering his effort. But I, I think, you know, it still says a lot to how strong these men are, that they can just ride away from, you know, the reigning 70.3 world champion. <laughs> he is a young, young fella, but uh, still a, a very strong cyclist. Sam Laidlow right now in that sixth position. And even though... He hails from France. He's got the support of his father here, and Rachel's with him. Much, uh, Rick. Yeah, I've got Richard Laidlow here. He's father and coach of Sam, and also coach of Arthur Corso as well, who's making a wild car here. Uh, Richard, thanks for joining us. I'm sure very nervous right now. What are you wearing? Hats of dad or hat of coach? Uh, hats of spectator at the moment. There's not a lot I can do with them. Uh, obviously, they're out there. Uh, for me, today, sort of a warm-up event to see how, where, how the winter's actually gone and see where we need to improve. So I, I'm just observing more than anything else. 
what have you specifically been working on over the winter, considering what an end to the season Sam had specifically? Yeah, this year, over the winter we've just been about consistency. Anything really, we're trying to get his swimming, his cycling, his running as consistent as possible. No injuries, no illnesses, and if we can do that through the season, uh, then then he'll be strong by the end of it. So he's good. How much has your life and Sam's life changed after what happened to him late last year? Well, uh, I wouldn't say a huge amount. We've been in the sport. I've been into triathlon and been coaching people for 20, 22 years in, in France, it's alone. So it's always been part of it, been part of our life. And now, obviously, Sam, being the world champion, Ironman champion, has made that. Obviously, he's given a step up. I'd say the biggest difference is uh, getting people, getting TV crews and everything else coming to actually visit us. A bit more attention, right? Yeah, absolutely. A bit more attention, yeah, which, uh, which is not a bad thing. Exactly. And talk to me about Artur as well. Making a wild car here. I love, if you don't know, follow him on social media. He's calling himself the Dark Horse. I love that he's setting that up. Is he a Dark Horse early on in the season? Not for this race. I mean, not today. No, I, I, we're here again just to see where he actually is, where he needs to actually improve. Last season, he had an amazing season uh, winning a sort of Ironman Lanzarote and then coming across to the World Championships and finishing sixth at the World Championships. People sort of wrote him off as an actual athlete, and that's one of the reasons why he's Token, taken the dark horse uh, he's improved a huge amount and it's just again the consistency stepping stone that we're just moving forward to today again he's seeing where he actually is uh, we know he's a weaker swimmer uh, and it's how how much do we need to improve him to be up uh, up at the, the pointy end in terms of what's happening right now sam up to sixth on the bike what is the plan for the rest of the race is this where you wanted him to be right now well, yeah, I mean, anywhere near the front, is it's good. Uh, we'll see. We've worked hard in his running. His running's have really been strong, so it'll be quite interesting. I think he's just playing it a little bit safe because of the heat and the humidity here. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. I expect him over the course to start coming through a little bit stronger uh, and then hopefully uh, get off and actually be able to have a strong run. Where are you going to go and place yourself now? In the VIP, enjoying the champagne and the view or out, out there oh, on the uh, course? Outside on the course, always, always. Maybe afterwards in the VIP, but for the moment, no, I'll stay in here. Well, good luck to both of your athletes. Thank you, Thank you for chatting to us, Richard. Right, Rick, back to you. <laughs> yep, and we do see Sam laid low in that sixth spot still. Yeah, and he's out by himself, obviously, but it must have happened as he got on the bike. As you can see, beautiful in the side shot, he has already lost his, si his bottle on the back um so jumping onto the bike and in this kind of heat well you don't want to foresee anything but he's missing some of his nutrition and hopefully he can get some of the on-course nutrition Matisse Magier still out in front with Brownlee just a couple seconds behind and then it's Rico Bogan in third Kulin is fourth and Aaron Royal in the fifth spot right now 37 seconds behind race leader Matisse. And this would be the first athlete being lapped um, and you know that's that's interesting because of the dynamics on this course we've got 22 laps on the bike normally this would be a disqualification but because the laps are small enough this athlete is actually allowed to continue and um, pass on but he does have to keep a distance over to 50 the 50 meters yeah 50 meters he's not allowed to unlap himself once you've get, gotten lap you're not allowed to unlap yourself so that's one of the drawbacks obviously of these shorter laps but at the same time it plays into the hand of Matisse Margier it does look like they're about to lap another athlete there. Um, so two two athletes will be lapped on the course. And Matthias Magier uh, shows no mercy. Uh, he is forging forward. And we have... So that was Magnus Ditliv there. He's still a minute, 12 seconds behind. We saw that front group. They've now gone behind up around Leon Chevalier and Arta Horso. So they're about four and a half minutes back. And... Yeah, like Rick and Jan just talked about, they now have to drop back and be 50 metres behind Alistair and Rico. And then every group that goes past them, so say if we see uh, say if we see Rico, Bogan, Al uh, Aaron Royal come past them next, <laughs> they then have to drop 50 metres behind them and so on and so on. Them. So it really does have an effect on their race and it is part of the unique nature of this course. Those long pulls that we see out of Magnus Ditlip. 
And you had mentioned the water bottles not being on the back. There are aid stations that they can grab if they need hydration, they need water, they can grab water. But one see, of the aid stations. But you see, Rick, what happens here, and we've seen it many times now with every single athlete. It's happened to Rico Bogan, it's happened to Matisse, it's happened to um, to Alistair as well, is that it's very hot and humid outside, and these bottles are ice-cooled, which means they've got the, the uh, humidity on the outside, and it makes it very tricky for these athletes to, to grab the bottles. And all of them have missed the bottles, and therefore, um, yeah, it's, it's not as easy as it seems. I think for someone like Sam Laidlaw, who actually has lost a bottle, you know, riding 45 kilometers an hour past an aid station, it's almost impossible to pick up. So you, for him, I you know, would suggest that he slows down, picks up a, picks up a bottle, and keeps going. And that looks like. There's Mar Matisse Margier, and he is just in front of Alistair Brownlee. Those two have pulled away. They have 40 seconds over Rico Bogan, who is currently third. Yuri Kulin in the fourth position. Those two are running together as well. You see them back off in the distance. And then we see everyone else slowly moving back. Magnus Didliff holding his own. Running, well, a few seconds behind uh, Sam Laidlow. It was actually not him that we saw earlier on, but um, he's making his, w his way through the field. But these two at the front, they're holding their own. They are absolutely dominating the pace. Well, actually, to be fair, we should say Matisse is, hold is, is dominating the pace. He has, uh, Alistair hasn't taken the lead yet, and Matisse is just, yeah, uh, having a, an absolute field day out the front here. But it's early days. And there is only really two people who are holding pace with this front group. Sam Laidlow's not losing a whole lot. He sort of stayed 40 to 50 seconds back from Alistair and Matthias Margier. And then we've seen that Magnus Ditliv is holding pace with them about a minute back. But everyone else is losing time. And, yeah, we're, we're not far off seeing these two be a minute up from, from all of those chasers who will come together, which is quite a big lead early, don't you think, Rennie? Yeah, I mean, it's impressive what these men are doing. But, uh, yeah, uh, what I'm most interested in is they were able to pick up their bottles there. Uh, they were able to slow down and actually uh, pick up the bottles. And I think that just shows how hot it is down on track. Uh, they're slowing down to make sure they get on that fluid. And, and they have placed those aid stations at the slowest points um, on the course. Obviously, there's not going to be many slow points on, on this fast course. But there are a couple where the athletes do have to slow down going into corners. So... Um, the be giving them the best chance to pick up some fluids as they go along. Yeah, we've seen that Mattis has been the one who's done all of the work so far, and Alistair's sit sitting back. He's he's the only one who didn't get distance by him. Is he sitting back there conserving himself and not doing what Alistair usually does, which is, hey, I'm the one who's got to take responsibility. I'm the one who's got to push the pace. Is he sort of embracing being conservative, letting someone else do the work, or is it just that he can't quite and the pace is a little bit too hot for him to go around if he did want to? Well, that's obviously the question. You know, from the outside, it's always easy saying, oh, you know, he's playing a tactical game. But Matisse is riding hard. He is putting down some very impressive power. And, you know, it's, yeah, currently we have him clocking 50, almost 56K an hour on a flat surface, you know, on a flat track. And uh, the wind does play a little bit into that. But I think, you know, you, you try and pick your battles. And... This is, I think, what all the Brownlee fans have been hoping for for years, is that Alistair finally uses <laughs> that very, very intelligent mind of his <laughs> to, actually imply, to actually race intelligently and perhaps wait um, just a little bit to save a little bit of energy and then unleash on the run. Because you have to remember, Matisse is also, he, he's a good runner. He's not, you know, he's, he's not Jason West kind of fast, <laughs> but he is definitely somebody who can hold his own, uh, hold his own and, and put down a strong performance. So, you know, I think Alistair, hopefully he's playing a smart game, but either way, he's doing his best to hold on. And I sort of asked Jan, as a 
you know, shameless Alistair Brownlee fan hoping that you would answer and say, I think that Alistair is probably being conservative here because you're right. Every diehard Alistair Brownlee fan for years has said if only he could just hold back and not go too hard too early, he'd be able to win a, a PTO race or a 70.3 World Championship. So, yeah, I sort of do hope that that's what we're seeing. But obviously with what Matias, Matias Maggio is known for doing, you can only imagine he's a hot pace and maybe he's just, he's just trying to hold on for dear life. And we heard from Alistair earlier about how important this T100 is. Uh, the T100 to him is another box that he'd like to check on a career that has been just phenomenal. Uh, a couple Olympic gold medals, just an amazing career already. And now we're seeing a lot of focus on potentially the strategy of being able to win a T100 and kick off this very first event in victory lane. Well, looking at his facial expression right there, you know, after years and years of having been dealt pain by Alistair Bradley, <laughs> I can tell you right there, he's not comfortable. He is not sitting on his L-shaped couch and waiting for the next attack or, or planning it. I think he's, uh, he's realizing the ride pace is hot. And I agree 100% with you, Jack, that, you know, he's such a good athlete. And people forget how good he was in his day. I mean, again, I was on the receiving end of that. And nowadays, with a bit of dif distance, I can say I am absolutely a Alistair Brownlee fan. And I really, really hope that he can translate that consistency he's had over the winter. But um, that's not to take anything away from his companion right here. I think we're about to see an epic battle unfold. <laughs> we're looking forward to it. And that's what T100 is going to give spectators, viewers, fans all season long. And just to remind you, uh, what T100 is again 20 men and 20 women 20 women have been contracted for the T100 season a minimum of six races will be for each athlete that's including the grand final you get season scores top three finishes will be scored so the more events you can do you can drop your lower scores uh, and then of course the grand final result a lot of money on the line. Seven million dollars is the total prize money. Uh, both men and women champions at the end of the year. Uh, those champions will receive two hundred and ten thousand dollars. And of course, as everyone is going to be looking at this as potentially that next great move for a triathlete and a career. If you could lock yourself into next year, which the top ten will be able to do from this season. Uh, you've got a foot up on the competition. Yeah, I think it's just a great time to be a triathlete. Uh, with the birth of the T100 series, these athletes really have something to race for, the year-round racing, and another world title that you can put on your resume to be able to do that. We have Matisse Magier passing another lapped athlete. And passing him on the left. So, I mean, that is common courtesy to leave the inside lane open, but, um, yeah, let's hope the... Referees apply some common sense here. I think they will. But, you know, Brittany, how do you feel about this? I mean, it's the first race of the season. Why would you not want to put some points on the board? I genuinely feel like everybody's here who is here is kind of up with an advantage just for the series. Yeah, we were discussing this earlier, and I think um, it's interesting that a, a few athletes decided to, you know, skip Miami and, and, and go all in for singapore and races beyond and we got to remember that there are only six races that count for the majority of the athletes obviously four for the olympians and uh, the biggest race of the year which is uh, almost all points is at the very end of the year in november yeah, that's a good point so it, racing and being hot in march and also being hot in november is very tricky you know to get right right like it's very hard to peak uh, obviously, you can peak a couple of times a year, but and maybe that's the way you do it. You you race the first couple of races of the series, take a break in the middle of the year, or you know, like a uh, a bit of a breather, and then sort of really ramp up for the end of the year. So I think it's just a matter of uh, personal preference. I know, you know, for example, a Ashley Gentle, who will be racing in Singapore, is the number two ranked in the world. Uh, she will missed here, but she's based in Australia, so it's a big travel commitment to come out to Miami. So. Yeah, I think every athlete has their own reasons for racing or not racing, but I, I hear you as well. To, to get a, a score on the board early would, you know, would definitely take a little bit of pressure off and, and just get a, get a feel for what the T100 series is all about. If you're watching on the screen on the left there, the scoring, Magnus Ditliff 
has made his way up to six now. He's passed Aaron Royal. Aaron Royal and I am I'm honestly quite impressed also with Yuri Kulin's riding. Um, he must have obviously done a lot of riding over the winter. Um, probably the one critique point he's had to face internally, um, just you know, for his riding style not being as aggressive. And here we have the big powerhouse, the big man, Max Stidler, first time on screen, and you know he's. He's got his position. You can see he's got an aerodynamic flare at the back, which is meant to keep the airflow attached to him longer. That's why that bottle is so far out the back. It also forces him to, to be very conservative when he gets onto the bike, because I'm pretty sure that's what happened to, Laidlo, to Sam Laidlow. He would have jumped on the bike and knocked that bottle off. We saw we had a camera on Magnus Ditlev, and he, he stopped and he lifted his leg over the top bar, which, you know, it, it didn't look the most athletic, but it is obviously very, very fast. We know he does a lot of testing and is probably the king of aerodynamics in the field. Um, but he pairs that with incredible power. I mean, he's, he's famous. His tests go viral simply because he, he produces such amazing numbers. And, you know, that is a big part on such a power course. But again, Hovering around the 105, 110 mark, he's not making up any time on our two leaders. And, you know, he's known for the second half of the bike because he's very consistent, if not someone who negative splits, meaning that his second half would be faster than his first half. But, yeah, leaving the rest of the riders in his dust, as we see. Yeah, <laughs> Rico Bogan still got those grimaces going on the face. He is hurting himself to get up there. And that's what you want to see. Young athletes putting everything on the line. So yeah, Magnus is sitting at the back of this group where we've got Yuri Kjell and Enrico Bogan and Sam Laidlow. Is he sitting up here and fueling? Because you just saw him, he's, took, he's taken multiple drinks now in the last lap. Is he just sitting here fueling and waiting to make his move? Well, I believe you spoke to him last year in Ibiza where he had that tactical move that he was, you know, very much planning on not bringing anyone else up the front. Um, and that's very much in his thoughts. He's trying to set up the race tactically because he knows he's a good runner, but there are faster runners in this pack. But quite frankly, the way we just saw him take that corner, I think he may also be struggling technically a little bit. That was not an aggressive line. He would have lost time on that corner. And we haven't seen enough of him to know if that's his general behavior. But personally, I've, I've ridden in wrath with him, and I know that's probably his one weakness as a cyclist, is the technical cornering, fast cornering, carrying speed throughout the corners. And that's what this course is all about. So perhaps that is why he's only sitting at the back, but here you can see him. He's soft pedaling. I'm pretty sure he's planning his attack. You referenced it, Jan, uh, putting his leg over right here. Big <laughs> high sweep. Can you see how everybody's jumping onto the bike? He actually stopped to get his leg across and make sure that he doesn't knock off his nutrition. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened to Sam Laidlow, is he would have jumped on, but he's got that same aerodynamic flair at the back and it's caused him to lose his nutrition. So on a course like this, Jan, where Magnus Ditliv jumps onto the back of this and we talk about his planning his move, can you expand a little bit more on that? In What are some of the ways that he could make a move tactically? Well... Magnus Ditlev is somebody who has the ability to hold the highest five-minute power by a long way in this field. And he will use that time to make sure that he comes out at a tactically good place. Maybe he will choose where the wind is coming from. And you can really see him waiting here. Yuri Kulin, if you look at his face just up front, he's grimacing. Whereas Magnus is just getting into the zone and Yuri would be somebody who he's got on his target list. And, you know, he knows we're an hour and five into the race. It's early days. This is going to be probably around about three and a half hour race. And he's waiting to play his card. And, and, and he's, he's measured. He's got a very confident approach because he's just looking at it. And he knows he, he's going to hit it when he needs to. So is what he's doing, Jan, that he, he sits behind Yuri so that the gap between Yuri and the next person grows, and then when it grows enough, he goes around Yuri, puts in a lot of power, gets like so that the gap's big enough that Yuri then can't get onto his wheel? 
I think that's generally the logic. I mean, that's how he explained it in, in Ibiza and, and, and the European Open last year. And quite frankly, that's how he broke me there. He saw the gap growing, and then when the gap was big enough, he came around, and I had nothing to offer at this stage. Um, and I, th I think that would be a similar move to how he's doing it here. He tried it again at the US Open. It didn't work as well there. But you know, there was a lot of yo-yoing on, on and a lot of inner dialogue. And I can promise you that's exactly what Yuri Kulin is doing right now. Is this that move now, Jan? This is the move. This is where he's looking on. But look at his face, calm, collected. And considering he's probably putting about 500 watts through his pedals right now, all these athletes have power meters and their effort is measured. And 500 watts, for those of you who are not in the sport of cycling, is a lot of power. But again, we see him tentative here. I honestly... I'm, I'm not too impressed with his cornering in terms of getting the full benefit out of his attack. Um, I think, well, that's probably the one and only downfall of Magnus Didlev's cycling. And when I talked to him, he said this, he does not consider this a technical course as far as cycling. He well, said, I don't call this a technical course. Technical is something, but, you know, I can guarantee you that someone like Matisse at the front would definitely be riding those corners uh, smooth. You can see Alistair Brownlee taking almost all of those turns in the aerodynamic position and it's just something where you manage to maintain a lot of speed. But again, look at the facial expression. It's cool, it's calm, it's collected. He's just riding up to Sam Laidlow in the front and, you know, that's already within a podium strike of position despite not having made up any time. So there's Sam just going out of the corner Rico Bogan in front of him, and the head of Sam must be a lapped athlete. So, you know, that's that's the one thing. Oh, there's three of them there, and all those three athletes um, in the front would be getting lapped or about to be lapped as we see everyone grabbing nutrition. And Jason West coming into the picture. So, hearing reports that Jason West might not be on the tracker, but just as he came past the commentary booth there, we saw him, so got ca cameras on him to try and get a a grip of how far back he is. He did lose a lot of time. He was he was already about 45 seconds behind Magnus Ditliv 10 kilometres ago. So I'm not sure if the track is updated yet, but Jason West does appear to be losing a lot of time. And I know me, Jan and Rini were having a conversation be before the race. And we talked about how maybe this course doesn't quite suit Jason because it's a very uh, high power bike course. So the, the bigger athletes who can produce more power like you know, Matthias Margier, Alistair Brownlee, Magnus Ditley, but really suits them more than it suits a light runner like Jason West where he just has to put down continuous power and his top power maybe not quite as high as some of those guys. So, yeah, he's running in 17th now uh, and it's a long way back from there. Speaks of the quality of the field, though. I mean, he's the defending champion, isn't he? <laughs> and, I mean, to come out here and this quality of field and not be anywhere near the top 10... I mean, let's not discount him. This guy has run five minutes faster than I have on <laughs> one of these races. And I mean, that is the quality of his run. Um, but being by himself, he is able to hold back nothing and have to put down 100% of output. He's in a tough spot right now. We see Jason West there. Again, the 30-year-old coming in. One of the top prospects to get on the podium and maybe even that top step of the podium. But right now, it's Matisse Margier that is taking control of the first T100 from Miami. Alistair Brownlee nestled in about 20 meters behind Margier as those two have separated themselves from the pack. Will there be a frustration from Matisse if he realizes that he's going to sit in front of Alistair this whole cycle uh, where he's out there on the bike and doing as much of the work as anybody because he's got nobody in front of him? I personally think Matisse is, you know, he, he's coming up in the sport and he's finding his feet and he's somebody who's really started making his mark last year. But he realizes that, you know, being on the podium, which, correct me if I'm wrong, he has not been at any of these races, that would be a win. And right now he's doing a great job of getting himself in contention. And quite frankly, the further this goes on, knowing Alistair and knowing Alistair's character, I think he's just not in a position to be able to pass him. I think 
he's putting down very, very good efforts, very, very good speed. Um, as we see Magnus Titlev now having overtaken that group, at least on the graphic, here we go, get a front on shot. And this surprises me a little bit. I don't know about you, Jack. Can you tell if that's yeah, what so he's got down his top? Yeah, so this is the Magnus Ditliv, which is, you talked about your ra race with him at Roth. Uh, Magnus made this famous in the sport of triathlon. We then saw it flow into the sport of cycling. So uh, I think it was Roth 2019, maybe, uh, yeah. when you raced him. And he, he had this thing down his top, a bottle. No one knew it was a bottle. It was actually a Tupperware container, the first thing he ever put down his top. People now do it with uh, bottles. Magnus is all about innovation, uh, aerodynamics. Every year he has the goal to bring something new to change aerodynamics for the sport. He says he's got something to bring later on in the year to the T100. We'll wait and see what that is. Uh, but, yeah, when you talk about Magnus Ditliv, innovation, aerodynamics, optimization, that, that's his game. And here we go. This would definitely be an aggressive move by him. This is where he's trying to break everybody. They're now passing those three lapped athletes. Um, and this will be interesting to see what Sam Laidlow can do, because Sam Laidlow obviously being a very, very good biker, being technically a very strong biker. Um, and this is now the long straight. doesn't surprise me that he's chosen this point to attack Magnus, that is, because this is now a long straight where you can just get in the aerodynamic position, get your hands together, get your head down, and push big numbers, and that's what he'll be doing right now. And I guess this is what me and you were talking about before, Jan, which is... Will Sam Laidlow wait till Magnus Ditlivs comes past him and then use that as his sort of anchor to get him to the front of the race? Like, okay, Magnus is here, he's with me. We know he's going to try and get to the front of the race. I'll hold on. Uh, this is a really telling moment for me in the race, whether Magnus can breach the front group. And if he does, will he drag any long, anyone along with him or will it just be solo? Still haven't reached the halfway point of the bike here at Homestead Miami Speedway, but Ditliff all the way up to third now in striking distance. Matisse Legerier still out in front of Alistair Brownlee. They run one and two. Magnus Ditliff now up to third. Sam Laidlow is fourth. And we'll take a look at how Ditliff took over that third spot. So there he is. We see Magnus Ditliff making a decisive move there, going straight past the reigning Ironman world champion, Sam Laidlow, and also passing Rico Bogan there in arrears of them in the, in the view right now. So Magnus Dif Ditliff making quick work of these men and now in third place, still sitting around a minute from the lead, so really hasn't made up too much time from the swim. He was about 110, 111 out of the water behind, but as Jan mentioned earlier, he does tend to back end his ride, and by when I say that, I mean he really picks it up or gets quicker as he goes around. So we'll see how that plays out in the end, uh, whether Margier went out a little bit too hot or whether um, Ditliff can push the pace at the end. And the thing is that, you know, the gap has been sitting quite consistently between, you know, 65 to 70 seconds. And now it's the first time it's under a minute. So we can definitely tell they're making a charge uh, and, and, and Magnus is trying to create a difference here. And I think this, if these two at the front between Alistair and, and Matisse can start working together, that would be their hope of fending off Magnus Didlev. But... Yeah, as we kind of predicted, the halfway mark is when Magnus starts kicking into gear and starts really pushing to the front. We just saw the mystery pros pick for the win today get lapped on the bike in Peter Heimrich. So he, <laughs> he had a fantastic result at the, the last race of last season at Singapore, a really hot, hilly course that suited him. Again, like Jason West, potentially we're just seeing a course, and, and this is the such like the unique thing about the T100 Tour, is there's so many different courses in different climates at different parts of the world, and we're clearly seeing a course and a, and a climate today that doesn't quite see, suit Peter Heimrich, because we know he is very capable of finishing on the podium in one of these races. And maybe why that pro is a mystery on his picks, because might not be the right <laughs> picks. <laughs> it's just today. Sam Renouf. We're taking a look right now at the Garmin transition times uh, as far as T1. Uh, Garmin giving us those times uh, just over a minute for the top 10 athletes through T1. 
Yeah, it's very. It's often talked about as the fourth dis discipline of triathlon. You know, you can make or break a lot of time in transition, and yeah, it's it's an art that you practice, and it's definitely something that favours the short distance athletes more because, of course, the time gaps are smaller, and it's more important to practice your transitions and have them perfectly down pat. Whereas these athletes normally have a little bit more time, but as the sport progresses, as things get more professional, as you know, the young fast guard moves up also transitions become more and more crucial, hence why they're called the fourth discipline of triathlon. Taking a look right now, there's Rico Bogan, who's currently in the fifth position, the 23-year-old. Uh, has a sister, Bianca, that's also a triathlete. Um, she's now back into her training after becoming a mother. But here with Rico is her manager. Let's hear from him. He's with Rachel. Yeah, thanks, Rick. I've got Alex Bock here, Rico's manager, like you just said. Thank you for joining us, and especially because Rico just came flying past and was shouting at you. What was he shouting? What did he want from you? Yeah, Rico is kind of like wants to have some times. So you can see he's not leading, so he knows he's following a couple of guys, and then he wants to know where am I? Fourth, fifth, 30 seconds, 40 seconds up. So it, it's, it's game time now. In terms of where he is currently, though, fifth, it's obviously his PTO, his T100 debut. Pretty happy with how he's getting on so far? We're, we're deliriously happy. I mean, three weeks ago, he was not supposed to be here. He wasn't really ready in the top 20. He's uh, the youngest world champion, won it in the fastest uh, time ever. So the fact that PTO, through the roll down, actually invited him uh, is an opportunity he could not miss. Give us an insight into Rico. What do we need to know as fans what this guy is going to bring to this series? Rico is like a young lion. He's got a massive heart, wants to race on top. He's not like, I'm going to be sneaky, puts everything on the line. He's very smart. And I think Rico, I've worked with about 200 pros uh, over my, my career in triathlon. And Rico is a little diamond and he's still getting tuned by his coach and we're forming a whole team around him. So we hope that this is... Uh, what shall we say, future Jan Fredino or uh, somebody that really that will help the sport as well and excite the sport. Exactly. And tell us a little bit about how he's hoping his season's going to look. Which one's he picking? Where does he want to go? Where does he want to excel? Yeah. Well, Rachel, this sort of temperature coming from Germany <laughs> is still a bit hot for him. He went to Africa in January uh, in Namibia and then he went to Lanzarote. But the humidity here in Miami, that's a factor. I've lived in the tropics for 20 years and you got to train for that. So we're going to skip Singapore and then we're going to go pretty much to all the other events, uh, do, do the complete tour and then finish with the 70.3 World Championship in Taupo to see if he can defend his title. That would be pretty special. Uh, talk to me as well about his bike. It looks special. I know it's kind of a, something you've been working on. Give us an insight into what that's like to ride. Yeah, this is exciting, uh, Rachel. Uh, basically, my partner has been 12 years in Formula One. And there's a great link that I see what the PTO is doing with the T100. You see the whole series, the races, the points, the TV. It's all kind of like, it's, it smells like a Formula One source. And that's what we've put actually in the bike. So the bike has got razor sharp, new technology, patented. The front of the bike is really fast. We don't have stock. We build one bike for one person and we use bike fitters in the process. So yeah, we, we kind of like think he has a bit of a slight advantage over everybody else but you know you've got to be fair there's a lot of great bike rents out there well i love that insight alex thank you you better go because he wants timings thank you so much for your time obviously jan he's coming for you he wants to be like you this lion on a formula one bike watch out for rico bogan thank you alex. thank you Rachel. thank you high praise too I love it. I love it, honestly. And the tenacity he's showing. I mean, he is now becoming victim to Magnus Didlev's attack. Uh, Sam Laidlow being able to hold on and Rico just, you know, popping off the back a little bit. But I think Rico, he is showing such tenacity. He might have to go and see a dentist after this. The amount of teeth grinding he is putting in. I'm impressed. I love it. So, Jan, we've seen that move that we talked about earlier where Matthias, uh, where Ma Magnus Ditliff sat behind Yuri Kulin, waited for his move, and then pushed across and forced Yuri to try and uh, bridge the gap. We've now seen that that's broken Yuri Kulin. Uh, so Yuri Kulin's now about 20 seconds back 
from the Magnus Ditlev led group that Rico Bogan was hanging on the end of. Um, they're just some lapped athletes with Uricul and here, Leon Chevalier, and that they sort of need to get out of the way pretty quickly um, to make the race fair. But yeah, that, that, that move that we saw Magnus play to put time into one of his big rivals, like you talked about, Jan, Yuri Kulin, who he has his eyes on because of how fast Yuri Kulin can run. That has worked exactly how Magnus would have planned it. Indeed, and you can now start to see on these athletes' faces that they went out early, they went hard, they went aggressive, and he is now on a fast section of the course, and he is out of the bars. He's, in fact, out of the saddle. He's starting to get uncomfortable. And, you know, we're just over halfway on the bike course, and this is where someone like Magnus has just played his cards well. Yuri right now getting the benefit of, of two lapped athletes. And, you know, it's unfortunate to see, but, um, you know, he, he's in a, in a tough spot right now. The light blue number that you saw there. Oh, oh that's Peter oh, Heimrich. Peter Heimrich. Peter Heimrich. Yeah, as we talked about, he did seem to be struggling. The the heat, the track, the having to push a really high power. He's a guy who loves climbing hills. Yeah, I mean, coming from Europe in a, a bit of a cool, cooler weather climate like Alex Rico Bogut's manager has talked about, clearly all of that's played a, a factor with Peter Heimrich's day today. Yeah, bitterly disappointing to see. How good is this camera angle? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, we do have a bird's eye view of all of the goings on down there. Uh, obviously, Matis Magia on screen there, but uh, bitterly disappointing for Peter Heimrich, uh, the Asian Open second place finisher last year. So to see him pull out, uh, obviously not feeling good, not his day, but uh, it's Magia's day, I'll tell you that much. He's looking great out there, still pushing forward in first position. I'd pay a lot of money to know who that mystery pro is. It's the biggest secret in triathlon. And, yeah, like we just saw on that graphic and talked about earlier, that, that was his big pick for the day. And I think a lot of people thought that uh, Peter Heimrich could have a, a really big season. I don't think that means he's not going to. That's the beauty of having a long year-round eight-race season. It's just early season. It's, it's, it's testing some people out, coming across from different climates, not quite where they want to be towards the end of the year at races like the Grand Finals. So... Yeah, I mean, not a bad pick from the Mystery Pro, but hasn't worked out today. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's really hard to pick in the beginning of the year. Uh, people have gone away, and as we've talked about, they've worked on that aerodynamics. Maybe they've worked on their running. Who knows? But uh, Peter Heimrich, um, obviously a favourite going in, but uh, just not having the day today. So, Do you guys remember the BBC Top Gear? That yeah. The yeah. driving show? Yeah. Oh, it's my favourite like, show. I feel like the mystery pro is a little bit like the Stig, you know? He's wearing a white <laughs> helmet. He's coming in every now and then, and everyone wants to know who is this Stig. <laughs> who and is I remember he got, un he got unveiled as, as Michael Schumacher at one time. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the things. Yeah. But it was uh, <laughs> something that's certainly building momentum and um, our mystery pro. Well, if he's put money on it, unfortunately, he is out of cash for today. Peter Heimrich, <laughs> gone. Yeah, he is uh, off the course, so he will be a DNF. I think the, the interesting one on his picks is Jason West in third. Like, me, Rini, um, Jan, and Rick had a lot of conversations before the race about, hey, who's going to win? Who's going to podium? And like Rini said, we threw up every name on the field just about. But all of us talked about Jason West, and the, the mystery pro had him on in third. So, I mean, it's going to be really interesting into how far does he hold that gap and can he run it down? Is he going to have the fastest run of the day like we expect? And if he if he does, uh, how fast? So that's a storyline that I'm really looking forward to unfolding throughout the day. Well, oh, Jack, at this point, 40 kilometres in, he's almost four minutes back. And yeah, he's four minutes back, Jason West. We can't. Yeah, four minutes is a long way, and he's still got you know half half the bike ride to go. Right, if 18 kilometre right run, but still, that's yeah. a lot. If he could hold it at four minutes, it wouldn't be too bad. If he could hold it at four minutes, you'd almost back him as the favourite. Even with, you know, Mattis and Bramley and Ditliff there, it would be very close, but just about how much that grows for the back end of this race. Ditliff now under 50 seconds from the race leader. Matisse Magirier still out in front. And this time being able to grab a bottle, both of them... They've actually changed the rules for today with littering being allowed on course. This is obviously a closed circuit, so, you know, this is slightly different. They can throw these bottles and use them for cooling whenever they like. That shows you just a little bit how extreme the conditions are. They've amended the rules, which normally wouldn't be allowed. It's obviously one of the perks you have. If you have a closed race course, it's a lot easier to clean up. 
And, you know, we're getting to an interesting point now, I find personally, because Alistair still hasn't seen the front of the race. And, you know, the two of them need to start working together if they want to maintain the gap. We can see lap by lap, Magnus is starting to chew away about five seconds. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but he's got 22 laps. And we've got about nine laps to go. Um, yeah, this is interesting. Everybody cooling down. And, you know, Sam is still holding on just to the back. But even to Sam, uh, Magnus has started creating a little bit of a gap. You see Magnus doing a lot of shifting around in the saddle, you know, cooling himself off, getting up out of the bars and um, losing time. So he's riding as fast as Magier, a little quick, quicker than Magier, but he's losing a lot of time by not being as aerodynamic as the other men, as aggressive as the other men through the corners. And he seems to kind of be, almost be taking breaks here and there, like easing up, then going for, forging, forging forward again. So, um, yeah, interesting to see that from Magnus. Still a lot of bike to go uh, in, in this. And I'm curious, with Matisse and Alistair in front, when they do get to T2 and shift into the running shoes, who has the advantage there? I mean, is that a situation where Magnus is going to want to maybe not, you know, waste the legs energy right here immediately since he's just passed halfway, save a little bit so that he's got something at the end of this? Well, Jan sort of hinted at a conversation I had with Magnus last year where I think a lot of people were surprised by what he said, where he was in a group at the, the PTO European Open last year with Jan, and he said to me that he was holding back. He, he could have made a move, he felt fine, but he held back because he wanted to conserve his run legs because he believed he could outrun all of them. That was a, a group with Christian Blumenfeld, Jan Fredino, Max Newman, and like everyone who at the time we all looked at as the best runners in the sport, but right. he was riding in it thinking in his own head, I'm just cool here, I'm just going to hold here because I can outrun them. And so that is really interesting today, whether he will conserve, whether he will finally make the big bike move that we've all expected him to make and want him to make in one of these PTO or T100 Tour races, or whether he will just conserve and back his run today. And how much have Alistair and Matisse saved at this point? We're looking at Magnus Ditliff here, and he is just over 50 seconds behind the lead pair of Mag Magier and Brownlee. So he is making inroads, and as we said, he does tend to ride pretty fast in the second half of the bike. We are now nine laps to go, just under nine laps to go. So we'll see, you know, look to see him try. And I mean, honestly, I don't think he wants to give up any time to those front two men. Uh, Magier is a fantastic runner, and, and obviously, Asla Brownlee, world class. Uh, you don't get two gold medals and, and all the other uh, world titles that, that that young man has without being such a, a phenomenal runner. So uh, I would put money on it that Magnus gets into transition with, with those two boys. Jack, would you, I mean, you're mostly familiar, I think, with everybody's training. I honestly, I'm probably clo much closer to it now than I ever was as an athlete because I always chose to stay away from it. It honestly, I, I found it to be the the thief of all joy comparing myself to anyone else but in terms of my knowledge magnus is also the one who would probably have the highest running training volume i mean this guy is known to be a hard trader but you would probably know more about numbers weekly volumes tell us a little bit about that I think of these front, you know, five or six athletes, it's interesting because we've got Mattis, who he trains with a short course group. So they're doing 100 to 120 kilometers of running a week, a lot of that at very high intensity, and he spends his time running with them. So like you talked about earlier, yes, he's a good cyclist, but we know he's a good runner. Whereas Magnus, he does spend a bit of time with some sh short course guys, so we know he's doing some speed, but he does do a lot of his running by himself as well. He's uh, known for doing a lot of his training by himself, and he does do really high high volume across the board, swim, bike, and run. He told me he runs about 100K a week as well. So that's pretty high volume for, for long course triathletes like this. It's not crazy high. Like there is some people we know about, like uh, Sam Long, for example, did some 120, 130K weeks. Uh, Alistair Brownlee at times has done big... Sorry, I'll just pause there because is that Jason West we're seeing there? It is, it is. That is Jason West being so, lapped. 
Yeah, that, that, yeah that's crazy. I, I, not many people would have thought that before the race, that it would have happened this early. And, and keep in mind, now he cannot unlap himself. So uh, he has to go 50 metres back, slow down, so that that gap forms quick, quickly. Uh, and, yeah, that's that's going to make his race even tougher. But just to go back to what you were saying, uh, yeah, Magnus, he's a he's a relatively high-volume runner, um, not crazy high. Matthias Margier does do some big running. Alistair Brownlee is the interesting one where he's very injury-prone, so his run volume has dropped off over time compared to what he was doing in 2011 and 2012 when he was the best uh, short-course runner in the world, which, from stories I've heard, was pretty crazy. Uh, and Sam Laidlow, high-volume across the board. So you just touched on the rules there. Let's remind fans what T100 is. As far as 100 kilometers, that's a two kilometer swim, 80 kilometer bike, 18 kilometer run. But we saw right there the rules. And as far as drafting, he must stay 20 meters behind. Guys, talk a little bit about what just happened though to Jason West. Now he's been lapped, so he has to go 50 meters behind the lead lap bikes. Yeah, so we're facing a unique course here. And one of the specific things is that it's a relatively short lap, you know. So if there were any technical problems like a puncture, um, an athlete would have a chance to continue going. Because normally on any course, if you are lapped, you are out of the race. So this is unique, but they've created the rule that an athlete is no, not allowed to get himself unlapped. He has to sit 50 meters back rather than the usual 20 meters that is required right here. And that's why, you know, you would get a small benefit at 20 meters. Of course, having the race ranger here that gives you a visual indication of how far those 20 meters actually is, is probably helpful. But 50 meters, that's a long way back. You're not getting any benefit. And that is then probably the one rule that is prevalent here. Um, also, having changed to world triathlon rules, there are certain specifics that I have questions about, and one of them is Magnus Ditlev and the flaring that we talked yeah. about early on, that he's wearing down the jersey. I don't know how that's being treated. I was under the impression that it's not allowed here, that there's temporary cooling being allowed, and I'm wondering to see if he's going to get penalized for that because, well, as far as I, I Yes, because we have not seen him pull that out and actually take a drink if it's water. Uh, it's been in there inside of his... Uh, kit since the start of this run uh, again we haven't watched him the whole time but you're correct they did mention that you couldn't just have it in there you had to if it was water you had to at least take it out you know to take a drink I'm under the impression that you it does have to be for hydration so it has to have water in it or any fluid in it and I do believe it has to be used I we need clarification around that because that's what we were told uh, but I haven't seen him take a drink. Right. I don't know if anyone's got no. eyes on yeah, him I taking. I think you'd have to have eyes on him the whole race to penalise him. It looks for like that. a bottle from here. It right. does it look does. like it is a bottle. But um, yeah, they were fairly clear about that from the beginning, and I'd hate to see him lose time or get penalised for a technicality in the end. You know, it's legal in the sport in general, but of course, new series, new format, new rules. And in the heat of battle, that might just be something that he's overlooked, which would surprise me. Just because of his, his and just nature. speaking of uh, Magnus Didliff, that last lap, he took 10 seconds out of the lead pair. So he's now at 41 seconds behind with eight laps to go. So uh, he is bringing Sam Laidlow with him. So Sam Laidlow, uh, just a few seconds behind Magnus. He's not in shot here at the moment, but I believe he is right, right out of frame there. But uh, yeah, Magnus Didliff now really starting to make inroads on the lead pair of... Ma Matthias Magier and Alastair Brownlee. Jan, I just wanted to throw back quickly to that conversation we were having about these leaders and their running ability. If you were in this race and you were at the front of the race and you saw a group of Magnus Ditliv and Sam Lalo together and then Matthias Magier and Alastair Brownlee off the front and you're in that sort of same vicinity, who are you looking at as Who's in a great position? Who do I have to be worried about on the run? Who's maybe over biking and I'm not too worried about on the run? Well, the, to be honest, I mean, in my personal situation, I was always just making sure I'm at the front and near the front because similar to someone like Magnus Didliff, I have that self-belief that if I'm at the front of the run, um, I could go and, and take charge of that race. But we are now seeing huge time gaps being cut in by Magnus Didliff and Sam Laidlow, closing that gap to the front and then giving themselves the chance. Um, just to finish off on that flaring topic, though, that we had, I've just had clar clarification that the 
flaring that he has down the bottom, that he has down his top, has to come from the aid station. So he's not allowed to bring okay. his own. He has to pick it up along the way. And that's what he would have done, picked it up in at one of the aid stations early on, which would have the added benefit, of course, that it would be cold. So he would have something cooling down his top and, um, and, and, and provide some cooling for him just as he makes his way up. But again, this is very impressive how he's now quite quickly closing that gap to the front. So I've just had uh, some clarification around the rules. So they were told because of the fact that it's very hot out on course, 31 degrees, they are allowed to tempor temporarily have a cooling device, a cooling bottle, so an ice water bottle down their tops. They must drink from it and they must get rid of it. So if it's down their top for the whole race, it doesn't move anywhere, they will be penalised. I'm not sure on how long that is. I think it can be upwards of to three minutes, which would be race ending if true. So we really need to see Magnus get that bottle out of his top at some stage because if it is there for the whole race, that is breaking a rule violation and he could face a penalty. But if he gets rid of it on the last lap, do yeah. we have any cardboard? Can I run down there? And tell them? <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I'd hate to. I'd, I'd hate to see. I hate technicalities get in the way of a good battle. I mean, honestly, this is this is starting to be good. I'm starting to get excited. You know, the run is coming closer and the gap is closing. We've got four contenders at the front who are the likely favourites battling it out for three spots on the podium, and you know, a, a, an early chance of a, of a 210 grand prize money at the end of the year. He's so used to having something, a fairing yeah. or something down his top too, so I, I could see him putting that in and just forgetting about it, and then oh, we'd, we'd hate to see that, right? And World Triathlon has informed us that uh, there is a no litter as far as they're not going to have a violation for littering anywhere around the course, so he can get rid of that uh, without penalty uh, before he gets into T2. I would love to know like what the discretionary call is. Like, can, like, can he have it for 79 kilometers and throw it out in the last kilometer? Is that you well, know? Well, if he picked it up at the first aid station and put it in, and then get rid of it, you know, at the last lap, that could exactly be what he's doing. So interesting here, as we saw another athlete get lapped by our, by our duo at the front. Um, that was also the first time that Magnus was on the same straight. So he was on this back straight, the one you know opposite of transition two and it's the first time that he's got those boys in his sight and that helps if you're chasing i can honestly tell you if you're off the back and you're trying to make some ground up the front having visual contact is mentally a huge booster it definitely would be um again i'm still impressed with matisse just off the front doing his thing by himself um and can only hope that yeah they start working together at least for the last quarter of this bike course. And again, that's one of the uniqueness about Homestead Miami Speedway and the fact that you can see your competition virtually every lap uh, because you're going to do the switchbacks here and there and see where your competition is, how far away they are. Uh, right now we're seeing with the win, Magnus Ditliff is closing that gap. He continues to close the gap on Magirier and Brownlee. Yeah, that was a great visual of his competition. And as Jan said, I can attest to that when, as an athlete that always was chasing. Um, if you can see your competitors up the road, it's just such a mental lift. Um, and you can just get that extra 1% or 2% out of yourself. You see him... Uh, Looked uncomfortable there. Yeah, coming, he, again, he, he's out of the saddle right now. He, yeah, I mean, obviously he's stomping on the pedals, but... He's out of the saddle for a while, and, and usually, you know, we're always taught to sort of stay in the aero bars as much as possible. As soon as he sits up, he's like a sail, um, and uh, that just slows you down. But, you know, I think he's calculated in, in his move, and he knows what he's doing. He has those men in sight in front of him, and uh, he, now it's just a matter of time before he closes that gap. In his defense, though, I do have to contradict you there earlier, Rick, because now he's actually got a tailwind. So he went into the corner, into the headwind in his aerodynamic position. He's gotten out. He's gotten out of the saddle. And athletes get out of the saddle in order to use slightly different muscle groups to change things up a little bit because you're very crunched up. It's a very efficient position, but you're always using the same muscle group. So it's almost like you're trying to shake it out before a little interval. And he's doing that with a tailwind. So that's when the wind wouldn't affect him quite as much as a sail. Um, you know, he is still tactically doing it in a very smart way whilst um, putting down what would be some very impressive numbers. But we're seeing another ben athlete get lapped, and ben this Tanute. is crazy. I mean, we're about... I believe they're up to 14th position now. So they've basically lapped, you know, five or six guys. So 
riding their way into the top 10 almost. And uh, <laughs> is There's no shame in being lapped on this course. Uh, yeah. And this caliber of athlete. That's the, the field is so good. That's what we started off the show with, the top 20 athletes in the world coming together uh, to race in T100. And I believe that was that was Ben Canute, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, that would have just gotten lapped there. I mean, he is no slouch. He is a world-class rider, and it is it's actually quite hard to imagine how good these top four are. They they are absolutely destroying a world-class field right now, and um, fireworks. What a crazy visual was that, where we see the straight, and there's Jason West and Ben Canute having to give way. <laughs> because they've been lapped, lapped. by this fault. Like, yeah, that's quite mi mind blowing. Oh, athlete out. Oh, no. That's oh, Bradley Weiss. Yarn's training. That partner. hurts me to see. I uh, mean, he's come from South Africa. He's come a long way. He was always going to face an uphill battle on this kind of course, being such a light athlete. He looks like he's in pain in his back. And, um, yeah, he's definitely pulled, pulled a hamstring or something. He's not walking well, and that's. Holding, holding his glute, holding his hamstring there. That's a painful sight for a friend. And look at this group. I mean, Rudy von Berg, who is a top four finisher at the recent World Championships in in, uh, in Nice. Um, Many Kohlhaas coming through there. And... We're back with Magier, Magier there. Yeah, and, at the front. and Brownlee here. And it's only 32 seconds now that these two are in front of Ditliff and Laidlow. See Brownlee getting out of the saddle there. And with it being just 32 seconds, we will see that's right, and then there was Sam Long in that group as well. So there's a group of four with Rudy Von Berg, um, Aaron Royal, Sam Long, and many Kohlhaas um, that, uh, yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say that they're defending at the moment as our front duo overtakes the next rider. I mean, this is like he might be pulling out. Yeah. Was that Yuri Kulin? No. No, that was uh, Yuri Kulin is still not too far back he's in seventh currently riding together daniel beckergaard but um yeah I'm could it have been uh, clement Mignon? Did that had just uh, i think he's off in a red side. red kit it was a blue kit missed the water there for Margerier. was grabbing for the water bottle peter hemrick Peter Hemrick is already out, but we believe it was um, it was David making I think that Rachel's got uh, Peter Hemrick, so I think we're going to go down to Rachel now. Thanks, Rini. Yeah, I've actually got Peter's brother, Gert, just to give us kind of a, a little update into what was wrong with Peter out there and why he had to DNF today. Well, what was wrong? We don't know that yet. Uh, he was feeling quite empty um, from the start of the swim, and uh, it didn't improve during the bike. Um, I could visi visibly see that he was getting quite red, uh, so I think the overheating could have happened as well. Um, yeah. The risk of racing. Yeah, exactly, the risk of racing. How has preparation been? You know, I know he doesn't leave any stone unturned yeah. like all of these athletes. I'm sure he's been prepping in temperatures like this. How has it been? Well, for, for Peter, he took off a bit of a, an... Um, more specific preparation compared to some other athletes. He um, trained everything at home. So Belgium is not known as the, the warmest climate. So I think that was a risk he took. Um, it's because it's a long season. Um, did not want to invest too much of the acclimatization right now yet. Um, and it could have had to do with this. But in the past, we had some uh, experience where it didn't hit that hard. So, um, yeah. Where are we going to see him racing next? The next race will be Singapore. So again, similar weather. Um, he has better experience there already from last year. Um, also, the weather in Belgium is getting better, so I hope that will uh, help him as well uh, in Singapore. Thanks for the update, Gert. Yeah, we know he's got a podium, didn't we, Peter, last time in Singapore. So let's hope he can bounce back and get back on course for another podium then. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Rachel. And, you know, we're seeing these athletes falling out of this race. I want to remind you, the temperature uh, when they started, 31 Celsius, 87 plus degrees Fahrenheit. 
uh, that they were taking on. And remember the track temperature, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43.3 Celsius. So we're just looking at Sam Laidlaw and Magnus Ditliff here. And we were having that conversation earlier as to would Sam Laidlaw be able to hold Magnus Ditliff's wheel when he came around him? And that's exactly how it's played out. So they're now just under 30 seconds down from that lead uh, duo of Ma Matthias Margier and Alistair Brownlee. I think we can expect to see, with the rate it's going, Magnus keep just gradually working that gap down. It doesn't look like Sam Laidlow's suffering that much to hold on. Like, he's definitely suffering to hold on, but not compared to how we saw the face of Yuri Kulin and Rico Bogan and Aaron Royal. And, and so this group here could be seeing itself with the front too soon, with four guys out in front with a big lead on, on the whole field. And personally, I'm so impressed. Honestly, Sam Laidlow, like, you've got to realize he's a young guy who's won his first world championship, and all of a sudden he's gone from living in a quiet village in France to giving talks in Paris for Forbes under 30 groups, you know, and the level of attention that's come to him um, is, is hard to manage at first. And, you know, personally speaking, I definitely did not manage that well the first time it happened. <laughs> I, I went off on a totally different path. So for him to keep it down and the first race back to be up at the pointy end, um, I find impressive. He's 30 seconds of the lead right now, within 30 seconds. And I think he's somebody who's also timed this race really well. We're seeing more and more athletes blowing up that must have obviously gone out extremely hard, been you know, misled a little bit probably by Matisse on the front, um, putting down a normal pace that you would probably hold in 15 degrees and, you know, yep. slightly cloudy skies. But here it's just unbelievable. Here is the next athlete, and now um, that is um, Clement Mignon, yep. who is getting lapped as well. And, I mean, relatively, it's he's standing still gaps that are created at the back here other than our top four you know they're actually not that far from each other Jason West who's lapped is probably only you know a couple of minutes down from top six top seven Big drinks being taken by the top two right now. Mojirier and Brownlee. They have held those positions almost since the beginning of getting on the bike. Uh, they've been out front setting a blistering pace. Didliff have, has closed the gap and laid low has stayed right behind him. It's just under 25 seconds now that separate Didliff from this front pack. I think an athlete we have to talk about, and we'll try and get eyes on him at some point, is Sam Long. He's one of the only athletes in the field who's not getting distanced by uh, Matthias Magier, Alistair Brownlee, Magnus Ditliff, and Sam Laidlow. He's the one guy out on course who is riding, uh, relatively speaking, as fast of, as, as them. So we do have him who we need to get eyes on to see where he's moving through the field. But I think the big thing that, that speaks to how fast those, those boys or those men out in front are riding is that the gap to 10 to 10th is almost four minutes. So between first and 10th, there's a four minute gap just about, which is what Jan was talking about. Like the gaps that those first four are building are just so big that the top to be sitting 10th right now, which is a great position to be in, is almost four minutes off the lead of this race. The beauty I'm sorry, sixth and seventh right now are two minutes back. So think about that. <laughs> the top five uh, are quite impressive uh, and that includes Rico Bogan right now who is in that fifth position I think the beauty for us as spectators is also that <laughs> this sounds quite perverse but we're seeing the gaps growing here and it is absolutely tearing through the field but the run is where the heat is actually the most impactful and we're seeing athletes struggling right now on the bike and you know we've still got 15k which is you know almost a quarter a fifth of the bike that's right. left and then we start the 18k run course where the heat is the most impactful where the guys are running on 
you know, the, the tarmac that's probably heated up to 45 degrees right now. Right. And these are tough, tough conditions. So I'd be very cautious to call this race this early on because the gaps that are going to be happening, they're going to be big and there's going to be mo more blow ups that we just haven't seen yet. And how is that playing right now into Magirier and Brownlee's strategy? Because They've gone out there and, as we mentioned, set a pace that we would expect from Magnus Ditlev. We might not expect it from Marzirier or Brownlee. Are they, are they expending too much energy right now before they get into what might be their stronger suit when they start to run? Yeah, I think the big question is, have they biked too hard or have they been measured in their effort and whether they can hold it together for the run? And I think we might see some fireworks on the run. Uh, we'll see who it comes from, but... We're in for a treat, I think. These guys are in the zone. They're just going for it. When an athlete gets in a zone, how do you know it? How do you feel it? Is it easier that day? Do you feel like this is my day? It's the famous old saying, isn't it? Um, it, it never gets easier. You just go faster as these guys are now passing Sam Laidlow's training partner, Arthur Huzo, who's, um, who is, yeah, just the next victim of the, the two of these. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the beauty th about being in the zone, it's just, it's, it's a rare state, even for these guys. It's something that is so rare that you appreciate it every single time you're in. And I'm definitely convinced that, especially Matisse, he is just putting down good power, good cadence. He still looks fairly comfortable. He's looking over every now and then to check time gaps. But, you know, he's still very much focused on the run and keeping himself together. So we're looking at Sam Long here, who we talked about earlier as needing to get some eyes on. Because often in races where it's so dynamic and there's so many laps and the gaps are so big, athletes can get forgotten as they're moving through the field. But Sam Long is really moving through this field and is 100% not out of the, this race. He's one of the few athletes who can be in this position and, and it can actually be a real positive. He came out of the water further back than what he is down right now. So he is definitely holding pace with Matthias and Alistair out in front. And... He's not going to catch them on the bike, but every second that he ekes back out of them is a second closer to, to the front of the race, and he'll be taking that as a positive. So he's one of the few athletes right now who would be in a really aggressive, attacking, positive mindset because he's eating time back into everyone. He's one of the few who's not getting lapped. He's one of the few who's making his way through, his, through the field. And uh, from what I am hearing, Jan, we talked about run volume. Uh, I was having a conversation in the, the swimming tent with Sam Long. It was the longest conversation I had in there with any athlete, and he told me how well he's been running. He said he's uh, he said he did 90 miles one week, which I'm not sure what that is in kilometres, but when he said it, I thought it's like, is that like 150, 160 yes. K? Uh, he's so living up to the name. Strongest legs in triathlon. And, yeah, to be holding Magia and Brownlee um, by himself, right? I mean, obviously, Magia has been on the front the whole way, but when you're leading a race, there's a different kind of motivation. This is not unfamiliar territory for Sam Long. He is used to chasing. So just another day in the office for him. And another guy who does have a bottle down his top yarn, and we've talked about this. So the question to me, we're being told that the rule is that they're not allowed to have them. They've been told they're allowed to have it for cooling, but they must get rid of it. But this makes me wonder whether they were told by technical officials before the race that because of the heat, they're allowed to have it and keep it down there. And we just haven't quite been informed with that because it would shock me if Sam Long and Magnus Ditlev, two of the most professional athletes in this sport, were just leaving them down there if they weren't allowed to. Now, I know we got told differently, but that would shock me. Did it, do you think that couldn't be possible, could it, Jan? I, I wouldn't think so. I honestly, I don't think anybody's out there to, to look for these little nitpicks. I mean, they are definitely fringing on, on borders and playing with the rules. But, you know, what's impressing me the most about Sam is he looks like he's... Like he's working hard but he looks composed he actually looks pretty good and yes three and a half minutes is a lot but this is the problem with manifestation <laughs> you know athletes tend to manifest and tend to get their eyes set on a certain prize and it went all around the paddock earlier that Sam said he wants to be the strongest legs in triathlon and unfortunately <laughs> he's just getting what he's asking for he's closing the gap he's probably going to have a great run he might be the strongest legs in triathlon but that might just get him eighth place 
He, he told me it's the year of not caring what anyone thinks. That's what his kit symbolises. He says, hey, I've got this good side, I've got this bad side. Love me or hate me, I'm me and I don't care this year. So, yeah, I'm excited about Sam Long being in the T100 Tour. Sam, if he wants to have the title of the strongest legs in triathlon, he might want to think about using them on the swim a little bit. <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> Bringing in the kick. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, it's, it's interesting what you say that you know, not caring what anybody else thinks. I think it's his own inner dialogue that he's so openly sharing, you know, on his YouTube channel. He's always been somebody who's out and proactive about sharing everything. Um, it, it's an interesting approach. I understand, you know, each to their own. But I think very much for him, it would be beneficial to have perhaps a little bit more quiet, a little bit more internal dialogue, a little bit more... Um, you know, using his playful energy into forward motion rather than just spreading it all over. Um, he is a fantastically talented athlete, uh, and I mean that in the most positive way because, you know, he can do these volumes um, and he can actually put down that power. As he chooses to pass Rudy von Berg on the left, uh, hmm. which is okay. Okay, I've just been given a thumb. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah. I think it's <laughs> okay in certain parts of the course <laughs> and then in others you have to be on the right. It's actually quite confusing because this is such a unique uh, It would be a strange place, on. yeah, to go around the right because it is the longer way. So yeah. anyways, let's just see if these guys can, can work together. He's still got about another 10K, so what would that be? Another two laps to make some time. And yeah, he's definitely gapped Rudy already within a very short time, so... Let's see if he yeah, can bring that gap within three minutes and then hopefully start an exciting chase from the back as Alistair is... Just took a look over his shoulder to see where Magnus and Laidlow were there, Jan. When, they, when he slowed up to go through uh, the aid station, he took a big, clear look to, to see. So obviously he can see that they're coming uh, and we can see by the tracker that they're 11 and, and 15 seconds down. So they're, they're obviously getting glimpses of them at certain point and know they're coming and Alistair's sort of sitting up realising they're going to come. This is the first time I saw him and I thought he was playing a tactical game, though. He looked like he was... Yeah. He was, you know, playing with the distance, making sure he's not getting too close, refueling, standing up to kind of shake out the legs. This has changed for the first time where I'm like, okay, maybe he is confident in his running. And like we say, it's very seldom that we've seen such a long stint, obviously without being very close to him, of him being injury-free and actually preparing. And, uh, yeah, I would love to see it. How difficult do you anticipate it being for... Magnus to get by, to get past these two athletes, because they had set such a blistering pace. Now that Magnus has caught them, or is right now within eight seconds, how difficult will it be, or will they succumb and say, you know what, you go now? Well, this is what we were talking about earlier, and if, like, if you're a triathlon fan, this is a talking point that has been going on for two years. Will Magnus come to the front and make a move? Or will he do what he did at the PTO European Open last year, what he did at the US Open last year? Um, will he sort of stay within a group that he could potentially break away from if he did put in the five minutes of power that Jan talked about that he has that no one can go with? Or will he back his run legs, sit in here and go, OK, I'm at the front of the race. We build a big gap to, be, to everyone behind us. I'm sitting in here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use less power relative to my maximal power than the other three around me, save my run legs and back myself to outrun these, these three. That's the big question. We're going to wait and see what happens here. But I think a lot of triathlon fans would love if he just bounced off the front and hurt everyone and made the race exciting. But tactically, is that what's best for his race? We're about to find out, Rennie. I don't think he's going to do that. I think he's going to. We've got two laps to go. So, you know, it's a mon it'll be a monumental effort to put in that five-minute power right now when he's just getting ready to run off the bike. I think he's going to close that gap and he's going to... He's got to take two laps to sort of relax a little bit and uh, settle in and, and get ready for the run. That's my two cents. I think it plays exactly into what you said earlier, Jack, because he is confident in his running and he is, he is happy that he's got a couple of laps up his sleeve to sit legally at 20 metres, but he's still going to be saving a little bit of energy and he's obviously no longer having to exude himself to get that minute out. So he's just put out a lot of extra effort just to close that gap we have to remember and right now he'll be grateful to sit on the back and I think he's backing himself I think he's going to be 100% ready to take on that run and 
you know, he ran in the US Open, he started the run with Matisse Magier and, you know, he was surprised when he, when he himself blew up. Um, and that just shows you the level of confidence that he's getting to. And I think this is played out exactly how he wants it to be. He's going to be here. And it, it, there's not enough time to create a gap if, um, yeah, if he doesn't meet, make me eat glass shards for looking <laughs> into, into the crystal ball. <laughs> and the thing that we all know is historically for the last, what is it now, 15 years of, of seeing Alistair Brownlee on the, on the world stage, when the run starts, he runs hard. Uh, this was in Yarn's era where Alistair Brownlee came in and really changed the way running was, was done at short course level where for the ter first two kilometres of a 10 kilometre run, Alistair Brownlee would drop two two minute 40 k's and see who could hold on and he would blow himself up but he'd blow everyone else up more and he's taken that into his long course career where from the start of the run, he just runs hard. You, we saw that he was in the lead for 5k at the PTO European Open last year so I think Magnus would sit in knowing like hey, Alistair Brownlee's going to run really Really hot early here and I've got to sort of stay with him and and make sure that I'm fresh enough to be able to go with his move early in the run. Gap is gone so now Ditliff has come to the back of Alistair Brownlee and the four bikes uh, because of the draft rule no draft rule they have to be 20 meters apart uh, they pretty much got to that point now now with under two laps to go Obviously, one of the things we're going to watch for is when will they get rid of the water bottle uh, that's in his <laughs> He's shirt. got the time now. He right. should be able to think <laughs> about it. Right. But you can see also, if you're looking at the body language of everybody, you can see Matisse, he's looking around. He seems like he's still in a comfortable spot. Alistair Brownlee, he's playing a bit more of a tactical game. I think Alistair, obviously, in this kind of heat, um, is going to be a tall ask as we see the mirage sort of in the back, yeah. as you can see the... The, the heat, the <laughs> heat just coming off the concrete there, and you know, the one thing I would be asking myself as Sam Laidlow, you know, he is now coming to where he was out of the swim, and that is because he chose to put on his socks already. That gives him a slight bit of an advantage in T2, because no one else is wearing socks yet, and everybody at this level of racing for this distance would normally be putting on socks. So that'll cost them a couple of seconds. Sam Laidlow has just worked 72 kilometers to close a gap that he never had. Um, mentally, that would be something you would want to block out at this stage. But, you know, he's here and um, I think he's ready and he, he, he's ready to put down a, a solid performance. I was going to say, see. that was just like you, Jan, when you yeah. <laughs> messed up that T2 and then had it to shut take down. Me 72K, though. <laughs> it didn't take you 70. Thankfully, uh, it didn't take you that long. But, uh, yeah, I think these men now are starting to think forward towards the run. Um, yes, they're still going to hold the power down. But I feel like we're looking at the podium in these top four, and unless there's massive fireworks, which, you know, can happen. Uh, so I think these men are going to start, you know, thinking forward towards the run, uh, sort of, a little bit of cat and mouse, maybe a little bit in the last in the last lap to sort of uh, shake their legs out and get ready. But I think, uh, yeah, I, I think we're most likely going to see the podium here. Well, well, to say that, I mean, looking at these four guys, if I'm looking at on screen right now, the next three, um, I have to mention Rico Rico Bogan again, just because you know he's a young guy to come in here and was doubted by many um, to be in the top five, only two minutes down on what has been a phenomenal performance. Daniel Beckegaard, obviously, and Yuri Kulin. I didn't, if I'm very frank, I didn't see, see him, him be only two minutes down at this stage. And, you know, that's that's phenomenal to see because he's a good runner. I, that, I think that's one of the stories of this race that's unfolding right now is Yuri Kulin. It, it, like, Yuri Kulin wasn't expected to even be at this race by most people, and he's found himself here, and he's taking the opportunity with, with both hands, you know, and... He is definitely one of the best runners in the field. I believe one of the top five or six runners in the field, and he finds himself in seventh position. So, yeah, I mean, he, he would he would think his position he's in is like literally almost perfect or as close to perfect as could be. Next stop for these four. They're on the final lap of the bike here at Homestead Miami Speedway, and this the first ever T100. Again, the World Tour starting right here at Homestead Miami Speedway. Mentioned Rico Bogan, the 23-year-old, two minutes back right now, and he's running in fifth. Bakagard, 2'11 back, and Yuri Kulin, 2'14 back from 
this top four pack. We just received notice of Artur Rosso, the training partner of Sam Laidlow, having pulled out after that pass. We don't know what's wrong with him, but we can certainly assume that the heat is taking an extreme toll. But it sounds like, Jack, you've got more info. Yeah, I talked to him. I was in a car trip with him earlier in the week um, coming to the course, and he said that he'd been battling really badly with uh, back issues. So all of his training had been affected with back issues, and we saw on the screen before that he got passed for the second time. And, you know, when you've got an injury, Jan, and, and you're getting passed for the second time, it's probably a pretty hard mental yep. game to, to stay in the race, even if you are one of the better runners in the field. Here we go. So we're down to 15 athletes in this race, which is incredible. I mean, that's the smallest field ever. So it does prove that there is no way to hide if you're having a weak day. And um, the relentless train up front lapping more and more athletes. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's almost a mini achievement not to get lapped here. Um, and it is demoralizing. It should, you know, oh, to be lapped. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to still, Aaron Royal know. would be the next to be lapped. And you think about that. Aaron Royal came out of the water first and uh, up front. You know, you think here's You've somebody who was minutes. in T1, you know, first and to be lapped. Uh, over 22 laps, pretty amazing what we're seeing out of the top four. It, it also is what makes what Sam Long is doing so impressive to be holding pace with this group, but to be nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near them. No one else in the field is doing that. Sam Long is the only person holding pace with this lead four. And another advantage you can see of having such a small field is a little thing, but at aid stations, you very often see the volunteers handing out a bottle and they basically hand out the static arm and you're meeting that static arm at 50 k's an hour and that's why it's so incredibly difficult yeah. to grab those bottles but we see one of the volunteers here at the event and he's running along to pick up pace in order to hand out those bottles and that's what you see you know the passion in the community as a whole is just huge for people to come out and just you know go out of their way to do more than just the bare minimum uh, as we are going for the closing few meters of these gentlemen hitting their super shoes for well, seven talked, laps. Yeah, we talked about the fireworks that are about to take place here. Yeah. I mean, it's it's coming down to a seven lap race where we've got the best in the world right here in front of us. Uh, you've got some that obviously have a little stronger legs as far as the running ability, but are they too far back? It, it, can they still be in striking distance to these four as you see them starting to get out of the shoes and get ready for T2. Yeah, and for those new to triathlon, uh, the latter stages of the bike, as they're getting ready for the run, they do take their feet out of the shoes and they'll continue to ride uh, into transition and there'll be a line where they cannot cross. They have to have both feet on the ground before they hit that dismount line. If they cross that line, there is a penalty, but all the men adhering to that rule and these first steps are usually a little ginger, but uh, these men making it look easy. This is my favorite five minutes of any T100 race. This what last kilometer on the bike into the first kilometer off the run. We saw Alistair Brownlee, he hopped off the bike, looked a little bit ginger. He, he's all over the place trying to put his bike in there due to the effort he's just put in. But what we see now is these four, Matthias Margier, Magnus Ditliv, Sam Laidlo, and Alistair Brownlee. Once they run, they get to sort of assess, how am I feeling? How are the others looking? Sam Laidlow through transition really quickly here. Wow. Alistair Brownlee as well, known for his fast T2s. He's got out there. Will he get back up to Sam Laidlow? Sam Laidlow, to me, looks comfortable. Alistair Brownlee looks pretty comfortable. We do sort of expect to see him make his move now. And then we've got Magnus Ditliv slowly, slowly, but he's confident. He's sort of the kind of guy who works into his run rather than explodes from the start. Uh, Matthias Margier is the one who usually does go aggressive out of T2 as well. So wait and see what happens there. Ditliff opening the kit just a bit there to get some air on the chest. Get rid of his bottle. And that bottle. <laughs> That's right. Let's hope he got rid of it. Oh, can I just yeah. quickly tap my hat to Martiz Magier? What a ride. What a ride this man has taken us on. Um, as predicted, Sam Laidlow out the front because he had the socks on already. So that disadvantage, that's cost him a long way. And Alistair remember, they're, they're doing a loop around here. I want to make sure that they're running the wrong way right now, but it's because they're going to catch up to get to the exact seven-lap distance that they need to go once they turn the corner here. Yeah, so a little uh, distance grab. They'll do a little out and back here, and then they'll basically start the seven laps. And we saw Laidlow come out very quickly out of transition with the socks already on in T1. 
And I believe Alistair Brownlee did not wear socks, so he was pretty quick out of transition too. The other two men put socks on in transition too. And look how far they're separated here as they just, I mean, they were in T2 together, and all of a sudden you see, you know, 30 meter gap here for between some of them. Well, we heard Richard Laidlow, Sam Laidlow's dad and coach talk about that the thing that he'd improved and put the most work into over his off season was his run. And Richard made the point to note he's running well in training. And we're seeing him be aggressive here. Alistair Brownlee, keep in mind, Rick, is known for running hard out of T2. So if he's running at the, uh, relatively the same speed as Sam Laidlow, you know it's fast. And they have actually put a little bit of a gap into Matthias Margier yes. and Magnus Ditliff. Now, Magnus is the one who does work into his run. But generally speaking, and I'd like to get your take on this yarn, if you can go with it, as one of these athletes at the lead of the race, would you go with it? Or is there a chance that Magnus will just sit back and wait for it all to unfold and see if what's happened to Alistair Brownlee in the past and Sam Wade, though, in, in the past where they were out in front at the Canadian Open, for example, or Alistair at the European Open, uh, and then came back to the field? Will they just wait for that to unfold? Could you just hold my microphone for five minutes? I just want to go down there and tell <laughs> Alistair to cool his jets. Cool <laughs> your jets, my friend. Honestly, we all, for the history of the sport, want to see you get back to the top step but he's closed that gap in no time. But I think he's actually quite nicely setting in to a pace right now already. Sam Laidlow, looking good. He looks Look great. Very good. But to your point and to your question, I definitely think, especially Magnus, is going to be someone to judge his effort. Um, Alistair, due to recent history, just doesn't quite have the credibility within the athlete's paddock that he's going to pull this off. And even if he is, if you go with him, you are going to blow up like him. Like, that is how it's been. Um, but again, it feels like by his standards, this is actually quite a conservative start. He looks like he's got a good rhythm early on, and these two boys working well. But Magnus wouldn't be concerned at this stage. I think he's holding his own. He's making sure he's cooled. He's just shown how good his second half of the bike is. And he's going to play that similar card, I think, on the run because seven laps. Seven laps plus that little dog leg that we just did that you pointed to, Rick. I mean, um, it, it's only just starting and it's 45 degrees on that tarmac. Cooling is going to be crucial and so is pacing. We are seeing that this gap is growing just a little bit. Now, I know that doesn't look like a gap, but when Alistair went around Sam Laidlow early, Sam Laidlow held it. So when he, goes up, when he goes past him here, like we're seeing the replay of, Sam Laidlow made a point to go, yep, I'm jumping straight on, on, on his feet there and I'm not going to let him go. So you're seeing it unfold right there. He didn't let that gap go uh, grow on, on his own sort of free will. Alistair has forced that gap to grow. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Sam Laidlow's hurting. I still think he looks good. Alistair Brownlee just pushes the pace hard from the start of the run. And like Jan sort of talked about, and if you're an Alistair Brownlee fan, you know you know how we're feeling. We just hope that this is this is a, a sort of tempered effort, and he can can, can sustain it. And we're not going to see what we saw at the Canadian Open last year. Well, and a couple of years ago at Daytona, uh, he also had a calf injury after it was up front, uh, started cramping up. That calf injury uh, caused him to withdraw. And we've got to remember the heat here, the track temperature. We've talked about it. 43 degrees Celsius, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That heat just radiating off of the ground now as they take on this 18-kilometer run. Here we go. Aaron Royal, one of the best in the sport, only now getting into his shoes. That's, um, yeah, probably about five minutes down. Um, but, you know, what you have to remember as well when Alistair is coming around, Sam, is that it's, it's not a machine effort. You know, he doesn't have a power meter like he would on the bike. He's going to try and go with them to see how their pace feels. Very often you're coming down, and for me, I was always checking stride length. Have I got a cramp? Uh, how are my quads doing? Are my hamstrings doing? You know, is, am I able to extend my stride length to go and have a free run, or do I have to manage my effort straight away? Um, as we see the battle for third right here, the two uber bikers um you know finding their pace it, it looks a little bit like a dieseled effort at the moment but that's that's good early on i think they're making their effort and matisse holding his own with his cooling headband just going meter by meter
the running shoes are on and now it's Alistair Brownlee who was at the sharp end uh, as he is out front with Sam Laidlow the reigning world champion right on his heels Matisse Magirier is third Ditliff uh, actually just going by him so that will change here in just a moment but Magnus Ditliff after a very impressive ride on the bike uh, has moved up into the third spot and is that enough distance? Young Rico Bogan uh, back in fifth. Bakagard two and a half minutes back in sixth. Yuri Kulin seventh. Sam Long three minutes back. Can those strong legs propel him toward the front? We're about to find out. That's an amazing effort. That means he would have closed about 40 seconds between his last two laps and the end of transition two. That is some serious intent for the strongest legs. And honestly, with this kind of course, he can still make up a good few positions as we see the fastest runner, at least on paper, on uh, about to take his shoes and about to get going. It looks a little bit gingerly at the moment, but you know, it's it almost been dejected. a solid. It, it almost effort. looked like he was dejected when he was starting that run right there, like, man, this, this part didn't go the way I was hoping it to. Over seven minutes behind. Yeah. Like, we all know that Jason West can run, but to, that, to those lead four, that is even too far for Jason West. And Sam Long, who, who Jan was just talking about, he's only three minutes down. So he actually, like Jan talked about, he put time into those front four at the back end of the bike there, which is unbelievable. And looking at him now, Jan, he looks really, really good. He, he probably looks even smoother than what Magnus Ditliv and Matthias Magier did. Rennie, let's talk about the venue and... The difficulty now you're running laps you're not running laps on a track that's a quarter mile you're running laps on a a mile and a half racetrack which uh, a mile and a half racetrack is 2.4 kilometers flat and you you're seeing the same thing on your right you don't get any difference uh, you're going to see asphalt on your right the whole way around yeah there's not really much to distract you and uh, nowhere to hide this is clement mignon looks like he's calling it a day as well uh Yes, the French athlete racking his bike in T2 and saying, that's enough for me. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Back to I'll, get ready to, I'll get ready for the next one. Yeah, yeah, it's always disappointing or upsetting to see when an athlete has to pull the pin. But, uh, yeah, we'll hopefully find out reasons for that later. Uh, on screen now, Magnus Ditliff and Magier cruising together. And Alistair Bernley taking a few sips of water there. And I was just going to say, back uh, on the run, uh, just, yeah, there's nowhere to hide. This tarmac earlier was around 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 30, 40 degrees Celsius. That is stinking hot, as you guys know. And, yeah, these men were trying to do everything they can to cool down. And there's no shade, of course. There's no trees out here on, on the track, so nowhere to hide. I reckon, Rini, that's a really interesting point, that it's 31 degrees out there. The sun's, like, just absolutely boiling on racetrack. It definitely feels hotter than that on racetrack. And we know that Alistair Brownlee has struggled in the heat before to the, towards the back end of runs. One of the most famous stories in triathlon is what happened in 2016 where, um, you know, his brother failed, like, uh, had a bit of a heat stroke issue and Alistair was one of the ones helping him. But Alistair himself has had that same problem where he's collapsed right before finish lines because of the heat. So whether this heat plays a role towards the back end of the 18 kilometres with Alistair Brownlee, that's something we've really got to keep our eyes on. Well, it didn't look to bother him too much in the transition. He certainly had a quick split, as we were just shown on screen. Yeah, that Garmin transition showed him 43 seconds. But you see Ditliff here uh, grabbing some hydration, getting a little water, trying to cool off. And a problem there. I think wow. Be a special Grabbing lead. ice. Went back for yeah. ice. Stop for ice. And you can see it is hot out there. Alistair grabbed an ice towel and he was disgusted with it about 10 seconds later because <laughs> it was just doing nothing. And you could literally see the spies in his face. <laughs> Not on <laughs> Alistair's face. You can see the shoulder pads. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, certainly a bit of a fashion statement coming on right there. But functionally, <laughs> it is working extremely well as Magnus is coming back. And this is what we know him for. He's the... He's just such a strong, continuous diesel. He's never demotivated. He doesn't seem phased by too much. 
And you, if he does, then I think he manages to turn it into a great form of motivation. Because, of course, that's important. You know, at this, at this kind of stage in the race, you're not thinking, oh, my God, I'm loving this. This is the epitome of my dreams. This is what I lived for when I was six years old. I was dreaming to be here. Right now, you are like, I want to get this done. <laughs> Why did I sign and up for this? I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and really, you're trying to, f to find energy from anywhere that you can. And that mental battle that's going on right now is something that he's dominated, I think, far beyond his years. You know, he's... he's calculated and he always seems to be able to turn anger into forward motion I think that's one of the best things you can do as an athlete I think fans watching right now are probably wondering okay Magnus Ditliff we saw that incredible bike the power he was able to put into the pedals he's a meter 95 so six four and three quarter that stride length can he take advantage of that and is that going to be something that maybe even you were able to utilize because of your height that stride length that you had when you were running uh, to reel in these athletes that are in front of him well that's what i was trying to allude to earlier especially in these kind of conditions you're losing a lot of fluid you're losing a lot of salt and it's the kind of race where you're probably more likely to get a cramp than any other race and the longer your stride is the more your muscle gets stretched and as you would know <laughs> rick you know, <laughs> very you well got, you, you've got to get those muscles under tension and a cramp can very quickly turn to something that's race ending and if Ooh. he is comfortable then you know ooh, someone's come off the bike there someone's come yeah off leon chevalier chevalier leon has come Ouch. off who's it yeah oh. during an aid station during an aid station we're just hearing because he's a very good yeah his kid is torn handler. up he's got blood coming off his shoulder and um yep he's honoring Back. the race I, I gotta tip my hat to that you know in this kind of situation many athletes would give up but that is something that's unique to the spirit of triathlon i think Rini, you would probably agree it is one of the few sports in the world where finishing is honored as much as it is and i honestly think it's great of him to honor it here it even looks like he's taken a little hit on his chin yeah um he looks badly bruised and you know this is one thing you have to consider as a series as well you know everybody else is trying to get ready after this race to get fit for the next one and he's going to need ice uh far beyond the run course to cool off those bruises yeah definitely tip tip my hat to leon chevalier continuing on after that nasty crash um he is going to be sore tomorrow I can tell you that much, but uh, I guess coming all the way out here to race, he wants to get a little bit of an effort out. And this looks like Sam Long here moving up into past Daniel Backergaard. So that's moving up into sixth position. Uh, Yuri Kulin now in fifth place. So Yuri's making quick work of this run, but Sam Long uh, moving along the steam train. Here he goes. Uh, and that's some great camaraderie. You see uh, Daniel Backergaard putting his hand out and uh, slapping, uh, you know, Sam Long there. That also kind of unique to triathlon I, I feel like there's a, a great camaraderie um, out there on the course and um, while these athletes are fierce competitors they also were like they good job good job today right. you, you worked hard on the bike and and uh, well done yeah and Sam Long by the way one of uh, only two athletes that are in both the men's and women's field that have competed already this year Sam Long had a win already this year in January uh, so has a competition under his belt already as he heads off and starting to chase down uh, Yuri Kulin, who's in fifth. Alistair really has extended this gap. I think he's a, that looks like it's about 20, 25 seconds to Sam Laidlow there, and then maybe another further 20 seconds back to Magnus Ditliv and Matthias Margier. So if he's 45 seconds ish up from Magnus Ditliv and Matthias Margier, that's a big gap early in this run. And, and that gap to Sam Laidlow does seem to be extending a little bit as well. And we just talked about Sam Long, one of the few people who is holding pace with, or roughly holding pace with uh, Alistair Brownlee. So yeah, wait and see uh, if Alistair Brownlee can hold this for the whole run. But right now, this is super exciting to watch him off the front like this. See Laidlow running in that second spot. Sam, he attracts a lot of attention for his victories, his sometimes outspoken comments, and also as one of the younger athletes on the tour. He's happy to inspire the next generation, but is wary of creating too many mini Sams. Uh, I don't want there to be a whole generation of Sam Laidlows, but um, <laughs> yeah, I just want there to be a whole generation of kids that think triathlon is cool. Um, 
and I hope I hope we can do that. I hope we can show that this is a sport where you can be a professional, uh, you can have quite a cool life, and um, because it's not something that I I was lucky enough to realise that, that because my family were in it and I knew a lot about triathlon, but. Um, like if you're just a kid and you see it on TV and your parents have nothing to do with the sport, uh, at the minute I don't think um, the parents would be like, oh yeah, sure, like let's let's invest in that. You can become a triathlete, but they would do for a footballer or something else. So I think it's um, it's important for there to be this professional series and the people are aware of it. It will take time, and I hope there the, there is already a, like my age group of the first generation of like born triathletes essentially. Um, and, and my father always said that that would, that would come because it was quite a new sport and it, wouldn't, like, it wasn't possible before nobody was born a triathlete. Um, but yeah, I definitely think within four or five years it will be, to be good across the three disciplines uh, will be like essential and you won't see as many people come from one or the other. And at just 25 years, uh, pretty impressive what Sam Laidlow has not only done, but the mentality that he has, uh, he knows that the, the road is not easy. As a matter of fact, he's got a tattoo that covers his entire back. It's of a ship. Uh, and the banner above that tattoo says, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. He understands that there is difficulties that you're going to come across, and that's what's going to make you better. And the reigning world champion, Sam Laidlow, right now running in that second spot behind Brownlee. Uh, but wanting to make sure to inspire young triathletes out there as well. Absolutely. I do have to recall at this very moment, though, a story. Actually, you told me about it, Jack, <laughs> because he has given an unnecessary bit of a chip on the shoulder of Alistair because these two were scheduled to show up at an interview together, and he yes. left <laughs> Alistair waiting for yeah. 45 minutes. And you know what? I think Alistair is, he, he puts that in the back of his mind. And I would certainly use that to just have a little bit of fury. You always say 98% of the reasons to do something say, uh, is a saying by Simon Whitfield, actually. 98% is for the right reasons. And 2% is for the, well, I, I won't say the, the, the people you don't like in the world. <laughs> this is, I thought about this literally at the start of the run yarn when Sam Laidlaw and Alistair were together, but I said, I won't. Tell it, talk that story and this is the beauty of having Jan Fredino in commentary because he just <laughs> says exactly what he thinks and I love it uh, yeah we were at the hotel and Alistair Brownlee and Sam Laidlow were scheduled to do an interview where they sat down next to each other and R Rachel would ask them questions and they'd talk about the race and Alistair Brownlee got there on time five minutes late but relatively on time and 30 minutes later Alistair's walking up and down the hallway outside waiting he wasn't there 45 minutes he still wasn't there and Alistair said I'm done yeah. uh, walked off he's not coming and, and Sam Laidlow never showed so yeah Alistair maybe maybe like Jan said maybe it's not much of it but maybe there's 1% of him who's enjoying sticking him to it and say hey show up next time well, I'm pretty sure he's enjoying the 45-second gap he's got right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, it's early days, and you know, I'm not taking anything away from Sam. But they are the little things. You know, I always try to make sure that I didn't give my opposition too much ammunition. You, know, you try and stick to your guns, try and be collegial, and, you know, things happen, things can go wrong. But for sure, if I was Alistair Brownlee, this would be fire. Wood to the fire Wood to the right fire. now. Yeah. Wood to the fire. We have to remember, this is a season-long tour. And at the end of the tour, there will be championship money that's given out. But also, each individual race, very impressive, $250,000 purse. And the winner here, you see 25000 second 16, down third 12. So if you're on the podium, you're making $12,000 just uh, for this one race. And again, eight races on the schedule for the World Tour. And this, to me, is a little bit surprising. And maybe I'm old school. Maybe I have a different philosophy. But, you know, you're coming all the way to Miami. You just have to finish. And you're getting 2500 bucks, which is better than nothing, you know? So I understand, well, I mean, we saw, um, we saw athletes that had crashes and probably some injuries. But if you're in any point to finish, I think it's the Worth incentive it, yeah. is there for one, financially, and for two, of course, to honor the spirit of triathlon. As in the back of your screen, you just see Magnus Ditlev closing the, back to, uh, the, the gap to Sam Laidlow. One third of the run course being done, 12K to go. And we just saw Brownlee and kind of 
glancing over his left shoulder really quickly to see if anybody was there. Yeah, that was an Frickers. amazing shot on there. because it, it just showed how quickly this graph has grown to a minute, basically, uh, to Sam Laidlow and Magnus Ditliff as he's, he's made the move on Sam Laidlow. That's the first time that I've looked at Sam Laidlow on the run and thought, yeah, he does look like his head's dropped a little bit and it's starting to hurt him. And Magnus Ditliff, like Jan talked about early, he is a what we talk about as a diesel engine. It just means that he paces himself really well. And he, you know Magnus isn't going to fade. Magnus is going to keep running the same way he is to his tempo, to his powers, his paces, the whole run. Oh, Laidlow uh, really looking yeah. rough now. Yeah, yeah looking like Nagier something's not going right there. Quick work. You could just see him. He dropped his head when Magnus passed him. And then when Magnus went around him, you kept seeing him. His head was down like he was... I don't want to say this word because it's a bit dramatic, but he almost looked a little defeated, like something had got the best of him a little bit. Alistair Brownlee has pulled away to almost a minute advantage over Magnus Ditlev. When we began this production and show today, I know a lot of people were thinking it was going to be Magnus Ditlev or it was going to be potentially Jason West if he's close enough as far as striking distance. Uh, not a lot of people had at the top of their list Alistair Brownlee. And having Alistair out here running and looking as strong as he is right now, do you have to maybe change a little bit of your thought of did Alistair do everything right on the bike? Because he came out of the water about where we expected him to. But then not going up front, not passing Matisse Marzier. Uh, was that the right move for potentially Alistair Brownlee to get the first win in the T100? Jan talked about this at the start of the race where Alistair, like in triathlon, there's a bit of, it's, it's almost a running joke where will Alistair ever learn to pace himself? And it's sort of a rhetorical question because it's almost just assumed that no, that's just how Alistair races. When he gets to the front of the race, he goes to the front, he pushes, 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 pushes until he blows up. But Jan made note of it, and we all talked about it earlier in commentary. He did seem like maybe finally he had made the right tactical decision to sit in. Jan saw him go through an aid station and look around and look up, and it looked like he could have gone to the front but chose not to and thought, hang on, this does look like a different Alistair Brownlee. And the thing with, with non-triathlon fans is you've, you see someone who's gone to the front of the run like this, they're gaining a lead, gaining a lead, you go, it's over. But... What triathlon fans know with Alistair Brownlee is he's done this 20 times and he hasn't won a race because it's eventually caught up to him. So we're waiting as triathlon fans. Will this finally be the day that Alistair Brownlee has played all his cards right? He's being conservative on the bike instead of going around on the front. He let Matthias Maggio do the work and now he can finally hold this lead and, and win a big T100 race. I think he's just showing his experience. And, uh, you know, Maggier is 10 years almost to his junior uh, so he let Magier take the lead, and he was calculated in, you know, sitting in. Uh, obviously, we had Magnus come up and Laidlow come up, but I think, uh, you know, Alistair Brownlee has the pedigree to win on his day, and he's, he's showing it today. Well, the one first we definitely see is I personally have never, ever seen Alistair lead a race for the first time on the run. Like, Alistair has yeah. taken the lead, uh, by the time we get to the run, Alistair has normally put his stamp on the race and dominated in, in, in some fashion or another. Whereas here, yeah, it's the first time ever that I see him leading a race and, you know, getting to a substantial place. He's just looking back. You can tell the heat is starting to get to him. But, you know, I just want to go down there and wrap his muscles in cotton wool because it is absolutely mind-blowing what he's putting down here. He is about 11k to go, so yeah, I mean, still a long way to go, but he looks like he's obviously cooling his body, making sure he's taking on that water as much as possible, cooling himself as much as possible, and yeah, he, he looks great to me. He does, but I'm telling you, it's not over. Magnus, <laughs> Magnus is hovering there, and I know he's, but it looks like almost like he's just picking up pace now. I feel like Magnus is just getting into his rhythm, and he... He's going to be the guy. He's probably got a temperature sensor on him, <laughs> a little alarm going on. I don't know if he's got a chip in his mind yet or not, but he's definitely, 
you know, he's calculated to a robotic kind of level. And in the second half of this run, I am convinced Magnus is going to show us some strength. We just saw Magnus turn his hat around as, as far as putting it so that the bill of his hat now covering the back of his neck so the sun's not shining right down on him as he stopped to get some more ice. Is that like Sylvester Stallone when he used to I turn his so. cap around in yeah, the movies? And <laughs> over the top. Over the top. That's over it. The top. Yes. Yeah, we can reference movies. you have movies. to be born in the 80s and be forward to know what that is. <laughs> I, never, I never knew that until my husband uh, made me watch it. I was two hours wasted of my life. You, yeah, oh, using, <laughs> using the energy of your opponent. Uh, but I think in this situation, he's trying to keep the sun off his neck. As we see now, this will give you a good view of the gap between one and two. There's Alistair Brownlee. Out in front and just coming on to the right side of your screen, you see Magnus Dittler. Yeah, I'm on the edge of my seat here because <laughs> as being such an unashamed Alistair Brownlee fan, as most triathlon fans are, you know what the line he's sort of hovering on is. At any moment, we are so used to him blowing up, but we know, like Jan was just talking about, like robotic Magnus. Magnus is holding a, p a pace that he knows he can hold. It looks like he's starting to build into his run. That gap's come down by five seconds. Can Alistair Brownlee hold on or not? Like, yeah, I'm literally just on the edge of my seat with this. Yeah, that's a great shot there. We see the three, the top three right now, and it looks like Kulin and Long aren't really making too much inroads. Kulin making a little. He's 233 down, and now Sam Long around 303, but he's hovering around that three three and change uh, and fifth position, sorry, sixth position. Yeah, yeah and with all your years racing, Alistair, does he have any tells on the run that show that he's hurting or not? He's like, there anything that you would be able to keep an eye out for that we could have a, like an eye out for as well that show, hey, Alistair's hurting here or is he pretty hard to read? No, Alistair is, uh, I think his body language is clearly indicative. You can tell when his head goes slightly to the side there was a, a, a one of the famous events where he managed to push his limit far beyond was the London, I think it was the Olympic test event, where he absolutely passed out with, I, I don't know, 100 meters to go? Yeah, right before the finish line. Right before the finish line. And actually at the time I celebrated it because I managed to run past him, <laughs> thinking I'd got this guy, not really realizing he's just run himself into complete delirium and gone way past his limits. But with Alistair, you can see, and you can see his face. He's starting to get a bit more labored. The heat is definitely getting to him. I mean, he's setting a good pace. It looks controlled, but look at his mouth right now. You know, he's, he's, he's very charismatic in terms of how he shows it. His mouth is wider open and he's grimacing more, which at this stage is what you expect. And here we have a great shot of Sam Long <laughs> sticking out his signatory tongue and, um, you know, celebrating the crowds as he's the guy running the same pace on course. In fact, he's just taken five seconds out of Alistair Brownlee on this run, coming true to the strongest legs of the race. <laughs> um, you know, potentially running himself into a top five, which is where he was in Milwaukee as well. And who knows? Um, Sam Laidlow is struggling. Very Doesn't fast. mean he's going to be there, but. But Sam, right now to me, looks the best on course. Well, you mentioned Sam with the T100 Tour starting in Miami. There's a big focus, obviously, on American athletes, and none bigger than Sam Long. His focus for the year ahead is razor sharp. Um, to be honest, I'm very, very excited about this race. I've had good preparation. It's my third time coming here. Uh, I actually swore I was not, not going to come again last year because I was like, I want it was just a little two of a small time race last year and i was like i'm never coming again but now that it's a big time race i'm like i'm stoked to be here because the racetrack is really hard to beat and, and it's a tough tough course and so yeah i was like i'm not coming back unless if it means something here in miami again and and this year it means something but you know miami is just the start we've got three american races here all in pretty awesome locations i mean san francisco and then I'm probably the most excited about the Las Vegas one. I just think it's, from what I've heard about the course, it's a super difficult course. It's on a beautiful golf course there. And I just think it's super cool because, you know, like triathlon started in the United States and then you Europeans have kind of tried to rob it from us. But now we've got three of the, three of the biggest events here on American soil. And so it's like the PTO and the T100, it's very much alive here in the US.
Jan, it seemed like he pointed right at you when he said that. I'm not sure if it was a direct point at you, but... I am I am offended by the fact that he said that we, that we tried to take it. We didn't try. It, it was successful. It was it was a certain successful attempt. As, um, well, I guess the UK is debatable, you know, <laughs> with Europe right now. But even here, there's a European out front. Two Europeans, three Europeans, four Europeans, five Europeans <laughs> ahead of him. So... Um, um, you know, the, the logic of that is still coming. As Magnus Didlev is holding a steady gap to Alistair, um, and I'm really hoping that this is, again, I'm probably showing too much, too much bias here, but after such a long stretch of mishaps, of injuries, of things going wrong, you just want to see a fellow competitor get back to the top. You know, Magnus, without a doubt, is the current and the future of the sport. But Alistair, he's... You know, he's had a tough journey, and for him to still be here is a credit to his perseverance. And, you know, personally, obviously, I, I like seeing the old guys come out. <laughs> 35 years <laughs> old is old? Wait a minute, hold on. In professional sports, it's, it's yeah. not a spring chicken. Well, I was pacing the hallway with, by the way, Alistair when he was waiting for that interview that never happened, and he made the comment there that his, his winter training went very well. He felt very comfortable about this race and coming into this race he felt strong so I think you know as as you guys have mentioned that you know we've seen history has played out to where he may struggle toward the end of this race or he may have done things right in his winter training this year to get ready for this and done everything right up to this point in this race to be able to be strong enough to finish it out and stay in front of Magnus. Yeah, just adding to what Jan said about uh, Magnus Ditliff being the current and the future of the sport, Mates Magier, he is a newcomer, really, relatively to the sport. We barely even knew how to say his name last year. And this year, he asserted, is asserting himself as one of the future greats of the sport. He took this the bull by the horns in the bike and was just, see you later, guys, if you could say, you know, catch me if you can, or stay with me if you can. And, and now he's in third place at the T100, the first of these eight events this year are uh, an exciting athlete to watch in the future that's for sure we've just seen that magnus ditliv has taken five seconds out of alistair brownlee there so Jan may be foreshadowing things a little bit that magnus looks good and he looks like he's building and to me if based off what Jan said that you can really read alistair's body language i feel like alistair's brownlee alistair brownlee's mouth's opened a bit you can see him like visibly huffing and puffing and you can see the effort looks hard and Magnus looks robotic, and Magnus looks like he's building and running faster and faster, so this is definitely not over. That was a, a little bit more of a difficult transition, I think, for Alistair Brownlee there, uh, or not transition, but uh, the aid station there, grabbing some water and such, but how much more difficult is it to run up front? Because he doesn't have someone to go after that Ditliff has right now. Ditliff can see him. He knows where Alistair Brownlee is, how about Brownlee as far as he continues to look over his left shoulder to make sure he has a gap between himself and Magnus? What I'm finding surprising is that Alistair is not taking any ice. Uh, Magnus, by contrast, is slowing to almost a stop so that he can put his hands in the cooler and grab ice and put on his shoulders. Whereas uh, Alistair is, you know, he's taking the water and he's pouring that over his head. But that only lasts a few seconds beyond the A station. When you put ice in your kit... Uh, for the, he does it again. Uh, he, he puts that ice in his kit, and for the next K, two Ks, that can cool you down and, and really help keep that body temperature down. So uh, surprising that Alistair is not, not opting to do that. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, the ice box is hidden well. Um, honestly, I think uh, probably Magnus just got lucky on the first lap to actually spot it. But here we're seeing the grimaces on Alistair Brownlee's face going bigger and bigger. He's done 10K which, you know, is, is his kind of thing. And Alistair is the kind of athlete that doesn't need a target to run towards. Alistair lives and breathes running and dominating a field. He is passing Yuri Kulin right here. Um, wow. Oh, no, sorry, Sam that's Sam Long. Long. Yep. Sam Long passing Yuri Kulin. He's running fast. And he would have passed Sam Laidlow. So, um, yeah, Sam Long does not seem affected by the heat right here. Preparing in, uh, in Tucson, if I'm not mistaken, they would be having a bit of um, bit of warmth there already. But, yeah, he is putting down one heck of a race. And who knows, at this pace, all sorts of things could be happening. He's 225 behind right now he, as far as Brownlee. He's the fastest runner on the course right now. He's running faster than Magnus Ditliv, Alistair Brownlee, and Matthias Margier. And we just saw him visually. He looked amazing. Like, 
he looked like it wasn't even a 31 degree race where everyone's suffering he's moving through the field and he looks strong and he looks like he's getting better and better whereas yeah look at alistair here. brownley alistair brownley is showing how hot it is he's showing how hard the race is and if if we throw back to two laps ago when we were talking about alistair's body language it's changed dramatically now you can really see the effort on his face you can see how much it's hurting him yeah laboring to run right now it looks like for alistair brownley as opposed to what we saw at sam long uh, Magnus Ditliff not looking as strong, but still a, a pretty good pace that Magnus has put on. He's still 41 seconds back from Brownlee. Well, that's 15 still. seconds he's made up in the last sort of like two and a half K. And he still looks the same. I mean, he doesn't look as good as Sam Long. He's not, you know, motioning to the crowd and, and giving like love heart symbols to whoever <laughs> will take them. Uh, um, we love that about Sam Long. He, he definitely puts on a show. Magnus is calculated in what he's been doing, as Jan's been mentioning all along, but uh, definitely we've seen Alistair Brownlee say, see a little bit of pain on his face now, and he's still got three laps to go, so a fair way to go uh, for Alistair Brownlee. Seven kilometers. Yeah, 7.2 7 kilometers remaining uh, in this. The first ever T100, and Alistair Brownlee still out in front of Magnus Ditlev. Brownlee, maybe a little different strategy here. Got in behind Mergerier on the bike. Those two set the pace, got off the bike, and Brownlee has been out front setting the pace. Still has a 41-second lead over Ditlip. For an Alistair Brownlee. My prediction is that is not going to be 40 seconds for much longer. I think by the end of this lap, we might be coming down to probably half that. Um, and then just wondering again, you know, is there any chance that he would actually tactically leave something in the tank to be able to go with Magnus? I mean, this would be historic. Imagine we have a sprint finish on our hands here. I, I, would, I, I would be losing it. Like, I'm genuinely, uh, you know, as, as my first experience on this side of the fence, I have to say I'm unreasonably excited for what's going on. <laughs> no, I mean, it is very exciting watching from this side. When you've been in their shoes and you know what it takes to get to that level uh, it's exciting to, to watch and, and we're hoping that we can paint the picture for, for you guys at home at how hard these guys work how much effort goes in and then just the pain they're in right now and you can see it on Alistair's face uh, you can see the calculated uh, move by uh, Ditliff and then yeah, Magier obviously hanging in there hanging tough but yeah, that time gap. Oh, now, oh no, he's oh, coming to yeah. a walk. Here we, go. here we go, grab the ice. Somebody tell him about the ice. Is there ice on this? Oh yeah, there is. Oh, this is a long yeah. stop in Yeah, this is the station. first time we've really seen Alistair slow to a walk almost. Um, that's but a it real looks sign of fatigue. It looks of fatigue. So that's yeah. that's at least a good sign. Still no yeah. ice though. Yeah, he poured down two cups of ice yeah. down his top. They were, they, they were it cups, wasn't okay. in the bag. But um, yeah, this is definitely a change in pace. Let's hope that he's leaving just enough in the tank. But wow, there comes Magnus already. Um, that gap is really closed because yeah. of that aid station. I reckon that's almost 10 seconds extra that Magnus has just eaten into that advantage there. Oh, that look over the oh. shoulder is really is it, tallying. And look at the trail he's leaving behind his shoes. Yeah. That is all the water and ice coming through. That's basically just running through him. That's the heat. Um, and it's something that makes your shoes significantly heavier and it makes that slightly squidgy noise and it's everything you don't want to hear as yes. an athlete. It's Just not like you're flying effortlessly. It's the opposite of being in the zone. It is everything that feels slow and sticky. Alistair also taking on some nutrition here. This might be a bit late if it's energetic. Yeah, and when you have, uh, uh, you know, pouring ice and water over yourself like that, he doesn't have socks on either, so the socks are not going to be absorbing any of that. So his foot, it, you know, might be sliding around. That's when you get all sorts of blisters. He also, you know, right now is just trying to hold off Magnus, so doing his best to stay in front, but it's damage control. And looking at his right arm starting to swing. When does Alistair Brownlee realize that Ditliff has not only caught him, but he has to start thinking about second and third? Who's behind him that I've got to try to stay in front of if I want to be on the podium here? 
Yeah, has I he think, started thinking about that already? I think Alistair, yeah. I mean, there's a lot going through your mind at this point in the race. You're just trying to stay calm and cool and collected. But also you're realizing, yeah, Magnus Didliff is, is breathing down my neck. It's, it's Sam Long is in, in view now too. So he was two minutes back at the last time check. Uh, 155 back, my mistake, at the last time check. So Sam Long is coming like a steam train back there. Um, yeah, I think Alistair Brownlee, he's well aware that he has some top-notch athletes coming up on his shoulder, and he's just doing everything he can to hold on to that lead. We may have a sprint, but it night, might not be between <laughs> Alistair Brownlee and Didliff. It could be Sam Long. I mean, we're seeing an impressive performance right now out of the American. Sam is hauling along here. I have to, I have to say that is very impressive. He seems completely unfazed by the heat. I would like to contradict you a little bit, Rini, because I don't think Alistair thinks about anything but winning. <laughs> He's that kind of guy. It's either win or go bust. And right now he is thinking about how to get to the finish line and he is craving a cold drink. Um, but I honestly, I don't think he's thinking about who's coming behind Magnus or any of that. He's not thinking about damage control. His pace has picked up though. Yeah, he's it, definitely found he got his back, rhythm again. Yeah, he got back into his rhythm. It was to the point where we thought Didliff was going to be right there and pounce on him. But it looks like now he's got a little more of a step or a little skip in his step. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my estimate seemed kind of uh, conservative, but as we see Jason West, he's run his way into the top 10. He's that put two minutes into those front those front four off the bike. Remember, he was 7.30 down off the bike. Now he's only 5.40 down as well. So he's another one who's moving fast. And you can see his stride has changed. He's back to how we know him, stomping along. You know, he walked out a bit gingerly, a bit demotivated, but I think he has found his fire to be like, okay, I'm still here to give it my all. And uh, let's see if Alistair can find the ice box on this aid station because I do think the ice seems to be helping him. And uh, keep, uh, keep in mind, into that last aid station, he was still four, over 40 seconds ahead of Magnus, and now that looks like 10 seconds. So yep. Magnus really has brought that down over this last lap. So Magnus Ditliff currently running in that second spot inside of 10 seconds behind Alistair Brownlee. Magnus Ditliff is the top-ranked athlete in T100 and has huge enthusiasm for this debut season. I'm uh, yeah, super excited to be a part of the T100 series and finally see it launch and be part of it uh, first time ever. Uh, I think it's amazing for the sport of triathlon and it's like a, a really perfect time for me to be a professional with so many opportunities and the T100 series is definitely what has been on my mind throughout uh, yeah, the, the entire winter here. Yeah. Being the highest uh, ranked athlete in the male field is definitely uh, super cool, but it's not something that I, of course, I've been thinking about it and people have been telling me, well, it's uh, amazing that you are the highest ranked athlete, but it's not something I think about in everyday training or trying to like if you think too much about it and feel it like as a, as a pressure then I think you can get pretty caught up in it but I more see it as a clap on the shoulder and uh, like showing me that I've actually done really well in the past and that I deserve to be here. And for the lead here comes Magnus Didliff trying to take the top spot away from Alistair Brownlee. Brownlee watches him go by, and now what can Ditliff do to set the pace to where he can't be caught? Well, let's see. I mean, Alistair has got a spring in his step. He is trying to keep up. I mean, we'll see how long, how long it lasts. But I am honestly, I'm just glad that everything seems to be performance related. You know, it's definitely there. There are no injuries, and it's just a performance play. And credits, absolute credits to the coolness that Magnus Ditliff is displaying here. He didn't play the games, he went out, he played his cards exactly. And let's hope, let's just hope and dream for a second that we've got a 5K shoulder to shoulder battle on our hands. I know everybody's smiling, I know I'm, an <laughs> I'm a dreamer, but um, you know what? If these boys wait too much longer, Sam Long is coming up to yeah. get these guys. He's got 5K to make up 72 seconds. Two laps, and 72 seconds. He looks seconds. amazing. He's, Look at it. His form is great. He's breathing well. 90 he's mile a week. lapping it up. 90 mile a week will do that. I think uh, he's just showing that he's got the strength to persevere. And 
in these hot, hot conditions, everyone else is succumbing to the heat, and it, he looks unfazed. Yeah, he, the, one of the quotes he said to me, I said, I said, ride hard today, mate. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to run even harder. And, like, it's, like, unfolding. He just has this, like, confidence. Oh, we've the seen pass. that Magnus is... A little bit is, of gap here. Yeah, he's, he's broken, Alistair, here. And usually these are the, these are the decisive final moves. And uh, once that, that sort of elastic snap, it doesn't really ever go the other way. That's super rare in our sport. So Magnus did live in the lead. He's broken Alistair Brownlee. Matthias Magier is holding solid but not eating time into Ditliv. This is the man who is Sam Long. I think this is the big story now for the rest of the race. Sam Long's in fourth. Magnus Ditliv's in first. There's a minute and 10 seconds between them. Sam Long is running faster. There's 5K to go. Can he get to Magnus? A minute and, and 10 over, over 5K. I mean, you know, it's possible. It's... It's a it's a serious it's nail a biter. I think I think it's going to come down to the wire. And uh, yeah, we just had a close up on Sam Long's face, and he, he has a cooling headband on. So you see, some of the athletes have hats on. Uh, that headband is is a cooling headband. So if you keep it wet, it should help keep your you know head cooler, uh, which obviously is a big area where you can lose heat. Um, obviously, if you're wearing you know a hat or something like that, you can keep the heat in. Magnus is putting ice and so forth in his hat to keep keep that uh, cool, the body cool. It's all about keeping the body cool. As soon as you overheat, it's very, very hard to come back from overheating. So to cool the body and keep it in check um, is always uh, in, you know, very important for these athletes. And I do think that one advantage that Sam has right here is that even Magnus wouldn't be expecting him to come. I genuinely think this is a surprise as much as to as it is to us. You know, Magnus is kind of right now, he's probably defending it. He's probably like, okay, I've got Alistair, I've got my gap. You know, this is my race to lose. Whereas he doesn't realize he still has to put it on the line because this man is coming fast and this man, as we know from other sprint finishes, he's got a kick. He does have a kick on the finishing straight. And we saw him looking around the curve here and looking where did lift Brownlee Magirier are out in front of him. He sees them. He knows what he has to do in these final two laps. I think he's licking his chops here. He's uh, seeing these men ahead of him, and he's uh, excited to, to get up there and battle for, you know, a podium, certainly, possibly the win. And not the first time that Magnus Ditliv and Sam Long have had a battle in a PTO race. Throwback to the U.S. Open where they were having a real battle for second and third. Gap between one and two now has Magnus Ditliff uh, getting ready to put athlete a lap down. That's Rico Bogan. Uh, Rita von Berg. Yeah, Rita von Berg also uh, that we saw earlier up front. But now Magnus Ditliff about to put them a lap down. We saw Alistair Brownlee back there running in second. He's looking over his shoulder. Here comes Sam Long. Again, Magirier is third. Sam Long fourth. But Long looking so strong. And I'm actually, Jan, I'm going to let you, and Jack, I'm going to let you guys enjoy it right next to the track. We don't want to leave our seats. <laughs> me and Jan, me and Jan have to go down to the finish line now. And we're just looking at each other going like, no, let's stay. You go, you go. <laughs> you go. We, uh, this is crazy. We just saw Sam Long get to the straight, and he had eyes on Magnus Ditliv. That gap looks like it's right at a minute, maybe even slightly less. Oh, I just, this is crazy race, crazy race. It's getting closer, and we're seeing a very impressive performance right now out of Sam Long. Can Ditlip hold him off? That's what we're about to find out. Ditlip was able to get by Alistair Brownlee. He's got 18 seconds on him. Matisse Magirier is 45 seconds back from Ditlip, but hasn't been showing the speed that we're seeing out of Sam Long. That's why we're watching and making sure that if Sam Long is coming, we want to make sure to see that gap close. And if this ends up being a sprint, Sam Long looks very strong right there on screen. Yeah, he does. He, lo he looks fantastic. And, and yeah, within 20 seconds now of a podium, um, obviously he's focused on Matthias Magier uh, right now. That's his main focus. And that's all he's thinking about. I need to catch up to Magier. I get on the podium. That's 
That's a, that's a great race for me today, a great way to start the season. Once he gets to third position, then he'll start to look at Brownlee. And, and that's when it'll get exciting, I think. That's when we'll, we'll start to see whether there's enough room, um, whether uh, anyone's out there telling Ditliff what's going on behind him and that, you know, Sam Long is coming along like a, like a steam train. Looking very strong still is Magnus Ditliff right here in front. Brownlee has fallen back to 30 seconds behind. And Majirier still right there about the 45 49 second gap. The one who had been going the other direction though was Sam Long. He had been closing that gap. Getting closer. Magier there on screen and Sam Long right behind him. So that pass going to happen momentarily here. We will definitely follow along and, and, and try to capture that for you guys. Ditliff in the lead with T100 Miami. T100 pairing the top 20 athletes, both men and women, against each other at eight different venues around the world. It all starts right here at Miami and Homestead Miami Speedway for the inaugural T100 World Tour event. And Magnus Ditliff showed why he is possibly the greatest on a bike as he was able to close the gap that had been set between when he got through T1 until he was into T2. And then he was able to catch Alistair Brownlee, pass him, and Brownlee now trying to hang on to see if he can stay on the podium. But it's Sam Long looking the strongest as he's now sees Matisse Margerier in front of him. That's the gap between third and fourth. And Sam Long is coming quickly. And Matthias Magier just trying to hold on to that third position there. Uh, that would be, you know, third or fourth, obviously very different. You know, it's a, it's a difference between a podium and not a podium. Right. So, uh, yeah, but I think uh, the writing was on the wall, unfortunately, for Matthias Magier. He did so much work on the bike all day long, leading the whole way and just pushing all day. But honestly, I think we'll be seeing so much more of this talented young man in the years to come. But uh, look at this. Sam Long just about to make the pass into third position. Uh, we'll see if Magier has anything in the tank, uh, whether he can sort of try and go with him. And this is it, the final lap. So Magnus Ditliff out in front. Sam Long has taken third away. There are the athletes. And you saw Magnus Sam. Ditliff. You saw Sam there. He wasn't messing around. He, he ran up onto his shoulder, kept the same pace, and you saw him put in a little bit of a sprint there. And Brownlee's right in front of him right now. Brownlee has fallen far enough back. There's Brownlee compared to Sam Long. There's the bell, the final lap. 2.5K. Oh, Brownlee, Brownlee turning around. He sees really Sam Long suffering. coming. The grimace on his face. And maybe that third position is still up for grabs for Matthias Magier too. Uh, Brownlee really struggling here. Uh, we can see that. This is for second. Time. Sam Long taking second away from Brownlee. Now does he have enough in the tank to get Detlev? And Matthias Magier coming up on Brownlee's shoulder too. Uh, you just hate to see. Oh, this is devastating. Alistair Brownlee was so. You know, we thought calculated on the bike. He was right there with Magier the whole way. You know, one, two position on the bike all day. And he, he served himself at the start of that run. He looked fantastic. And just as the day's worn on, I think the heat's gotten to him. Um, and yeah, we're really starting to see the wheels come off, unfortunately. Is it too much of a gap? We see Ditliff here. We still have not seen Sam Long come into the screen. Yeah, I think that. It's almost a quarter of a lap here that he's still back. We'll try and get a split on that that gap here momentarily. But yeah, Magnus is aware. He's looking behind to sort of see what's going on. He definitely wants to make sure he doesn't make any mistakes. And and, and I think he 
somewhat has it in control. Yeah, but. it's still about a minute. Okay. So a minute over 2.4 kilometer would be very impressive if you could make that up on the quality of athlete that Magnus Ditliff is. Yeah, to say the least. Regardless, uh, I think Sam Long's performance here has been phenomenal. Like, he was not in frame outside the top 10 for the majority of the bike ride. Obviously, didn't have a great swim. Um, you know, he's used to chasing, but he had a, you know, less than ideal start to the to the run to the bike sorry and uh held his own on the bike and now he's just putting together a beautiful run and again this is cumulative points over entire season with the grand final determining who the t100 world tour champion will be sam long has worked his way into a podium finish potentially second magnus ditliff trying to be the first to win at T100. Yes, and we're still rolling along with Sam Long here. Matthias Magier just lurking in the background there, but uh, I think uh, Sam putting time into Matthias now and uh, forging forward, trying to, you know, close that gap as, as much as possible. But a minute in, you know, 1.9K now is a uh, massive ask. Brownlee has fallen to fourth. You see the strain it is for every stride that he takes maybe a little bit too strong on the bike a little bit too much energy expelled on the bike leg of this triathlon trying to stay in front of Magnus Ditliff and now the legs just aren't underneath him but Ditliff looking so strong yeah I think the major factor for Alistair is is the heat I mean, I think I think he was you know, rode, you know, to his ability. But I think this, as you know, you run on that hot surface, it's grueling. And as I said, no where to hide. There is no shade out there on the course, and and that tarmac gets hot. Down the back stretch here at Homestead Miami Speedway for the final time for Sam Long. He can see his competition in front of him. He's 53 seconds behind Ditliff. Less than a half a lap to go. About a mile to go, I think. Yeah, Magnus Ditliff now making sure he's taking a little look back to be sure that he's he's clear. I think I think he's he doesn't look like he runs fast. He's so such a tall in stature yeah. athlete, and so his stride length is a little well. His stride length is massive. <laughs> but it's a slower turnover. So it looks like he's, you know, just cruising and jogging. But this guy is moving. And uh, he's put together, a, you know, a phenomenal day. Calculated on the bike. And as Jan said, very calculated athlete here. And calculated on the run. He's not going to, you know, leave anything to chance. It's a great chance to grab some much sought-after points in the first of this T100 series. Sam Long still looking so strong, the fastest runner on the course right now. And Long, just under 50 seconds, now is going through the turn here at Homestead Miami Speedway when the cars are racing around the banking here at nearly 180 miles an hour. They're excited to come off of what would be the fourth turn, the fourth and final turn here to see the checkered flag, and that's about where Magnus Ditliff is as he makes his way past this final aid station. He'll cut back down once he gets on the front stretch. And he will be making his way to the finish line here at T100 Miami. And this will be for, uh, Magnus' first victory in a PTO event uh, outside of the Collins Cup, I believe. So, uh, Really exciting day for him. Zipping up the suit, making sure he looks presentable as he crossed the finish line. We've got to show off those sponsors. Uh, yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal day by Magnus Ditliff. But this young man, Sam Long, I uh, love to see him race. Ditliff and Long, one and two. Majurier and Yuri Kulin has passed Brownlee for fourth. Brownlee back to fifth, Kulhas six. Jason West has run his way up into the seventh spot. Bakagard in eighth, laid low ninth, and Aaron Royal tenth. 
There and you go, now the cool. crowd is right there next to Magnus Ditlip as he'll make his way onto the tunnel. He saw a little bit of uh, emotion. He sort of slight fist pump as he was coming into the finish line here. Um, just great photos here of the crowd. The and favorite coming in, Magnus Ditlip. Giving high fives to the crowd as he comes to the finish line. The first ever winner of the T100. And it goes to Magnus Ditlip. Yeah, and you can see he's excited. Of course, of course he's going to be excited. This is big deal. He gets crucial points that go towards the overall to be the PTO T100 world champion at the end of the year. Ditlip getting congratulations from his is... team. We know Sam Long is coming in right here and cheering on the crowd. They're cheering on him. Sam Long, second in the T100 Miami. <laughs> Sam Long, he is loving it, soaking up the atmosphere and putting on a show. And not far behind, Matisse Magirier will be coming to that finish line here in just a moment. There he is. And Magirier will be on the podium for T100. And that's his first podium in a PTO race event, event as well. So fantastic way to start the year for these three young men. Congratulations all around for the top three. Yuri Kulin. Strong finish for Yuri Kulin. As he will end up in fourth. And as Jan said earlier, Yuri Kulin was sort of a late um, entrant to this to this race. We didn't know he'd be racing. So a phenomenal finish, fourth place uh, for this young man as well. A wild card athlete in Yuri Kulin. <laughs> and smiles on his face. How about Alistair Brownlee? And the expectations coming in of the 35 year old, one of the elder statesmen in triathlon, and going out, and even with about half the run remaining out in front, but it was just too much for Brownlee today as he will come home, looks like fifth today. Even looks back to see where his competition is to make sure as he gets to the finish line. Alistair Brownlee, two time Olympian, fifth today at Miami in the T100. And that's Sam Laidlow coming in right behind Alistair Brownlee, the reigning Ironman world champion and the two time Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> oh, nope. That was cool. cool house. My, my apologies. Similar suit to Laidlow. I thought Laidlow had a second win there. Laidlow, yeah, he had fallen back. Here comes Jason West. Yeah, Jason West had a great swim to start the day. Uh, fell back um, longer than we would have expected, around seven minutes uh, in arrears at the end of the bike. And then has run his way, textbook. Jason West style up into seventh place, I seventh believe. Seventh place. Jason West acknowledging the crowd. Blue collar athlete here in Jason West, hard worker does whatever he needs to do to be successful in this discipline. And it is a long season, Rick. This is the first of eight races. So Jason West starting off at the seventh place. He finished the year last year with a second and a third in the PTO US Open and the Asian Open. So I'm sure he wanted more. Uh, he did win this race last year, but obviously Different circumstances, different field, not this uh, caliber of field, but uh, still 
a great way to start the year. Daniel Backegaard. Yep. Daniel Backegaard now coming in in eighth place. A solid day all around. Led in the swim, fell back a little bit on the bike, and uh, a pretty solid run. But again, you know, this is how the athletes start the year. Um, we're looking forward to more head-to-head -head racing as we go to Singapore next in April. Yeah, there's nowhere to hide when your competition is as talented as the fields continue to be for the T100. There's Sam Laidlow. Yeah, Laidlow looking very good at the start of the run and just sort of dropped his head and started to go back. I don't know if there was a cramp or a overheating issue or, or a little niggle, but uh, he looks fine now, uh, finishing off. Maybe he had to just cool, the, cool his jets for a little bit on the run and coming in in ninth position. Reigning world champion Sam Laidlow will be ninth here at Miami in the T100. Next on the track will be Aaron Royal, Rudy Von Berg, and Rico Bogan. To come in, but all in the shoot. Congratulating Magnus Ditliff on his first win in 2024. That's Jason West with his wife, Jessica Broderick, an ex-pro triathlete herself. Jason said he wanted to be within striking distance at T2. He thought the heat would play into his favor. Uh, just did not end up that way today as the bike portion of this triathlon got the best of him. Well, all the athletes are getting congratulated. Let's hear from some of them. We'll go down to Rachel and Jan, who are in the finish area. Yeah, thanks so much, Rick. I mean, firstly, I'm just going to chat to Jan because he is like a kid <laughs> in a sweet shop. Yes, he hasn't been racing, but he seems to have had the most fabulous day. I mean, sum up what we've seen and how it was for you to be on the other side of the fence, Jan. Well, it wasn't quite as good for me as it was for the champ who's going to come and join us. Come Magnus, in. please. Magnus, well done, my friend. Congratulations. First win of the T100 and more importantly some good points on the board for your first world championship yeah it feels amazing great start to the season and uh yeah i'm super stoked to take my first uh t100 win for the first race of the season as well so i mean magnus just tell us about the conditions everyone was talking about them you seem to have it under control the ice was going in the shoulders the ice was going down at any possibility unlike alistair and a couple of the other guys was that always the plan or did you just kind of spot that ice bucket early on and go i need to get in there yeah, like when I arrived here in Miami, I felt really bad throughout the entire week training here. So we made a super conservative plan to like strategies for heat, uh, yeah, cooling and so on. So the entire day I felt like I was just right below the limit. And then towards the end of the run, I could sort of wheel in Alistair and push a bit more. So yeah, it was super like controlled just below the limit, trying to deal with the heat. Yeah, we talk about it though. Can I just quickly ask, can you explain actually how hot it is you know we kind of go oh we're out here for a bit it's 110 track temperature what does that actually feel like for you running racing out there yeah already on the swim i've started to feel hot and i had to let i was actually with the front group i think after half of the swim but i had to like let them go and then on the bike i was trying to do every opportunity to cool down and especially on the run with the sun baking and the tarmac and everything uh, and also on the other straight where you had like tailwind it was super hot yeah. so really what i want to know is how do you stay so controlled i mean even now we can't look into what you're actually thinking how do you keep your cool when you see these guys going and you you know you've got the strength on the bike you believe in your run that's something i appreciate the most about you how, how do you keep your cool yeah, I don't know really. I think it's like a, a personal uh, yeah, trait uh, mark I was born with or something like that. I'm, yeah, I don't feel like I'm that cool actually. Maybe it just looks like that on the outside, but I'm just trying to be in control and do uh, like focus on my own tasks and solve them as best as I can. Well, you're doing a pretty good job of solving your tasks. <laughs> Honestly, I see a bright future. It is wonderful witnessing you out there and just uh, taking the sport to the next level. Recover well. 
what's the next one for you? Uh, it's P100 in uh, Singapore, so it's going to probably be even more hot and humid. <laughs> so I feel like you did, you dealt with it all right. So we're looking forward to seeing you out there. Good luck, recover well, and um, yeah, enjoy the celebrations. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you, Magnus, very much. Uh, written himself into the history books here as our first ever champion of the T100. Magnus, we'll let you go, let you cool down. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll just let him go off, off the side there. Thank you very much, Magnus. I mean, yeah, such a pro. He doesn't seem like he's just been out there for 100K. Uh, I mean, that's the sign of a champion, son of things to come for him this season. Yeah, absolutely. I think also that mentality is definitely going to help him deal with the fact that we're talking about a series. You know, it used to be a big win. It used to be a nice race to get out. But he's just decimated the best field we have seen in ages. And he's, he's calm about it. He's collected. He's thinking about his recovery. You know, he's probably already got a temperature sensor jacked down his suit to measure his recovery. And that's why he is the best. That's what it takes these days. And uh, I can't help but be very, very impressed. Uh, very impressive out there, for sure. We do, though, have, remember, uh, keep your clocks on because in about 15 minutes, the women's event is getting underway. But I can see over here we have Matthias. If he wants to come in, finished in third position. Come in the middle, please. Take your Morning, spot. Buddy. In here, I remember seeing you in Milwaukee, just finishing off the podium, and we were kind of surprised with that. We're even more surprised now. What a job out there! Congratulations, your first podium ever in this 100k distance. Uh, how did you do it? It looked pretty controlled. Uh, what a what a way to start the season! A uh, real tough race today because uh, I was a little bit too excited. So strong, stronger swim for me. Then uh, uh, I pushed too hard on the bike at the beginning of the bike. We were at the front of the race with Alistair, but then uh, uh, around the middle of the bike, I was, uh, shit, my leg, uh, <laughs> my legs can't, do, can't push uh, no more. So uh, I was just, uh, I hope, I was just like, uh, I hope everybody will be tired uh, uh, with the hit. And then on the run, uh, it was a, a slow run, uh, I think, but, uh, uh, I think uh, I finished, uh, I thought I, w I finished uh, five or fourth, but then uh, I saw Alistair just slowing down, so third place is really, is quite good today to start the season. We can't be more impressed. I mean, honestly, 80k off the front, you say you felt bad. I have been on the receiving end of your legs, not feeling the very best. And let me tell you, it's still very, very hard. I thought it was very deserving that you came through with your first podium finish. You must be happy, not only with the finish, also getting points for the series. Yeah. It's a good start. Couldn't be much better, could it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it can always be better. I can, I, well, it can't be that much better, because I feel yeah. like you lapped half the field on that bike. Let's just talk yeah, about that was, for a second, because we were just counting more and more people that you lapped. It was quite, uh, quite amazing to do that. I was like, OK, uh, one guy uh, less on the in the race but during all the bike i was thinking about my coach and, and he he i think he was like oh matis you're so stupid to to push hard on the bike so I, i'm happy to finish further at the end because uh, maybe he will he will be happy too now he thinks you're an absolute professor because you did the job. You got on the podium. Congratulations. A sign of things to come, I'm sure, for this season. In these conditions, it was absolutely yeah. stunning. OK, well, we're going to take a uh, trip back up to Rick Allen in the commentary as he's going to just clarify all the results from that men's race. Give yourself a glass of champagne, my friend. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. And send one of those up here. Magnus Ditliff uh, was fastest in the bike. We see that. Jason West, uh, fastest in the run and the swim, it was Rico Bogan who was the fastest in the water. But ultimately, on the podium, you see Ditlev Long and Majerier, Kulin, Brownlee, all top five, Coolhouse, Wes, Bacagard, Laidlow, and Royal. Remember, it's season long. This is the first of eight events that T100 will have again around the world. The next stop is Singapore for these men. And they are accumulating points. And Ditliff today grab the most points you can. Uh, coming home with the first ever win in T100 in Miami. And coming up next, it will be 
the women's turn the day after International Women's Day, and we have a very international field uh, for the women. They will be hitting the water here in just about 10 minutes, and we're looking forward to that. There's the women in the tent getting ready for the start of their 100K race. The first for the women, the T100, about to get underway. They'll be introduced to the fans here in just a moment, and then it'll be their turn to take the big stage here at Homestead Miami Speedway. On the women's side, everyone has their eyes on Lucy Charles Barclay as the possible favorite coming in to this first event here in Miami. And can she take on that role of the leader and possibly the favorite? Let's get back down to Rachel and Jan. We, should I come off my... Righty, well, we are approaching the start of the women's race. This is very exciting. They're coming thick and fast right now. Jan's still next to me here. We've just wrapped up an incredible men's race. But now we turn our attention, don't we? And we look towards the women, and uh, it's going to be a little bit cooler for them. The conditions are slightly nicer. Jan's kind of shaking his head. He's not quite sure. It does feel like that. But let's just talk about some of the main protagonists who we're going to see out there, Jan. Yeah, it literally is back to back. I mean, the last athletes are collapsing on the uh, other side of the fence right here. We have, of course, very exciting Lucy Charles Barkley, the reigning world champion versus the all time queen, Daniela Reef, going head to head. And, you know, honestly, I, that has to be the big story. There are some there, there are lots of very, very talented women here. But in terms of on paper, you know, if these two women are on, we are going to be treated to another spectacle right here. Yeah, exactly. And if you are just joining us as well for the women's race, let's just remind you how the T100 season is going to work. It's exciting. It's new. This is what it looks like. Okay, so 20 contracted men and women. They compete globally. They've got eight races around the world. The minimum they have to race is six, including that grand final. But if you are an Olympian, you have to do three plus the grand final, so that's four. There is a $7 million prize purse on offer throughout the season. And then if you do become champion, you'll take home a very cool 210,000 US dollars. Okay, we are talking about the women, but we do have, can I bring him in? Can I bring in yo, 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 Sam Long? Come, Come in. in the middle. Yeah, let me be next to this I'm time. just bringing him in because he was there. He was about to run in. I want to speak to him. You said you want to have the strongest legs in triathlon after that. Did you win? Did you do it? Did you get the strongest legs? Well, I mean, technically, no, but technically, yes. Like, it's, it's, you got to take the swim out of it, and then you look at the splits, but... Uh, strongest dad, hands down. Strongest dad in the field, and legs, I, I think today you got it. I think you finally got it. <laughs> finally got it, I know. It, it first started, like, I don't know, as a bit of a joke, and then I definitely got, like, a lot of uh, negativity because of that, and, and I deserve that negativity, to be fair. <laughs> You were fabulous out there. You absolutely stormed through on the run. What does go through your head when you're just ticking off all those athletes one by one? Yeah, it was less of actually like comparing myself to the other athletes and more just being really focused on myself moment to moment. Of course, the spectators did get me excited every lap and it, it really seemed unfeasible until like the final 10 minutes of the race and then I think then that belief came and then it just gave me a huge surge of energy. Tell us a little bit, you know, you've got the skull on your suit, light side, dark side. I feel like you've matured a lot over the off season. You're coming into your own and you showed an epic race, what you're capable of. But, you know, I feel like today you put down the mental side and your physical massive engine. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the themes kind of changed this year. I, I guess I wore, you know, bright flamingos last year. And, and the idea was like, I'm a super happy guy and energetic and, and I love to race, which all that still remains true, right? 
and and but I think that side's more for before the race and after the race and then I really wanted to embrace like the inner demons inside and and allowing myself to go deep into that hurt box and and punish myself and and hopefully punish my competitors and uh yeah, it was, it was just a great day out there. Well, I can tell you that gives me goosebumps. I honestly think you've done an incredible job of maturing to that level. And I think uh, hopefully now you can chill with some flamingos in the pool, <laughs> get a bottle of champagne and get ready for the next one. We can't wait to see you out there. Exactly. Thank you very much, Jan. And, and I have to truthfully say you've been a huge part of my maturing as an athlete over the years with, with the honor of racing you several times. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Well okay, said, cheers. Sam. Congratulations. Thank you so much. OK, well, the men have just finished, as we've just seen. But let's go back and turn our attention to the women's race, which is about to begin. And Jack Kelly is back down there on the start for us. So when we're recovering from what we've just watched in the men's race, which was pretty crazy, we come back down to the tent, which is a very different feel to the finish line. The finish line is full of excitement. It's full of high energy. The tent's full of quiet and nervous energy and there's loud music playing but there's 20 completely silent athletes. There's a couple of very minor conversations taking place but really it's just a bunch of 20 women sitting there knowing what they're about to go through and thinking about what's going to happen in their race and what they've got to do. And what might go right and what might go wrong and this is the time where there's hope and you, you want to do everything you can to have a good race but you're also questioning yourself and not sure if you did everything right or could have done something more and yeah there's just a completely different energy it's a, it's a special energy that if everyone could feel every triathlon fan in the world could feel being in one of these starting tents it's yeah it's an experience that money can't buy I guess the big thing for the women that we're looking to see in terms of strategy and what's going to play out is can some of the stronger winners, uh, runners sit close enough to Lucy Charles Barclay out of the water to still be in the race? We all expect Lucy Charles Barclay to swim off the front of the swim. And then I guess the question is, can she do that? Can Sarah Perez Sella stick with her? Is there anyone else who's going to come out of the woodwork and surprise in the water? Yeah, a lot of questions in this women's race that I can't wait to find the answers to. Uh, we can't wait for that either, Jack. It's going to be great. It feels like it's just starting again because it is. We have about three minutes to go now until the athletes. Paula Finley there, Lucy Charles Barkley on your screens. And it was interesting, Jan, as well, when you were in commentary, as we get to see the 20 contracted athletes, the yellow are the ones that are here. If they're not in yellow, they are missing. But back to my point, it was interesting that actually a lot of the women during the men's race came down here in the shade, yeah. were kind of just getting a feel for it that must be an advantage they've seen the pain the guys have just gone through they've seen exactly what it takes to become a champion here well you, you know i think most of these women are the best in the world and, and and they've seen it before it did surprise me a little bit in this heat to see the girls out this early but it can help of course get revved up and see the energy feel the hype of another field without having to experience it yourself as we see these girls about to go off um, some interesting tactics here for sure in a slightly decimated field, some last-minute kind of injuries and, and, um, and, and health problems, but um, nothing short of an absolute candy shop of a race. I mean, absolutely stacked field you're about to enjoy. Again, this is the first ever women's event in the T100 World Tour. Well, let's enjoy it. Let's go down to our starter for this one. She is the reigning champion at Ironman Florida from the United States of America, Sky Monch. A 24 time champion at the half iron distance, racing from Great Britain, Emma Pallant Brown. She is the four-time Ironman world champion, five-time 70.3 world champion, and the Roth world record holder from Switzerland, Daniela Reef. A nine-time half Ironman champion from Canada, Paula Finlay.
She is a three-time Ironman champion from Great Britain. This is Kat Matthews. Ranked number four in the PTO World Rankings, the current Ironman World Champion from Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barclay. They've towed the line, and it's time once again to get this momentous you occasion underway. The, the first ever T100 for the On women. Your mark. And they're in the water. And once again, we'll be able to pick out a few athletes based on their caps. And one of those being Lucy Charles Barclay will have the pink swim cap. And you see it already, Rick, uh, Lucy Charles Barclay. She does not mess around at the start. She is quick off the mark, and she's on the far left there in that pink cap. She's already making a little bit of a lead. We'll see if anyone can grab onto her feet. Cat Matthews will have a green swim cap. The yellow swim cap is Paula Finlay. Holly Lawrence has the purple Swim cap, Daniela Reef will be in blue. Sara Perez Sala, who's really the only one who has shocked, I think, us and been able to beat Lucy Charles Barclay out of the water, will have the orange cap, and Lucy Buckingham has the red cap. There was a question. Uh, Lucy was not at one of the briefings uh, this weekend, and the question was if she would be able to tow the line uh, maybe a little bit under the weather this weekend, but she is in the water swimming and we hope for the best for her it looks like she's uh third right there lucy buckingham as she was talking about there sarah perez sala in second lucy charles barclay in first and yes look at that scrimmage back there uh is that argy bargy that we're seeing back <laughs> yeah, here it, a bit of argy bargy that's yeah. right rick uh, that's five across that is not fun if you're in the middle there uh you're breathing in someone else's faith face there's probably some elbows being uh, thrown a little not purposely but you kind of it's hard not to sort of knock your competitors when you're that close to pr proximity so I'm, I'm sure we'll see that thin out as we go along here great for the spectators to be able to be that close to these athletes as they work their way again this will be a two and a quarter lap swim where they will be able to come out of the water after the first lap and a quarter. Yeah, they're five wide right there. That's for sure. <laughs> I think Hale Tour is in there. Yeah, there's... We don't uh, normally see that, by the way, at Homestead Miami Speedway. Five <laughs> wide is pretty impressive. <laughs> I don't know if that's possible <laughs> on the speedway, is it, Rick? Probably uh, not. Yeah, we have Paula Finlay right there in the yellow cap. She's just trying to get away, get away from that mess. Um, and as you see, Laurie Lawrence is right sort of to her right in the purple cap. But Paula Finlay just trying to uh, get ahead of them. I bet Holly Lawrence will jump right on Paula's feet there and we'll start to see them thin out. This will be bib numbers uh, on the bottom of your screen, not positions right now. Uh, Mystery Pro calling Lucy Charles Barclay uh, the early winner. At least that Mystery Pro believes that. Paula Finlay and Emma Pellant Brown. Uh, that's the top three that the Mystery Pro is calling. And again, we mentioned swim cap colors. Those are in the upper left corner of your screen. So we have Cat Matthews there just hanging on to that group of four. And as we said earlier, yeah, it is pretty aggressive when they're four across. Uh, I think as, as we move along here, it'll spread out and there'll be maybe some twos and, and probably single file. Uh, the pace is on here. Lucy Charles Barkley. You can see the wake behind her. Yeah. She is just moving. Impressive early for Lucy Charles Barclay. There's Sarah Perez Sala and the orange swim cap. And the women are in the water. It's underway. T100 here at Miami. And again, these athletes will swim past the Aussie exit. Uh, which most of them have done already. 
and the next time by they would do that out in front and so impressive in the swim as Lucy Charles Barkley really not a lot of weakness in Lucy there really isn't she's just a phenomenal like her standout is the swim everyone likes to talk about you know Lucy Charles Barkley the mermaid um, her swim ability is just phenomenal but she gets out on the bike and she is one of the strongest cyclists in the sport and backs it up with a very strong run in amongst the top top women on the run as well she's told us that her attitude when it comes to maybe not being good enough really stems back from when she was a, just a young girl and she was focused on swimming and her swim coach she said she never really got a lot of positive feedback right, from the swim so coach and now, thought she was never good to, enough and she just continued to push herself and push herself to try to get some type of positive affirmation that what she was doing was right and that they were excited to see the progress but she said she never got it until she actually quit swimming and transferred over into the triathlon where the coach then said how great she was but she said that's always stuck in her mind that it always pushes her to try to be better yeah and as awful as that would have been for her growing up and never really feeling like she was doing enough or achieving uh to her coach's expectations i almost feel like she needs to call that coach now and say thank you thank you because i have that in the back of my mind that it's never good enough and it's pushed me to greatest height she's the reigning ironman world champion right now and one of the best women in our sport and uh, certainly one of the favorites the mystery pros favorite to win today right. he was way off the mark for the men's race but uh, uh we'll see how he is uh for the women's um, lucy charles barclay definitely a threat at every single race she enters and it looks as though they're just swimming around a buoy but there's more it's more of a technical event to try to make those hard turns like that yeah and when there's a pack like this the front athlete Generally, we're taught to sort of come into the buoy and sprint out of it because that's a, an area where you can maybe make you create a gap or maybe drop somebody. So, I mean, all the athletes know this and they're all trying to make sure they don't get dropped around buoys, but that is sometimes where, we're, where uh, we see gaps form. Uh, now we're looking at the red cap of Lucy Buckingham and... I'm not sure, is that... We thought that was pink and Lucy Charles Barkley, but... If that's the case, then I'm not sure where Sarah Faraz Sala has gone. Yeah, we'll have to look when we get to it. Yeah, that looks like. There's Sarah. Lucy ba Buckingham has, has made a, a little move there around that swim buoy. Big move out front. It's Lucy Charles Barclay. Out in front in the water. Still working on lap one here is Lucy Charles Barkley out front. You look at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see the bib numbers now for Lucy Charles Barkley. Again, 30, 31, and 32 for Emma Pallant Brown. And Emma looking for a little redemption here, especially at this course uh, in this venue, because Emma Pallant Brown uh, was very strong here a couple of years back, but heat exhaustion uh, got her in the middle of the run to the point where she passed out literally passed out on the track uh, and then she said that because of what she was wearing it burned her back the, that's how hot the asphalt was that she actually had burns on her back from when she had passed out and was laying on her back on the asphalt here so hoping for a better uh, turn of events here this time as Again, the women now heading back toward the sun uh, and this sunset here at Homestead Miami Speedway. And right there next to the water is Jack Kelly. Thanks, Rick. There was some completely crazy things that happened at the start of that swim there and then some really expected things. So we expected to see Lucy Charles Barclay out in front. It's not a surprise to see Lucy Buckingham there with her. They're probably the two best swimmers in middle distance triathlon. Yeah, I guess a little interesting that Sarah Perez Sala got dropped around that boy, but it, it talks about the technical element of going around boys like this, uh, especially when there's not as many of them. Probably the thing that was most interesting was at the start of the race, Lucy Charles Barclay started next to Paula Finlay. She cut across her, swam over her, forcing Paula Finlay to sort of stop, have it to find her position again. And then what happened is we found a group 
that bunch together. So that group of Cat Matthews, Paula Finlay, Daniela Reef, they all come together. They were very wide. They slowed each other down because of how the front swim dynamics played out. Because if you're sitting on hips like that and you're in a bunched up group, it's much slower than if you're in a single file strung out group and you're just on each other's feet. And that's what we saw. We saw Lucy Charles Barclay, Lucy Buckingham and Sarah Perez Sala get into that single file, fast moving swim group. And then behind, the girls got stuck. That's why the gap grew so big so quickly. The back group, the chase group, they've got it together now and they're not bleeding as much time. But Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham still are pulling away just a little bit uh, with every sort of 100 metres that goes by. Thanks, Jack. Out front of that second pack, that's Holly Lawrence in the purple swim cap. You have Paula Finlay on the back of that pack as well. So Holly Lawrence leading it, Paula Finlay on the back. I don't see Daniela Riff. Uh, definitely interested to see where she is. I'm sure at some point we'll get a better angle of that chase and see if we can see Daniela. But right now we're, we're with Holly Lawrence and she is leading that chase. Not and she, too far behind Sarah Pal Perez Sala. She's changed her her, cha her her training venue. She was out on the West Coast. She was in L.A. and then in 2022 decided to make the move to Boulder, which is where you and Tim are. Uh, a lot of athletes deciding to make that move and get into elevation and see if they can uh, have a little more of the elevation change here in the Americas. Yeah, I think there are a lot. I mean, it's a, it's definitely a hub for triathlon. Back in the day, it was San, San, uh, San Diego. Um, and more recently, it's been Boulder. That's been, and Tucson has become one of the hotspots of triathlon. Uh, Sam Long coming from Tucson, or living in Tucson. Sorry, Sam Long is from Boulder, Colorado, but lives in Tucson in the wintertime. Um, so, yeah, Holly Lawrence joining. Uh, and I know she's swimming with Julie Dibbins, uh, which uh, a lot of the top athletes are swimming with, with Julie, who's uh, one of the top coaches in our sport. And we're back with Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham. The, whatever she's been suffering with over the past couple of days, certainly not showing itself yet in the swim, but definitely early days. And uh, great to see her towing the line. She was uh, sort of a 20% chance of starting, we, we heard this morning. And, and some other athletes sort of said maybe more. Uh, likely that she's not going to start. So really good to see her giving a crack. And it's the Lucy show right now with Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham going 1-2 here in the swim. They're getting ready to come back to the Aussie exit. And it's just back-to-back, -back, isn't it? Uh, just come right back into the booth to find some more action. I'm very happy to see Lucy Buckingham has made it to the start line. I think she'll have a very interesting dynamic on this race because Lucy Charles, you know, has very often taken this position by herself especially on a windy day like today, having an ally could be crucial. Sarah Perez-Sala obviously was my personal pick to also be in that front hey, three. But um, even if it's just the two of them, the two two Brits up front uh, could be sending a tough pace for everyone else to follow. With you just being down there, is the wind stronger? Is it the same as what we saw at the beginning of the men's race? Uh, the heat a little bit warmer, actually, than when the men started? I have to say, Rachel also just mentioned that she's been down there the whole time, and she was noting how it's actually got the cooler. Okay. And you can feel the sun is definitely going down. There are a few clouds in the way. I think right now they're actually very fair and very perfect conditions, which could, of course, play into the hands of you, what you mentioned earlier, Emma Pallant-Brown, you know, perhaps giving herself a surprise. I did speak to her husband um, yesterday, and, you know, he was kind of already downplaying her options, and I'm like, oh, come on, let's, <laughs> you know, let, let's, let's give it a fair go. I know she's been training very well. We know about her personal best that she said on a 10K recently, but I think the conditions could be coming to a point that they're not that extreme anymore. There's the Aussie exit that we're seeing up on the top of the screen. I think we're just about to go to Jack, but before that, uh, just uh, noting how their arm or their stroke rate is very high, but they're not really kicking a lot. Sort of a two-beat kick. Um, it varies from triathlete to triathlete, but generally triathletes tend to save their legs uh, for the run. You might see them bring the kick in towards the end of the, the swim to ready themselves for the bike, but, yeah, that, that slow kick. Um, well, we're going to throw right to Jack now. 
So Lucy Charles Barclay has just exited ahead of Lucy Buckingham. They were swimming hard. You could tell it when you were looking at them really close. They were swimming very hard. This gap has grown. Sarah Perez Seller is just about to get to the Aussie exit as well. And the chase group with Sky Munch and Holly Lawrence and India Lee, and uh, they've, they've almost caught her. Paul Finlay is still on the back of that group too. Um, so here we have Sarah Perez Seller. She's about 25 seconds back and is bleeding time to this chase group with Sky Munch and India Lee at the front. Just exiting right now in the Aussie exit, up this steep uphill. India Lee looks good, swim cap fall, fallen off, but fix that. That's one of the benefits of the Aussie exit. Paula Finlay on the back of this group is massive. They're about 35 seconds off the lead. That's potentially further ahead than what some would have anticipated to see Paula Finlay. She's lost a little bit of ground in the Aussie exit, but if she can get back there, that's a really good position. And then about 10 seconds behind Paula Finlay, we've got Kat Matthews exiting the water. 45-ish seconds down. She's got herself a little bit isolated there, and that second lap could be tricky because the rest of the girls have all got a big group to work to towards, whereas she's by herself. Daniela Reef out of the water a further 10, 15 seconds down, as well as Emma Pallant-Brown and Tamara Jewett. That's a strong run group. That's a group we've got to keep our eye on. They're about a minute back. Whether they can make up some ground to Lucy in this second lap, but that is a substantial gap. Emma Pallant-Brown, Tamara Jewett too, we've got to keep our eye on as the race progresses, particularly on the run. Thanks, Jack. That almost looked like Tamara Jewett clipped the fence on the way in there. She came in hot. She was obviously trying to use her run speed to hold on to the back of the group. And as we come back to Lucy and Lucy, interesting we talk about swimming techniques very often because it's quite clear to see Lucy Charles Barclay. If you look at her right arm, if we, if we get a close-up, um, it's very straight. She has a very straight swinging arm. Whereas Lucy Buckingham has got a much more kind of high elbow. She has a more classical kind of, as you would say, pretty swim stroke. But, you know, the straight arms can be very effective, especially on longer distances. It matters how you pull under the water that you keep your hands nice and close to the body. But Lucy, Charles Barkley having that signature open water stroke that's powered her to come first out of the water that many times. And... As a teenager, Lucy Charles Barkley was a top-class swimmer. She only just missed out on going to the 2012 Olympics. And since converting to triathlon, she's actually been increasingly successful over the sport's longest distances, finally winning Kona last year. But she's really dedicating herself to the T100 Tour this year and is excited about the unique challenges of the T100. Yeah, the 100k distance is, I guess it's like this elusive distance because it's between the Olympic distance, you've got the half Ironman and the full Ironman and it falls kind of right in the middle of those and any triathlete who's had success in the short course or in the middle distance, you would expect to just step into that distance and have immediate success. But it hasn't often panned out like that. I would definitely say myself, I don't feel like I've performed to my potential yet at that distance. And that's what makes you keep coming back as an athlete. And I think that's why so many athletes are excited about this distance, because it's bringing two extremely talented, dedicated and superhuman athletes together from the short course world and the long distance world. And that is why I think you're seeing this rise in results and it's bringing everything together and it's just seeing this sport explode into something exciting. So the future for this distance really does excite me. It's great to hear from Lucy Charles Barclay there about really kind of the perfect distance, pairing the best in the world in a triathlon at something that will challenge all of them. Yeah, that's definitely the truth for the 100k distance. I mean, it is seemingly a sweet spot. You know, we just saw a touch over three hours. This will probably be closer to three and a half hours. And, you know, there are exciting dynamics that form because it is tight as we just saw that a lot of shifts can happen late on in the race. And if we're even looking at the Aussie exit and the first splits we got here, there is a, a, a trio right there between Cat Matthews, Lucy Byram, and Daniela Reef, 10 seconds back off the two of those. And they are three powerhouse bikers. They're technically strong riders. They are gonna absolutely love this course. And if they can get going together, 
then the two of these, uh, then the two ladies up the front here are going to have their work cut out. And uh, what more could we ask for as spectators? You know, coming in, uh, and we're still, I think, impressed to see Lucy Buckingham here uh, swimming as well as she is right behind Lucy Charles Barkley because there is that question of her health and the possibility that she might not start. Have you guys gone to the line before, maybe at coming right off of, say, the flu or something like that, and how your performance was? I, I remember I've, I've competed where I came back and I was like, okay, I feel pretty good. Like, it was almost maybe a rest that your body needed or that your body was telling you about. Could we see something like that out of Lucy? I think it goes, you know, either way, right? Like, one way, if she's not quite fully recovered, then it could be disastrous. Or, yeah, you're right, she's had some rest, she's had a lot of electrolytes, she's fueled well. Jan was talking about a time where this happened to him and he wasn't feeling good going into a race. And I'll let you tell the story, Jan, but uh, basically I had one of the best races. Yeah, pretty end. much. I mean, my mum just fueled me up on chamomile tea and, and, and honey, sort of like 50-50 ratio just to get the sugar in. And this is the thing, she's got a, a stomach bug and those can sometimes hit you hard and fast. But, you know, a, as athletes, this is something that also has its benefits. It, it genuinely does. Your body's in a state of alarm. There is often some adrenaline. There is just, you know, it, it's not clear cut. It's not an advantage. You wouldn't plan for it. But right. sometimes it also takes the pressure off you mentally because if anything goes wrong, well, you know why. As we watch them extend their lead, hmm. the chase pack is actually split behind. Lots happening. Well, we're back with our two leaders. Sarah Perez-Sala has in fact been caught. They're not even bothering to get on her feet, so she's obviously not pacing well. So this is the second pack now that, and that's to me, Holly Lawrence uh, leading that second pack, uh, swimming very well, and pulling these women along past Sarah Perez Sala, which is, you know, pretty impressive actually. Sarah Perez Sala, probably one of the only swimmers who have got out the water in front of Lucy Charles Barkley, and that was in Singapore last year. Um, we're also getting some news. And good, good to see Holly Lawrence. Yes, Le leading strong. leading the second pack. You know, she's somebody who's had great success and then has had trouble over the years. Um, yeah, to see her leading the second pack that strongly, I think is. I'll put that down to, to see. Coach Julie Dibbins. She started swimming with Julie, uh, and there's a very good stream, uh, swim group. When you're in a really nice swim group, Jan, uh, it really helps, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, swimming is one of those sports. It can be lonely. Let's be honest. Depending if you're swimming in a 25 or a 50 meter pool you're doing 100 to 200 laps a day and keeping that motivation going on a you know five times six times a week kind of basis is is tough and julie divins is definitely somebody who doesn't just get you the physical kind of workout i think she definitely gets in your head she gets the motivation and it's just a concentrated group you know when you're kind of around the old saying goes you know iron sharp sharpens iron it's a very fo focused group and the mindset is positive and you know when you're by yourself you're dragging yourself to swim workouts i've had this time and time again when you just you don't have that group when you're in a foreign environment it is so helpful and again it's one thing to have that environment but it's another thing to translate it into a performance and here we go now it's that little bit touch and go around the boy, but it's so single file, they're not even on top of each other. Yeah, and we see Paula Finlay just hanging onto the back of that group. Uh, some, some definite firepower in that group, but as you said earlier, Kat Matthews, Daniela Riff, and Lucy Byram, I think that's a very dangerous trio. Uh, just a little, basically, third pack. Well, Kat, from what we know, has actually said her race is into T1. Yeah, that's that's her race. She's trying to get the swim. She, from what we can see, is not in that group right now. I think in a dream world, she would have been there. But, you know, I, I, I heard about some training sessions that, uh, that she was doing here on Thursday, riding the course, and, you know, she's got a great pace on the bike. So this is definitely early days as we see the lead. Pretty good gap here, too, that... Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham have put on that second group, uh, which has been led by Sara Perez Sala, as well as Holly Lawrence.
the swim about over for the women and T100 Miami as we're seeing Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham. They have the end in sight where they will be headed to T1. Be able to put on the shoes, get on the bike, the helmet, and head out onto that part of the course. And we talked about two kilometer swim, 80 kilometer for the bike, and 18 kilometer for the run. Well, I think the narrative of the race is going to be very similar again in terms of how much of a gap can the girls in the front get on Tamara Jewett. Tamara Jewett, I think on paper, is the fastest runner here, and we can see it unfolding straight away. Lucy Charles Barkley leading the swim. Tamara Jewett just hanging on the feet of the back as Lucy and Lucy come out the water first here, side by side. Let's hope for a smooth transition and um, it's actually quite a short way from here, even though they have to run a little dog leg to go past the bikes and then sort of re realign. And Jack is down there. So we've got the two Lucys coming into T1 here. They both look good. Lucy Charles looks very good. Lucy Buckingham is usually very aggressive into and out of T1 and loves to ride hard out of it. So watch for that to happen. Lucy Charles Barclay, this is pretty much the dream scenario for her. She knows that Lucy Buckingham's been sick. Everyone in the paddock knows that. So she's going to love that she has a, one of the world's best cyclists with her to push, push the pace rather than have to do it by herself. She can also follow her technical lines on the technical part of this course. Sometimes people say Lucy's technical ability isn't the best in the world compared to her straight speed power. So to be able to follow Lucy Buckingham's lines, if that does play out like that, is perfect for Lucy. You can see they've got a massive lead. Probably, probably a bigger lead than you would have expected given where they were halfway through the swim. The other women haven't even come in yet. There's also some really interesting developments. If, when we when we see the other women come in, we've got our first DQ that's about to happen. We've got the head referee waiting at the one of the athletes' bikes to DQ them. Sarah Perez Salah, Holly Lawrence, India Lee, Driven Group, Paula Finlay's managed to get on the back of it as well, coming into T1 too. This is a really strong chase group as well, actually. Paula Finlay, I mentioned that Lucy Buckingham is one of the best cyclists in the sport. In that category as well is Paula Finlay, is India Lee. This is a very strong group that will get straight on to chasing the two Lucys. And perfect situation for someone like India Lee, who's a really strong runner as well as being a great cyclist. So, I mean, probably a position that's a little ahead of where a lot of people would have expected to see her and Paula Finlay playing out perfectly for those two as well. Jack, you teased it a little bit there. Uh, it was Georgia Pirroni who cut the course, uh, and so that will be a DNF for her that you had talked about. As more of the athletes making their way through transition one, hopping onto the bike, and again, taking on 22 laps, a little over 22 laps here at the road course of Homestead Miami Speedway. Out in front, Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham, again, a Big advantage coming out of the water for those two. It's about a 55 second gap between Lucy and Chase Pack 1. So we'll go back to Jack to catch Chase Pack 2. Got Lucy Byram and Kat Matthews coming in. Two of the unbackable favourites, Riv, Daniela Reef, yes. and Emma Pallant Brown. So important that Emma Pallant Brown gets on to Kat Matthews and Lucy Byram's wheel, and this becomes a working group. This here is the group. If we're going to see someone make a big move, it's most likely to come from one of these women. Lucy Byron was in here quickly, out just as quickly. Kat Matthews and Emma Pallet brown will fight for that wheel because they know that outside of maybe Lucy Buckingham and Lucy Charles up the front, that's the, that's the lady who will be moving fastest on this bike course. They will hang on for dear life. They'll do whatever it takes to hold that wheel. Daniela Reef now as well. Extra firepower to the group. Tamara Jewett, Tamara Jewett is the last out, the slowest through transition. Again, her race depends on her being able to hold this really strong bike group. This is a powerful group, guys. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to see this uh, come together. Tamara Jewett, Tamara Jewett is vulnerable here. She is obviously, you know, not necessarily known for her bike strength. It has been the winter, maybe she's worked on a little bit, but that is a powerhouse group there. And she's gonna have to work very hard to stay 
uh, intact, and, and they're going to work very hard to get rid of her because she can run a 112 half marathon off the bike. <laughs> she can, but let's not forget, you know, Kat Matthews probably doesn't get the credit she deserves for her running ability. She is very fleet-footed <laughs> when everything goes to plan. And um, the other thing I'm really looking forward to is seeing Kat Matthews and Dan Daniela reef working together on the bike they did this at st george worlds um over the ironman distance they rode 90k together and they seem to have found this kind of kinship of riding together and and i think that could really add a spicy dynamic of course lucy byram being known to be a very strong but also technically sound rider which all which all of these ladies are so that could be dangerous for this front duo yeah, and that's taking nothing from Lucy Charles Barclay. She was one of the fastest bikers in Kona last year. I think she put time into the whole rest of the field, obviously got out of the swim first. So Lucy Charles Barclay and Lucy Buckingham, very strong cyclists too, but yeah, that's a dangerous group. And have to remind you, this is a non-drafting event, which means they have to stay 20 meters apart unless they're going to overtake another athlete. They have to do that in a 45-second uh, period of time if they're going to overtake that athlete they also have to overtake the athlete on the right they cannot pass on the left they are supposed to overtake the athletes on the right yeah rick maybe just to add to that for those of you who have only just switched on you can see two discs on the side of lucy charles uh, barclay's bike there the white discs that is a system called the race ranger which is a visual device that lets you see the diff the distance to the next rider the space has to be 20 meters at least. Once you are within that zone, you will see a red light blinking. Right now, we see a blue light at the end of Lucy Charles' uh, ba uh, Barclays bike, and that means she is that Lucy Buckingham is within 25 meters. Lucy is staying well wide of the apex on this turn, and let's see if she can fine tune that over the next 22 laps. They've done half a lap to get to the start of 22 laps and let's see how much strength Lucy Buckingham is going to have because it looks like Lucy Charles Barclay is putting the hammer down early. Prioroni, uh, Georgia Prioroni was the athlete that got the penalty. The athlete or is being explained the penalty from the official, and so I'm sure frustration there. So Geo. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why she's still putting her bike shoes on because she is. She's been DQ'd, so I don't know if she's a translation issue or if she's just. She can actually dispute the. Yeah. The DQ at the end of the race, but she does have to have to finish the race. So, I guess she's deciding that she will dispute at the end of the race yeah definitely that's her i think her only ticket if she wants to see the footage i mean um yeah um that would be quite a weekend otherwise for her and her partner if they both go home <laughs> with um with, with tough days um having obviously debuted here but here we have the first lapping already this has gone quick um, we'll see we'll see where this unfolds so if you are just joining us, let's remind you of what Homestead Miami Speedway has for all these athletes. Again, a two-kilometer swim, which is two and a quarter laps in the lake just on the inside of this track with the Aussie exit after the first lap. And then we go on to the technical 22-lap bike course. It is technical because the wind has been up, and it's very much a tricky issue going in and out of the corners facing the wind. And from there, we go on to seven laps of the run, 18 kilometers, and they will be under the lights by the time we get to the run tonight. No place to hide. <laughs> well, this season, it will be obviously 100 kilometer races. It's the T100 name, which is that two kilometer swim, 80 kilometer bike and 18 kilometer run. No drafting on the bike. We mentioned that you talked about the race ranger. Uh, three minute penalties for the first and second offenses. The third one is disqualification. Then you have to have the overtaking done in a 45 second time period uh, and there's also a 30 second penalty for a transition area infringement as far as the rules that these athletes are under 
Yeah, the rules will will obviously be laid out by the referees here. They're they're looking for people who are looking to gain an advantage, right? This is not about mistakes. This is not about honest mistakes. I mean, oh my gosh, it, it actually hurts me to see how honest they're riding. Look, they are so far away from the apex. They are wasting so much time here just because the rule is to pass on the right. I think there is come kind of an exception we saw in the men's field that if it is a lapped athlete you are allowed to pass them on the left to take the ideal line but Lucy Charles Barkley making sure here that she absolutely has no trouble with her referees as they stay out on top they've got a rough minute lead a touch under for Holly uh, Lawrence which is I think something Lor uh, Holly would be very very happy with I could definitely say Lucy Byram and her group with Kat Matthews and um, uh, Emma Pallant Brown and Daniela is probably more of a gap than they've expected to have. But you know, at the front here, it's early days. We saw the second half of the bike being really impactful as Lucy goes to do what she does best, best out of the front. Close look at Lucy Charles Barclay, who's out in front of the field here in the T100 Miami from Homestead Miami Speedway. The first ever event in the T100 World Tour Series. You see Lucy pass on the inside there. So that is typically not allowed, but because of the tangents of this course and uh, it just makes it's a safer pass to pass on the inside there and it's the faster line so obviously common sense prevails um which is fantastic uh, <laughs> but, but you're still seeing her not come anywhere near the apex of the turns yeah i'm very upset that lucy is taking the the, the turns very wide so uh, a lot of the men we saw them they were inside the patch so on a lot of those turns you see that lighter gray patch and and jan's mentioned it a couple of times that is a little rougher it's a different um surface so it's something that you'll need you need to navigate and get used to but Lucy's just completely avoiding it and uh, staying outside and and that's going to be a couple of seconds that she's bleeding every time she does that it is indeed and she's off she it looks like she's going to have to do most of the work by herself you can see in her face she's intent she's focused she's wanting to get out the front she hasn't even bothered rolling down her sleeves yet as you can see she's got them slightly rolled up which is advantageous for the swim just to give your shoulders a little bit more breathing room. But you want that fabric from the aerodynamic suit down as close to your elbows as possible, simply because that's where you get the aerodynamic advantages. But here again, you know, it's every time, uh, yeah, she she's training so hard, but she she's working on making this uh, course probably more like 81 or two, 82 Ks, um, simply by just giving up a few meters here and there which um, yeah, is one of the trickinesses of this course. It's very particular about this course where you're taking that many corners and you know the optimization could be something down the line that I would hate to see cost her. And again, when we were watching the men, they were hugging the apex of that turn right on the edge. Is that something that potentially Lucy's going to learn? She's going to realize, okay, I can go down there. I can be able to use, you know, a lot less of this course than I have been in these first maybe lap or two uh, and learn as she rides. I think that's definitely a, a something that might happen, but these athletes have all been out on the course and they've all ridden the course, so they, they know the apexes. Um, Lucy's decided that that's how she – oh, there you go. Oh. She's been listening. Yes. She must, she must have an earpiece. I was about to run down with a sign once more. <laughs> Come on, Lucy. <laughs> but, she, yeah, so, yeah, taking the inside line is always going to be a bit quicker. It does look like Holly Lawrence is making some inroads already um, and 48 seconds back. So she is having a great day so far, Holly. Holly, we haven't seen this Holly racing in a long time. So exciting to see that. Absolutely. Another thing I haven't seen is any of the girls reaching for the aid stations just yet. You see the bottles there from the men's race. That's only just finished, remember. Um, and it does feel like it has cooled off a little bit. Jack's just come up. He's been down there. How did you feel the temperature change? Drastically cooler, particularly even in the 30 minutes from when me and you went down to when I was in T1. It had cooled off, I reckon, even another degree or two 
uh, in between that gap. Yeah, to me, it's becoming really nice racing conditions. Like, it's still warm, but it's way cooler than what a lot of these women are used to, and it's drastically cooler in feel on the track compared to the heat of the day that the men were, wait, were racing in. So we might still see quite a few lappings and that kind of thing, but I think it is better racing conditions for women to hold on for longer, which is exciting because it could lead to seeing battles later into the race. Just going to say we just saw the Garmin T1. Lucy Charles Barclay was 117 in T1, so we'll see how that measures up with the rest of the field, but she was very quick through. So now we can just see, at least from our commentating booth on the other end of the side uh, of the course, just to finish that whole debate, um, even that big USA flag that's kind of not nearly as stiff in the wind as it was earlier. So it really seems like it's fast and furious today um, and, you know, going to make for, for some epic racing conditions and something that could definitely play into the hands of someone like Emma Pallant-Brown. It's almost like it's a completely different day. This, yeah. You know, we, we started the men's race, the, the, the flag was blowing a gale and the heat, uh, and now not much wind, not much heat, so much nicer conditions for the ladies. The other thing that will come into play is this race starts in the day and it will end at night and they will be under the light. So you mentioned the, the temperature change. It's going to continue to fall as the sun sets here. Uh, in South Florida, and that could come into play. That could be a part of the storyline here is maybe Emma Pallant Brown, this could be the temperature that she needs to have success uh, at this racetrack when it was hot during the middle of the day, but maybe just a little bit cooler as we get into the night. We see Lucy Buckingham uh, still trying to hold on to that second spot. Uh, Right now, Holly Lawrence, 47 seconds back from these top two. And as we see the top 10, it's remarkable that it seems like Daniela Reef has dropped out of the top 10. We also see Emma Pallant-Brown is currently in 12th position. And they're, they're, they're bleeding time to the front. So we have the next athletes being lapped. Is that... Jackie Herring. Jackie? Yeah, that is Jackie Herring. Jackie Herring. Jackie Herring. Um, so she so is soft pedaling there because you do have to get 50 meters in arrears of the athlete that just passed you. And you cannot relap yourself back out. Looking at Lucy Charles Barclay here, if we flash back to the European Open at the start of last year, she copped a fair bit of criticism for her bike position. It was a big talking point that it just didn't look like it was where a lot of the other women's bike positions were at. Later on in that year, her and her team went and did a heap of time in a wind tunnel and on a velodrome, doing testing leading into Kona. We then saw what she came and did at Kona, where she went off the front. She, like, she rode faster than most people expected. She was riding faster than Taylor Nib, for example. And we're seeing it again here. This is a bit of a new Lucy Charles Barkley on the bike. She looks like she's completely optimised everything. To see her go in front and be the one pushing the pace, even on a technical course like this, with, with an athlete like Lucy Buckingham, is surprising. I'm wondering how much of that is Lucy just taking charge and being a new version of herself on the bike versus Lucy Buckingham being sick. But it's really imp impressing me how R Lucy is looking on the bike the last six months and showing it again here. We take a look at the Garmin transition times for T1. And ranging from... A minute 11 to a minute 17 for the top 10 athletes. Again, thanks to Garmin for helping us with T1. I feel like this is also somewhat psychologically relevant with Lucy Charles Barkley realizing perhaps that this is Daniela's last year. And of course, Daniela being crowned the queen. Um, Lucy Charles Barkley is... I would say, fair to say, a crowd favorite. Everybody, everybody loves Lucy. She's, you know, she, <laughs> she, she, she's just nice, and she works hard, and um, she's been bridesmaid that many times that you are just looking forward to seeing her do well. And I think this is something she'd be getting a huge motivation of, realizing that for her also, this is the last year of chances to face against Daniela, and every time she's going to be there, she will want to be on her very best. As we see Holly Lawrence flying along and she's giving up no not even an inch on that corner yeah she's sitting third right now about 46 seconds back from lucy charles barclay you had referenced daniel reeve and 
her being this the final season for her. And as I was looking at her career, uh, Rennie, I was thinking of you. I mean, she has 43 wins in triathlon. You had a stretch, uh, I think your last 33 races, you never finished worse than third. <laughs> and I think over a, like 19 of those 33 races, you were in victory lane. I mean, you won top of the podium, uh, such a dominant end to your career. That, that might have been pre-children. I definitely finished <laughs> outside the top of the <laughs> top of the you know podium um, once I had uh, my daughter Isabel. But I mean, honestly, Daniela Riff has taken the sport to a whole new level. Um, you know, we talked about it when Chrissy Wellington came into the sport. Uh, she was just a phenom. Uh, I was kind of wedged in between Chrissy and, and and Daniela. Then Daniela came in and yeah, ten world championship titles, seven. Uh, sorry, five in the 70.3 and five Ironman world titles. That is just phenomenal, being that consistent for over a decade. Uh, yeah, I think the GOAT uh, the goat label goes to her as it does to Jan Frodeno in my book. But, uh, yeah, Lucy, Charles Barclay, as Jan was saying earlier, she's been bridesmaid four times at Ironman World Championship events to Daniela Riff. And right now it's it feels like it's Lucy Charles Barclay's time. And she actually has decided that she is um, setting up a whole season around the, the T100 race. She is trying to win this world title now. Yeah, she told us that she'll be at all eight of the events. Holly, Holly Lawrence, Lawrence, we were talking about her in the lead up to this race. We were on a, we were on a call, Jan, Rini and myself, and we talked about how Holly Lawrence had had some problems over the last few years that were sort of known about behind the scenes but not really known about publicly that she got on top of towards the end of last year, start of this year. She's brought on a team to help her with that and the team would tell you behind the scenes how much better she's got, how, health, how much healthier she is and we're seeing that right now. This is a position we probably wouldn't have seen Holly Lawrence in maybe 12 months ago, 24 months ago. This is back to the 2016 Holly Lawrence, who won a 70.3 world champion. And she's in a really strong select working group here. India Lee might be the most underrated female triathlete in the world. She's a really consistent swim, bike, and runner. You can see it there in her rankings relative to the field, being the seventh ranked swimmer, fourth ranked cyclist, and 13th ranked runner. I actually think that 13th on the run doesn't do her run justice. And she's in a group with Paula Finlay as well. Those three women there, they're three highly motivated women. They're not in that bracket of Lucy Charles Barclay or Daniela Reef yet, but they all want to be, and they all see themselves as three, three of the best women in the world. So seeing them together, that's a strong group that I'm looking forward to watch. And right now, India Lee's the fastest on the bike, even though she was ranked fourth in this field. She's the one who is putting down the best laps, and that has her fourth. Pretty good day to be from Great Britain if uh, you're in this field. As you see the top four up there. Well, you, Lucy. The Union Jack is uh, taking uh, residence in the top four in this race today. So uh, very impressive. A very strong nation. Obviously, Alistair Brownlee as well led a lot of the race on the run, sort of the latter stage of the race uh, also from Great Britain. The European takeover that <laughs> <laughs> Sam Long sort of said nearly happened that Jan took offence to, it's <laughs> definitely happened. There was At that time, there was eight of the top ten men in the top ten, and, yeah, we're seeing the same thing here now. Look at all those Europeans. Yeah, and I think Holly Lawrence's, uh, you know, journey that you touched on, Jack, is definitely kind of a testament um, to a v it takes a village. It takes a village to build a champ. You know, uh, having joined Julie Dibbons, I know her, her nutritional coach, Scott Tyndall, he's, he's excellent at what he does. And, you know, getting all of the pieces together um, is going to be, yeah, something that is what's gotten her into this position. So all the athletes who've come to Miami are energized about the start of the tour. Let's hear why Holly Lawrence had to say about the series. I mean, so excited about the T100 series. It's all we've been wanting um, for a number of years now of just like having the best athletes racing each other across the season, not just coming up for a world championships and everyone kind of picks other races all throughout the year. So yeah, I mean, I think it's good for the sport. I think it's good for people getting interested in watching the sport and it's more exciting for us. Now having a whole season long when you've got to be at kind of like, you know, in good race shape. Um, yeah, I think it changes that, that you, you can't have a weak race. T100 world champion would sound really good. Um, it's not something I, I don't think about the, you know, ultimate outcome. Um, it's all the process goals to get to, you know, where I want to be. But 
yeah, I mean, that would be the ultimate. Yeah. And right now, Holly Lawrence in third, chasing after Charles Barkley in Buckingham. We've nice. actually just seen India Lee go around Holly Lawrence while we threw to that uh, Holly Lawrence piece. Keep in mind, India Lee probably isn't talked about as one of the world's best cyclists. It's just because people don't know yet. She's definitely one of the world's best cyclists. And the reason you, you can sort of tell that and know that is because Paula Finlay is definitely talked about as one of the world's best cyclists. And Holly Lawrence, when she won her 70.3 championship, she won it because she was the best middle distance cyclist in the world at that time. Hands down, she is my dark horse for this race because uh, she's not just a potent cyclist. She She's a good runner. Um, yeah, she's definitely my dark horse pick for, for the race. All right, so India Lee, as we mentioned, just went by Holly Lawrence. And while we're talking about Holly Lawrence, let's go down to Rachel, who's caught up with her husband. Yeah, thanks, Rick. We've got Sean here. He's just uh, coming over to give us a few moments of his time. Holly's looking pretty strong right now. Uh, somewhere we haven't possibly seen her before in T100 races, really the kind of pointy end early on. Uh, any changes in the off-season to why she's in such great form at the moment? Um, no, we didn't do a big change. The, I think the only thing was consistency. We took um, most of the year after 70.3 Worlds and did a lot of winter training. Um, stayed home in Boulder after we got married and have just been training away until this race. So exciting to see where she's at. I know she's in good shape. Um, we weren't really planning to come here, so exciting to see her up front right now. Congrats on that marriage, by the way. They got married in the off-season, so congratulations to both you and Holly there. Uh, yeah, let's just talk about the season as a whole. Obviously, it's exciting. We have eight races to contest. What does it look like for Holly? What does she want to go? What does she want to race? Yeah, we. it's a lot of strategy having to do eight races or and then pick six of them. So we chose to come to Miami a little earlier than expected, so we didn't have to take maybe a mid-season trip to Europe and give us a little more time to train in the summer. But uh, yeah, it looks like this race probably skipped Singapore and then one of the European races, um, Ibiza most likely. So a little strategy in coming here to give us some space in the summer to train hard. Any of the training changes to kind of be directly for the 100K distance? No, she's been mostly a 70.3 specialist for the last few years, and this this race and 70.3 very similar, so it translates well. Um, no big changes, just focusing and staying, continuing to do what she's been doing. I'm looking at the top four as well. The Battle of the Brits is very much on. Does she think about that in her head as well, trying to come out on top in terms of the British athletes? I think she feels half American at this point. Um, she's lived here for, I don't know, seven years now, and... Being married to an American, she uh, takes a little bit of American pride. But no, she's still very much a Brit and would be excited to see.
side, the the NASCAR track that we just went through, it was like you could see it on the screen. It was black, like it was dark, dark. And I wonder just how difficult that is to corner through. Like you'll see that once they come out of it, which Lucy is getting towards, it does get a little bit lighter. You'll see there's some flashlights, and then when they get out on the main straight, uh, it's it's pretty much completely lit. I, but I hope India Lee can see her um, visor is very dark. Look at yeah. this. Look how well, look how dark it is on the inside of the track, which they spend half the lap riding in. Rennie, great point because I I pointed that out earlier. Uh, because Lucy Charles Barclay has a completely clear visor on her helmet, and others have a tinted visor because we did start in daylight. And so now some of those riders are probably wondering, oh, I probably should have thought about this because <laughs> there's still 20 kilometers left in the bike, and in the road course area, which is in the infield area, it's not as well lit as it is around the course that they're going to be running in just a little bit. We've literally never seen anything like this in triathlon before like this is the first time that that has ever been seen in this sport riding uh in in the night time like that with that little visibility it's like it's quite cool as a spectator you do wonder about the athletes and 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 how how much uh they're taking it a little bit easier because they don't want to crash and they want to nail the corners instead of losing time at them it's yeah it's fascinating to watch yeah we see india lee right behind Lucy Charles Barkley now. So she is going to roll up to Lucy Charles Barkley momentarily, I would think. Lucy Charles Barkley still leading the way here at the T100 Miami. Closing in on under 20 kilometers still remaining in the bike portion of this triathlon, the T100 from Miami. And now it's interesting to see here. This is the main straight. I think, is that what you call it in the NASCAR yeah, world? Yeah, sure. The we'll main the straight. Stretch. And you see just how, like, more significantly lit it is than the middle of the field. And it would be quite weird going from the light. Like, this is almost daylight light here. And then you look over the other side of the course where it's completely pitch black and they ride into that. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, this is bizarre, but really fun to watch. Now, I wouldn't say it's completely pitch black. There, is, there are lights there. The cameras can do some things uh, with the irises to give you a little bit more light there. Uh, but as you look across here, you can see uh, those different parts of the track. So it's kind of difficult, obviously, when they come into the very bright section. Uh, it looks like it's extremely bright it's not quite that bright and in the dark sections it's not quite as dark as what sometimes the cameras will show so i remember doing uh, a nighttime triathlon in germany this was about i don't know 20 years ago or maybe 15 and they had one completely pitch black section of the course and they basically took 40 higher cars and just park them so that <laughs> these cars with the headlights oh. would light the course and that's what we got around. <laughs> so it's definitely a far more professional act. <laughs> and I honestly, I, I agree with Rick here. Once you go out there, I think it's it's quite a natural flow. It wouldn't be as dark. Of course, you know, you've got the spotlight right here on the finishing straight. But this will be an interesting dynamic too. If Indy Lee comes and joins Lucy, you know, they could still together do some more damage on the chasers. I think they they would still be looking to up their buffer a little bit. I mean, two minutes is just on the verge of where you would see Cat Matthews, you know, have a have a good go at the chase, depending on where, where their run form is. Obviously, early in the season and hard to judge. But I think, yeah, they've got 20K to go, and, and who knows, maybe they'll team up and and ride together. Yeah, I think that's dangerous for that Lawrence Matthews Finlay group there. If, if these two, if India Lee goes around Lucy Charles Barkley and, and Lucy goes with her, uh, then that's sort of dangerous for for the for the next three ladies. So we'll see how that plays out in a, in a moment. But uh, and we have Lucy Byram going back around Cat Matthews there on that back straight. Paula Finlay taking the lead in that group, which was. Uh Nice to see the Canadian flag in and amongst all the Union Jacks. <laughs> but again, they're still looking very composed. Um, and, you know, right now there'd definitely be some tactics going on and, and, and saving some run legs.
that chase group uh, led by Holly Lawrence, Paula Findlay, and Lucy Byram. Uh, those three still chasing after Lucy Charles Barclay and India Lee. The athlete that was right up there running second in this competition for almost 90 minutes. But as we heard from her husband, she had been suffering from food poisoning uh, a little bit earlier in the week and had to pull out. And now Rachel is standing by with Lucy Buckingham. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, Lucy, it's been a pretty tough couple of days. And obviously, we saw how incredible you were out there for about 90 minutes. You've had food poisoning. You've had to DNF. Um, silly question, but how are you right at this moment? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rachel. I'm, I'm good. Like, I just had absolutely no legs. My legs just popped. And I think any athlete that knows, like, when you get a sick sickness bug or food poisoning, like, it's kind of inevitable. Like... You're gonna be a bit drained, and I tried like packing in the food this morning, and um, after about two uh, like porridge pots, I was like, I can't take on anymore. And uh, like when I was riding, I was trying to take on the gels, and it was like coming back up again. I was like, oh man. Uh, so I tried my best, and uh, unfortunately, it just wasn't my day. Would you have kept going? Because we got a glimpse of your husband. He had a whiteboard there, and it looked like he said kind of stop or, or, you know, pull out or something. Was that what he was kind of telling you? Uh, yeah, I, I'm really stubborn. Like, I'm, a, I'm the kind of athlete that, like, I just keep going until, like, I pass out. Um, but I know it's, like, really not good for me to do that. I've been there, like, I've, I've been a professional athlete since I was 19 and I've had food poisoning before in a race and I, I've ended up at hospital, in hospital, so I really didn't want that to happen. Um, but, yeah, like I said, I'm stubborn, so I probably would have just kept going until I conked out which wouldn't have been good so I'm glad he pulled the board up <laughs> that's what the husbands are for um I know it's hard right now but on reflection will you look back and go I was so kind of competitive for amount around 90 minutes of that race for sure and like I'm I'm really like grateful to like my husband and my coach and my team manager as well he, he like really gave me like um the support and the positivity that I needed to get myself up to the start line I knew it was going to be tough, but I've really wanted to, to take the opportunity because this is an amazing opportunity. Like, this T100 is, like, incredible for triathlon right now, and it, it's really putting triathlon in the limelight, and I just wanted to be a part of that and try and, like, show that I was a competitor. But, like I said, it just wasn't my day today. You were such a great competitor, Lucy, for around 90 minutes there. We really hope we get to see you back, and good luck. We hope you haven't caused any damage with going out there so strong. I hope you feel better soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really hope my teammate does well today. Lucy's still going strong, and, yeah, really rooting for her. And Lucy Charles as well. She's, like, really picked the pace up, so I'm rooting for those two to do well today. Still Brits, one, two, three, four, five at the moment. So hopefully we're going to get a clean two for the medals. Thank you, Lucy. Guys, back to you. Yeah, they pushed Paula Finley out of that. She, does, she only cheers for Lucy's. <laughs> yeah. Look at the little please. Pull out, please. <laughs> <laughs> the pull outs in big and capitals. Yeah. Does he have Canadian roots? You yeah. just wonder. <laughs> so polite. But uh, that was, uh, you know, the interview again, such high spirit, such a, yeah. such, such a wonderful young athlete who just has such pure intentions. You can just tell she just wants to go to her limits, sometimes beyond. And that's why she deserves to be here. Back to your point, Jack. She just, yeah, she, uh, in my opinion, she thoroughly deserves a spot. And she's, she's a light in, in the scene of triathlon. I think she's someone who impacts the sport. And I think that's what we're looking for. Yeah, and we have Kat wow. Matthews coming through here. It is very dark out there on that section. Um, you know, just, we're getting word from the course Holly that Lawrence, it is. That she's just yeah. caught. So Holly Lawrence has gone from being with Indy Lee to being two and a half minutes back. Um, I mean, she did look like she was struggling about halfway through, just with, you know, the whole body language and moving and uh, going up and down. But this is something that would definitely be the motivating. Look, again, she's got that, <laughs> what did I call it, smile? Cat man. <laughs> <laughs> it was a It's a suffering kind suffering of smile, smile. But you can see she's enjoying, because she knows every time it hurts her, it's hurting the others more. Uh, which is, of course, a quote from the great Sebastian Kiele. If it hurts me, it's killing them. <laughs> and um, it feels like Kat Matthews is, is, is here and actually enjoying herself. 
It'll be interesting to see whether Paula Finlay stays behind Holly Lawrence or whether she quickly goes around her to make sure she sits on Lucy Byram's wheel because Paula Finlay's made a point for the large majority of the day huh. to sit up and make sure she's at the back oh, as she throws off her dark visor. visor. Yeah. That does tell you it's very dark out there and it looks like it's only getting darker and darker with every lap. But yeah, just to see whether Paula just decides to play conservatively because she's clearly done that the whole day. She spent the majority of her time at the back of that group with Lucy Byram and Kat Matthews and is clearly just conservative. Serving. I have to say that's uncharacteristic for Paula Finlay. She's usually one of the aggressors and she's usually happy to take her turn. So that tells me that she hasn't got the bike leg she's used to. And yeah, we got to watch out in those back sections with the bottles on the ground and, and, and a little darker um, scenery. You see the sweat on the volunteer. This is the guy I was speaking to yeah. earlier in, in, in the men's race. He was one of the volunteers who's always running the extra steps because you've got to remember these athletes, they're coming in. 45 50k an hour depending on the wind and you're trying to pick up a static bottle so if somebody just hands it to you with a straight arm and they don't mo move with you that is a high impact force <laughs> but this guy we should have stuck a garment on him because he, he's done some mileage today just to pick up the bottles and run with the athletes yeah that, that's the spirit that's yeah, what we the like to the see the volunteers that run with the athletes i we praise you because that helps so much. Like even just jogging alongside rather than the straight arm. The straight arm, <laughs> you see that and you're like, that's a broken arm waiting to happen, you know, like, and, you know, me hop, you know, going over the handlebars. So, uh, yeah, that guy is definitely committed to his job and we appreciate it. But what we see here with Lucy Charles Barclay, what I really love is that champion's mindset. I don't think she's turned around once. I don't think she even knows that it's not Lucy Buckingham on her wheel anymore. She has just put her head down and she's just been focused, laser focused. She's looked on the scoreboard at the end. But other than that, her mindset is just go forward, keep pushing. And she's she's not making an, an easy gain for Indili. Um, she's, for the last 10K, been hovering there or thereabout. But um, it's certainly not an easy pass and it doesn't look like she's willing to relent the lead of the bike just yet and or I think at all. What, what we saw earlier was Kat Matthews Oops. sort of trying to motivate Lucy Byram. Um, Lucy, Indy oh, Lee's Indy also, Lee's lost, the also lost the visor. Yeah, so. with that dark back. So yes, that just goes to show that they probably couldn't see out of the, the visor in that back straight. But what I was saying, it was uh, Kat Matthews seemed like she had a little urgency and I bet she saw a split that that two minutes is now creeping out around 2.30 and that's where she you know, she wants it to be less than that. I think um, her and her team want it to be closer to two minutes or under. And so it seemed like she had a little bit more urgency um, in her appearance as she, you know, we saw her on the screen a little moment ago. Yeah, well, we heard Mark Matthews, Kat Matthews' partner, talk about the fact that two minutes to Lucy Charles Barclay, mm, that's a stretch, that seems like a lot. He said, but everyone else out there as it sits currently, we're confident. At the time, when he said that, it was 90 seconds to India Lee. I'd love to see what he thought about the fact that Lucy Charles Barclay and India Lee were now 2.30 and whether 2.30 was also too much for, for Kat Matthews because that is a long gap for someone who we all know is, is a really good runner. And the big question here, this is such an unknown to all of us. Like, none of us really have any idea who we expect to run faster out of Lucy Charles and India Lee. So if they come off the bike together, that's a really exciting battle that could tell us a lot about the, the season to come. I believe that's Sky Munch on screen there in all purple. Her favourite colour is purple, so Sky Munch there. I'm not... Yes, sure that's Sky Munch. Where, yep, where she is in you know, in terms of what place she's in right now, but... This guy's 10th. So 10th, yep, 11th and 12th on the field. They're around six minutes behind Lucy Charles Barclay. Tomorrow Sanchez. Tomorrow Sanchez. And then the Palin Brown should be next line as we see them. It'll be interesting also from a mental perspective, the two leaders battling it out because, of course, you know, Lucy's in a familiar place. This is where she's been. But uh, as you would know, Rini, I think one of the hardest steps to make in professional sports is the, the step from the podium to the top of the podium. Like you can get there, but mentally you can still allow yourself a little bit of slack if you're aiming for second or third. You know, you can talk yourself into a good, into a good race. And Indy Lee will be happy if she comes second. She would be ecstatic because that would be her best race yet. Whereas Lucy Charles Barclay, 
would likely not be. You know, she is intent on winning, and and we will. It'll be really interesting to see whether that mentally unfolds. As we're trying to guess these two figures, I mean, it is getting <laughs> darker and darker. Lucky they're wearing reflective suits and they've got they've they've got shining bikes. But um, this is indeed uh, probably well. It's definitely worse for us on camera than it is for them out there because your eyes obviously ad adjust as well. But uh, they do go from very light to very dark. And we believe this is oh. Appellant Brown no, who stopped on the track. Take a look here. Yep, that's yep. Emma Pallant Brown. That's definitely her. And not sure what the reason was behind this, but anytime you see those ambulance lights, you start to worry a little bit. Yeah. So I hope she's okay. Well, it can't be that bad if she's managed to get off and, and, and stop. We you can see the water running down on her legs, so she's obviously still sweating profusely. She has had a history at this track before as well. She's yeah. had a very, very dark incident happen here a few years ago with heat stroke and dehydration. And, and apparently we're hearing that she... She was loaded onto a stretcher and put into the ambulance. Yeah. So we really hope everything's okay there. It's, it's, it's very strange because everyone else has pu pulled out at the same point on the course just before this finishing straight over here. And she obviously didn't feel capable of going that way and stopping in the darkness. You kind of just hope that it's a moment of, of her wanting to disappear rather than there actually being, being a, medical, a medical emergency. And now we hope it's all okay with her getting off track with it being so dark out there. It's a, it's a really tricky situation. And we do want to welcome back, now that you can hear us around the world, I know we've had some technical difficulties uh, with the audio. We apologize for that. But uh, welcome back as we sit now on the final two laps of the bike, uh, which is inside of 8.5 kilometers. And out in front, it's Lucy Charles Barclay. Uh, out of the race after having a really phenomenal start, Lucy Buckingham, uh, after food poisoning over the past couple days, she said, her legs just couldn't go anymore. She pulled out, and a great performance early on for her. We've also seen Sara Paraz Sala off track. Tamara Jewett also off track. But on track and right in the hunt of this is India Lee, uh, following right behind Lucy Charles Barclay as we're closing in on T2 and making that transition into the run. And they're just uh, going past Jackie Herring there. Uh, she's a lapped athlete. So. But uh, still some kind words exchanged between India Lee and Jackie Herring. They had a bit of a laugh. You wonder what it was what it was about. I bet you it was about the, the light. Like, yeah. they're like, oh, can, see, can you see out of your type of thing? Because they both, like, really laughed quite a bit. Uh, and this is, like, such a unique like night that we're, we're seeing right. in triathlon yeah you look at this it almost is a bit funny in a way like <laughs> it is like apart from Jan at his German race uh, I've never <laughs> seen this in triathlon before uh, trust me no one ever saw that race either <laughs> <laughs> it was a long way away from civilization <laughs> Yeah, this is yeah, this is one that all the athletes will be talking about after oh, the race, yeah. sharing stories. This is not, not good. good. Yeah. Yeah, they're taking the ambulance. Uh, there's an infield care center here, uh, so I'm sure <laughs> that she will be getting uh, looked at right away. Tell us more about that, that Rick. How do you know that, Rick? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We do know that there's a vision chart in there, and we found out that Rennie is very good <laughs> at about 30 meters. So as these athletes come up, uh, they would have noticed an ambulance come across, I would think. Um, I'm sure, you know, you're racing, you see the, those things and you, you know, almost say a quick prayer. Hopefully it's nothing too serious. And, uh, oh, they're being told oh, they're to, being slow told to, down. to slow down. Wow, this is, this is huge. Yeah. Strangely enough, I, I, I cannot fathom that those motorbikes don't have their lights on. That would be That's helpful. what I was wondering yeah. too. Um, yeah. And... They do have their warning lights on. It doesn't look like these front girls are being slowed down to a stop. Yeah. But this would, of course, be infuriating if they, if the lead would lose time. Um, just from a race perspective, assuming that everyone's all right. I'm just purely talking about the race right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the ambulance was just—they were just it was trying right to get there in the, the corner. Yeah, and trying they to, to make, make sure, sure they wouldn't run up the back of the ambulance. So. 
Probably a momentary pause to make sure. Locked. Front stretch again, <laughs> and so we can definitely see uh, quite a bit better here. And seeing that Paula Finlay has actually decided to stay at the back, she didn't come around Holly Lawrence to get onto Cat Matthews and Lucy Byram just in case Holly Lawrence couldn't stay on. She has decided to, yeah, maintain her position at the back of this group and conserve and not, not ride aggressively like Rinnie said we're used to seeing her do. It, it either says that she's not in great form or that she's playing a really smart race. It's, I don't know well, which one. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that if these athletes are correctly spaced, you have to remember now to pass three athletes, that is a 60 meter pass you have to make. And I mean, 60 meters, that's more than half an athletics track. That's a long way to exert yourself. 6K you before you're about to slip on your run shoes. You know, right now you definitely have to be thinking about damage control. And she's probably thinking about the podium more than she is thinking about a win right now. Um, because, well, let's be honest, it looks like the win could very well be decided between these two front leaders. You mentioned these two, Lucy Charles Barclay and India Lee. That gap still about four seconds uh, between the top two and then back to Cat Matthews, who's about two and a half minutes behind them. You feel like Sam Laidlow had his, had, uh, sorry, Sam Long had his race kit made for this race. I mean, he's got <laughs> light and dark on his, yeah. suit, on his suit, the black and white. Right, I mean, it is tremendous looking at that inner circle. If you look at the car driving through, you can't see anything. And you've got to remember, none of these athletes have any lights or any help. And the motorbikes out front, which are supposed to lead the way and, 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 and clear the path, don't have their lights on for whatever reason, reason either. So perhaps it's just the camera distorting a little bit. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, definitely something unique and something that I as an athlete always cherish. But it really comes to shine here whether you're a morning or a night person. <laughs> Uh, Lucy Charles Barclay opting for the clear visor. I think that was a smart choice. Maybe didn't feel so smart the first couple of laps, but definitely the smart choice for this later stage of the bike, the second half of the bike. 5K to go, so... Last lap. Ding, Last ding, ding. Lap. Do you think the same here, Jan? Is it... Has in, Indy Lee... She's been at the back of Lucy Charles Barclay for almost 15K now. Uh, has she just decided to sit in and uh, in her mind has she gone, this is a run battle? Or is Lucy still pushing a pace that Indy Lee really just doesn't have it in her to go around and, and make a move? Well, if you look at the gap, it's, it, it seems far more than 20 metres from this perspective. So I think Indy Lee still hasn't closed that gap. At 20k, she was still about 10 seconds back and she's clawing back metre by metre. But this is what I was trying to refer to earlier with Lucy Charles Barclay. She has got her head down intent on a mission. Thank you, Mr. Motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. Turn on the light so Lucy can actually see where he's going. I mean, this is amazing. Of course, camera distorted, but yeah. you really can't see much. Um, but I genuinely think that Lucy has just not given up and Indy is on her way fighting to be in the best position she can be, but hasn't closed the gap fully yet. Yeah, I'd agree, Jan. I think Indy is still closing that gap ever so slightly meter by meter as you mentioned back up to to Lucy Charles Barkley and I don't know if she'll go past it'll be interesting to see I, I think she'll probably roll up to Lucy Charles Barkley and then just you know sit it's half a lap now so it's time to start thinking about the run and um, you know I can definitely tell like from this kind of like from experience this kind of position where Indy's in it's hard because you're trying to close the gap and you're trying to get aerodynamic, you're trying to be as efficient as possible, but it, it doesn't close. It looks like you're right there, but you're actually not. On the final lap of the bike now for Lucy Charles Barclay and India Lee, as they will be heading into transition two and taking on the run the final portion of the triathlon here. T100 Miami. Seven laps of a course. Well, we said you can't hide. Maybe in these lighting conditions you can. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is 
uh, absolutely ruthless as we see the field getting decimated athlete by athlete. Um, we are down to 14 ladies still on course. And yeah, it's uh, getting down to the wire. I think running uh, in the dark will be a lot more welcome than uh, biking in the dark. But uh, remember, they're outside. They're out oh, the, the yes. well-lit they well course there, uh, which is the oval here. So they won't have to worry about it. It's just this interior road course area that is there's just not a lot of lights. And they're only getting kind of the, you know, the flood of these lights that are around the racetrack that are lighting this area here, which, as you see, not very well lit. But a good corner there for Lucy Charles Barclay. I don't. I, honestly, I know I'm going to catch so much flack for this, but I feel like the lack of light is helping her <laughs> fly through these corners. <laughs> and I say that with an open heart. Yeah. I, I honestly, I am definitely going to go and speak to her and speak to <laughs> speak to Reese. Um, you know, she's done fantastic. You can't fault her because she is still leading the bike, but she left a fair bit of time on this course. I feel like. Um, that she could have taken more aggressively. But in the end, you know, you have to ride the course to your willingness to take risks and to your ability. And if that's what makes you more comfortable, that's how you have to ride the course. And she's done the right thing, you know. I'm obviously yeah, looking for optimization, but for her specifically, she's done exactly the right thing because she's, she's still, still in the lead. And yeah. if you go back to the changes they talked about last year, Reese was actually the one that was telling me, which is Lucy's partner and part coach with... Jan Fredino's old coach, Dan Larang, he was telling me they made all those uh, optimizations in the wind tunnel and the velodrome, but they also made the decision to go onto the indoor trainer and train a lot more inside. So Lucy did her entire Kona prep indoors on, a, on an indoor trainer, not doing any technical riding. She wasn't out in the mountains of Europe descending and cornering. She was just pushing power on the indoor trainer. And I know that she still has, uh, outside of her time at Lanzarote, spent a lot of time on the indoor trainer. And it maybe does go to show you that over time that does take away from your technical skills a little bit. Maybe it helps you when you've just got to, you know, be out in the Queen K pushing straight power in your TT position. But on a course like this, maybe it does have a slight disadvantage. Well, let's see transition to about to occur. And so far, we've only seen Lucy Charles Barkley in the front of the race. Uh, dominating herself and I have to give a little bit of extra credit you know she's finally become a world champion she finally got that got that title and that just means a lot of obligations over the winter and we know she had a bit of an injury issue with her calf in Kona she's obviously recovered and overcome all that in a fairly short space of time you know we're only in March here she's just getting ready catching her first breath as she rolls into transition and uh, India Lee <laughs> taking the time to stop her, stop her, her watch. Watch her Garmin. Her, her Garmin and uh, get an accurate power file. But look how close these two are. They're going to be coming out of T2 and running together. Well, this is the first time Lucy's taken a breath. She is definitely taken it very conservatively into transition two, taking her time um, to, to catch her breath. And take a rest. She had a bit of a struggle there with her helmet, so it looks like Indy might even be overtaking her in transition. Nope, she's not. She's out. And she's looking all right. Old fashioned head right to head. For somebody who's just led 82k of the race. <laughs> this is not unfamiliar territory for Lucy Charles Barkley. Uh, a little bit unfamiliar to have company. But um, yeah, we'll see how Indy does run as, as Mark said earlier, Cat Matthews' partner, Indy, has been running very well in training, and it's just a matter of whether she can finally put a good run leg together in a long course race. Uh, Lucy is looking looking great so far. She's flying right here, and I think she is definitely, on this dog leg, she can see, you know, they came into transition together, but this is already a significant gap, and I feel like you know, you often have this stage in an athlete's career where they have something that really hurts. And I think deep down, as great of a performance as it is, coming second four times to four different athletes in Kona is something that either makes or breaks you. And I feel like this could definitely be the kind of fuel she's needed in her career to just realizing it just pushed, winning is It's a just pushed her to such great heights, though, to have that carrot just dangling. 
yeah. for years on end. Second place in Kona, four years in a row. Not quite in a row, but four times. But it just, just it, it'll highlight to her that is a place she will never want to be again. Yes. You know, and I think it's something as an athlete, there is a true tenacity and a true mental fortitude if you can turn that around and actually make that your superpower. Because, you know, success seldom comes in a straight line. In fact, it almost never does. And there is always some kind of struggle involved with improving, with coming, you know, overcoming things. And, and she's just bouncing up and down right here as the other girls are coming in on the other side. She's got a huge gap, closer to three minutes by now as Lucy Byram leads the chase group into the transition ahead of Holly Lawrence, Kat Matthews and Paula Finder. Yeah, and it'll be really telling uh, this first sort of couple of minutes to see how the ladies look running. I, I always, as Jack said earlier, I love to see the athletes come off the bike because you can tell who looks good and who looks bad just in the first few steps almost. But uh, obviously Lucy Charles Barclay looking really great uh, coming off, off the bike there. And now we're seeing Kat Matthews getting her shoes on. Oh, sorry, Lucy Byron getting her shoes on and she is out of transition. As she said, maybe leave a few behind me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man. I like that comment. <laughs> I have a lot of time for that comment. Yeah. The other thing I'm noticing is that Daniela has stabilized her deficit. She's just come off the bike three and a half minutes down. But three and a half minutes is what she had about 20K ago. So maybe she's just blowing the cobwebs out bit by bit. And, you know, um, who knows what she can what she can unleash on the run. And um, we could actually see a Daniela that's, you know, somewhere in the top five or on the podium. Because we're used to seeing Daniela win yes. or we're used to seeing her out of the top 10 and that was a quick transition of hers she's already on the heels of paula the finley. first chase group and paula finley did not look like a million bucks to me um running out of transition two right there what we saw with lucy charles barclay when she left t2 she left it like she was the experienced athlete who wanted to take the race by the scruff of the horns and go and win it. And we saw India Lee sort of more take her time, not used to being in that position. It was sort of just seemed like a huge difference in experience, in experience which Rini and Yarn, you both touched on. It does look to have stabilised just a little bit now. India Lee seems to have found her flow a little bit uh, and, and the gap sort of stabilised. But that early gap that Lucy Charles Barclay formed, all because of how she attacked out of T2, probably due to her experience of having done it for the last eight years, nine years. Pretty cool to see. You know, these athletes are in, like, severe pain <laughs> right now, running off the bike. It never feels great, and you're basically, you know, full speed ahead. But she's taking the time to yell out to the women across. Kat Matthews. Kat Matthews, Matthews, and Matthews, a training partner. Yes, there was two women. I don't know the exact two. That It was probably Kat Matthews for sure, but I, I saw she yelled out to one of the others and gave a little smile and a wave. So uh, just cool to see. There's such respect in these athletes, and you guys all know how much you train and how much you have to train and what you have to do to get to this level as we see Haley Chura making her way out of transition too. But and I have to say, Indy Lee looking, looking the part. She looks like she's picked herself up a little bit. Her step is a little bit, um, a little bit more fluent. And, you know, despite the smile on her lip, it looks like she's finding her rhythm. But who is looking good out front here, asserting herself and her dominance, Lucy Charles Barclay. So as some of the athletes are making their way into transition and back out onto the track for the run, just wanted to give you an update on Emma Pellant Brown. Uh, this course has not worked out well for her. Uh, a couple years ago, heat exhaustion had her passed out on the track. Uh, it's happened again. Uh, she passed out. Uh, they took her to the infield care center and then have decided to take her to a local medical facility for further evaluation. Uh, but wow. just wanted to give you an update on Emma Pallant Brown. She's been uh, removed from the track and taken to a local hospital here. Well, it's obviously uh, a little bit more serious because we do know that there is a world-class facility here on course. We've just heard that she is conscious and that she's fine. But yeah, that, that is a risk of of racing in the heat it was obviously her fear as well so she's had that in the back of her mind and it's a tough position to be in you know if you if you look at our sport 
and where a lot of the racing is taking place, it would be a bit of pill to swallow because, you know, there's nothing like having a repeated kind of negative impulse as we see Sky Monch coming into T2 in ninth place currently. So still inside the top 10, as you see the, the talcum powder, the baby powder, which is supposed to soak up the first bit of sweat. I feel like that may be soaked by the time <laughs> by she the gets time she to the first aid station. You know, I love watching Sky Munch. She is always, you know, there or thereabouts. She won Ironman Florida late last year. Phenomenal run split, um, I must say, and has just been going from strength to strength. She is more of an Ironman athlete and typically sort of trends towards that direction. Oh, oh Kat Matthews. Kat Matthews. Kat Matthews. It looks like she's cramping up oh, and she no. had to stop. Oh, come on. Yeah, that's the left calf. When it's so humid like this, you're just losing so much salt. Oh, she, you could yeah, see. Yeah, she's, she's like, I can't, yeah. I can't run. Like, Paula Pomeradri is just tour. next level, but uh, yeah, she's tough. Cat Matthews, obviously being uh, part of the British Army, she has definitely gone through some toughness, but. Yeah, she looks stressed. She actually looks stressed. And of course, this is she's got huge yeah. targets. She's got the T100 series. She also wants to do the competing Ironman series, and she wants to race Ironman World Champs. So she's you know, a, she's she doesn't want to do too, damage so right here. Um, yeah, so if I were in her wrist. shoes, I'd probably take that chip off that leg. <laughs> I don't know. Give anything a try. But it's almost like she like mentally and everything else was feeling great and it's just like this one calf is giving her issue. That's why she's throwing her arms up like, yeah. I don't know what to I do. Feel, like, I feel great. I it's like, I feel great. Yeah, this just <laughs> won't stop seizing up. I mean... She's like, I've been waiting all day to run. Yeah. And now, what, I, what's going on? I really do think that's a sign that she's feeling great and it's just this... It's like the Christian Blumenfeld that we've seen so many times. It's yeah. Oh... Has she gone to a calf there or was she was just unclipping her pedal? Uh, no, she was just opening her shoes there, I think. But she did look back at her out. partner, Mark, there. Oh, she was counting the laps. She miscounted oh, the laps. She oh, she to got a transition. She missed it. And she missed it. But the good thing is, I think also from where we're seeing her running, it looks like she's got a cramp. It, it looks cramp. like it's cramp. It doesn't look like a muscle tear. It looks like she's... Not happy about the situation, but it doesn't yeah. look like she's done further damage. She's just walking too smoothly for that. Yeah, and you can see it lo does look a little locked up relative to the other car. Yeah, it's just a matter of whether she can loosen it back up and, and get back to running, obviously. This is what I was trying to allude to in the men's race as well. You get off and then you kind of judge your stride length where you can be in terms of how much toll your muscles have taken. And, you know... We don't only lose a lot of energy during the races, you lose a lot of electrolytes as well. And cramps are not always just a cause of a lack of electrolytes. They can just be a, th a, a thing of pure fatigue. Right. But this is where you need to adjust your, tri your stride length and, and your technique a little bit from time to time. But the calf, and especially here her lower calf, her soleus, is just such a central point that you can't really do much except hope that it opens up she's not favoring it though that's the one thing when she's walking it's not like sh it, she's limping or anything no. she just it, it seems like she can't get she it she can't to go push for it up she can't use any power yeah. it'll be a bit tricky on this course too because you can't really tell on tv but it is slightly cambered Correct. and it's her left calf and that's on the camber so it's like slightly downhill you can see how the track's downhill that does continue the whole way so there will actually be a lot more load relatively speaking on the left calf than the right calf so if there is an issue, that's the wrong car for it to be in because it will be the one taking more load throughout the run. It and looks so like emotions getting the best of her now too. And such a difficult situation where she is. She's on the other side of the track, the other side from all of her support. As yeah, I think the strength continues for Lucy Charles Barclay. Yeah, obviously you, Lucy Charles Barclay obviously still leading the way um, this it's just devastating for Kat Matthews. I think the run is her strength. And so she all day was, you know, biding her time. Obviously a great cyclist, a great swimmer, but the run is really where she shines. So to have this happen in the early stages of the run, yeah, it's just it's just not not cool. So she's trying to take on some nutrition here and see if, if that helps. Um she's gotta I think try and carry on if she can. So 
hopefully it loosens up. So we see Lucy Charles Barkley off the front. She looks really good. You can see the ice water that's running through her suit just shimmering in the light. But as good as she looks, she hasn't made that much time on Indy Lee. I think we've still got a race on our hands here because, yeah, definitely you can see the struggle being real. I think Indy Lee might get some kind of redemption motivation perhaps from seeing her training partner have a struggle on the other side of the course but um, in terms of pure time we're looking at 13 seconds is what we're officially given over what we've got left which is 14k that's an easy gap that's a, that's one second per kilometer and any misstep this can close in an instant and she got 10 seconds of that in the first kilometer as well yeah it's uh, Mark, Mark with her uh, husband cat, saying cat get, off, get off the course and she's saying no I'm going to keep going don't touch me. Yeah. <laughs> this is the thing about seconding uh, on the course because, of course, in triathlon, that is not allowed. As soon as you receive outside help, that is an instant DQ. <laughs> and here you can see <laughs> you talk to her, Mark, just talking to the official. <laughs> you talk to her. She's not listening to me. Do you remember when Mark said call? on the interview that, you know, they're both a bit prickly? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Matthews and India Lee. And <laughs> this is uh, a little insight into what's been happening at training camp in Lanzarote when... Uh, yeah, Mark refuses to make dinner or <laughs> Kat won't get Mark a beer. Yeah, Mark, Mark trying to talk her off the ledge, but Kat Matthews not having any of it. Well, that's you mentioned it earlier, the pride, the you know, just the fact that you want to finish. You, you've started something and you've trained for something. You want to finish. And so uh, even if she's walking, I think she's staying right now, I've started this. I want to finish. It's like the disbelief. It's almost like what we talked about, that she's like, I feel good, though. It's yeah. like just this thing, like, I should be able to keep going. I don't know what's going on. You can tell she keeps putting her hands out. Like, she's like, I just don't know what's going on. Like, it's it, the reason why she's not stepping off, like we've seen so many other people today, in my opinion at the moment, is that she feels great. And she feels like she should be able to be in this race. And you can see her point to her, like, I don't know what's going on. It's just like, yeah. It's like she's, and like Rini said, she's an experienced physiotherapist. So it's almost like she doesn't know what's going on with it and thinks she should be able to continue because of how good she feels, but something's going on. Well, let's also not forget the fact that she's just been passed by Sky Munch, Sky Munch yeah. to be Pamela. in eighth oh, yeah. place. So she's either an eighth or a ninth right now because I'm not sure if the second athlete was, uh, was lapped or not. But she's still in the top 10. You know, there is still merit to this. And there is still hope for her to open up, obviously, if she's not feeling bad and energetically still in the kind of shape that can get her through. So Lucy Charles Barclay, again, setting the pace. She has been up front ever since the horn, ever since she dove into the water. It has been her race to pace. I actually, I've had walks like this with my wife many times. <laughs> <laughs> forgot the poodle. Um, Kat, Kat Matthews so uh, frustrated oh, and disappointed no, in what is happening here. Yeah, so much effort. Pour your heart and, heart and soul into it. Don't you, you do, you do, and it, yeah, you're seeing seeing that now. Just devastating. I hope it opens up for her and she can just trot around, um, you know, and get that finish. But it doesn't look promising. Well, she hasn't tried either. Uh, she's walked for a long ways now and hasn't even tried to start running again to test it. Yeah, it's at this point we start questioning whether it there is she, just cramp or off. whether it's something a little more serious because this is not typical of cramp. This sort of reaction and behaviour, this isn't usually what we'd see. And maybe the, the level of emotion we're seeing here could be because she knows it's something more sinister and serious and she has huge plans this year, so... We really hope it's not, but it sort of seems like it might be. I honestly think it's also just, it's a disappointment. You come halfway around the world, and while it is a relatively easy trip to make from Europe, you know, the direct flights, 
it's a lot of effort and you can tell yourself whatever you want before a race. You know, this is just a training race. Oh, I've got these plans and I'm just going to roll through this one. It hurts and and it's painful and, and so it should be because when it means something, that's the way it is. But we see Indy Lee gaining back inch by inch. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a race on our hands. <laughs> and I am loving it. It got out to 13 seconds, Jan. It's now down to six seconds. Yeah, that might be one little silver lining for Kat Matthews, that her training partner and good friend Indy Lee is just out there shining right now. So, uh, yeah. T2. We do have a race on our hands, Jan. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty excited to see Indy come up on on Lucy there and, and see what Lucy's reaction is. On the left side of your screen there, the Garmin transition times for T2, very quick, ranging from 34 seconds up to 46 seconds, but a quick transition there from bike to running. Marta Sanchez there about to be lapped. Yeah, and let's not forget, I mean, this is not a once-off. You know, we are here, it's the, it's the early start of the season, and it is your first chance to get points on the scoreboard for what is a world championship title. You know, we've got seven more races, grand final coming up, and, you know, there are extra points to be scored there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the beginning of, of what is a long narrative, and you definitely would have liked to have taken that on and I think that's also one of the other things that's playing into Kat Matthews kind of despair right now that she was just wanting to be here to get an early advantage and to perhaps benefit of, from a good race in order to take a mid-season training break because at some stage that's something the athletes haven't figured out yet yeah. you know we're used to doing a big race or two taking a break rebuilding and there's no time in this kind of season to to do exactly that. So it would be indeed just tactically advantageous to do well. And again, a reminder as we talk about that world championship, the three best races, those point totals will be added together. Plus the grand final is how that we will determine the world champion for the T100 World Tour. And so Every race counts, and as Kat Matthews came in here, we saw that she felt in, in great condition, uh, thought that once she got to the run, she would be in contention to maybe even challenge Lucy Charles Barclay, but then the body just wouldn't do it. As we see India Lee closing in, now getting a little bit closer, looking strong back there, chasing after Lucy Charles Barclay. And even financially, you can see the breakdown on the side of your screen there. I mean. That's almost, that's <laughs> almost ten thousand bucks. That's nine thousand dollars difference between these two. Lucy now going for that ice bag as well. She's missed it. That would have cost her a second trying to get an ice towel. Um, it's obviously still warm out there, and um, you know there is oh, Indies coming through, whilst uh, Marta Sanchez is just getting out of the way, and this is. This is proving to be to be quite the race. I I think Lucy still seems so much in her in her zone. He doesn't. She still doesn't see what's going on behind her. Yeah. And full credit to that. <laughs> I love that. And you know how we said in the men's race, it's not often that a pass gets made and then and then goes back. So it's not often that in this situation, Indy Lee would go around Lucy Charles Barclay and then Lucy Charles Barclay would get back uh, in front of her. Lucy Charles Barclay is a bit of an exception to that rule. We know she had a famous run battle with Annie Haug in Kona where Annie Haug's known by everyone as the best runner in the sport. Annie Haug came up to her and then Lucy Charles, everyone expected her to fall away. She actually ended up pulling back and, and getting away from Anne Haug. So we know that Lucy Charles Barclay has a history of when someone runs up to her, it actually makes her dig deeper and fight hard for it. And it's not a fait complete that Indy Lee will come up to her, go past her, and Lucy Charles Barclay won't be able to hold on. This run battle is just starting, really. Absolutely, because I also believe once the pass is made, you know, Indy Lee doesn't have the magnet to pull herself visually towards anymore. And that's going to be a new situation. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, it deals, how they deal with it. But I can definitely see this turning into a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder battle. And, um, yeah... I don't want to jinx it. I don't want to call it. <laughs> but I don't think man, it can. how good will this sprint finish be? <laughs> uh, right now, running in the fifth position is Lucy Byram, and Rachel's standing by with someone very special to her.
Friends, Rick. Yeah, we've got Sam O'Shea here, Lucy's boyfriend, and we're just uh, having a little chat, saying, is this expected? It's early in the season, and Sam said, not really. She's doing pretty well for early on in March. Not, yeah, we weren't really sure, sort of, come here, swim as hard as she can, ride as hard as, you know, hopefully ride away like she did in Milwaukee, and the group sort of stayed together, but, you know, it's, it's March, and she's pushing on, and... I was just really impressed. Like she got a fourth, didn't she, at the US Open last year? How much did she learn from that? And how important was it to have those races coming into this season? I think, you know, she started a career sort of picking smaller races to sort of develop a confidence and then to go into a big race and, you know fourth was pretty impressive. She doesn't quite believe, you know, how impressive it was. So I'm just constantly trying to give her positive vibes and stuff like that and keep her, you know, realizing that these people are like, she looks up to these people. She look, watches their YouTube channels and like, you need to ride past them. You need to ride faster than them and constantly remind them. And she's getting there. She's doing it really well. So I'm just really happy with the progress. Is that a bit of an insight into Lucy that she maybe lacks a little bit of that self-belief that she needs to be on the podium kind of consistently? I don't think it's self-belief. It's just, she's just really, she, all she wants to do is enjoy it. She's just really happy to be here. Um, so as long as she's enjoying it, the results will come kind of thing. So yeah, I'm, as long as she's happy, we're, we're, we're happy with the results. Okay, well, at the moment, she is in fifth position. She just got overtaken by Paula Finley. Uh, Sam, fingers crossed she continues to have a good race. Thank you so much for chatting to us. Thank you. Thank you. Right, guys, back to you, because I can see lots happening at the front. Definitely a lot happening. And right now, a new leader for the women, as India Lee has gone by. Lucy Charles Barkley, let's see if Lucy will tack on to the back here of India Lee and what she has left. Wow, did you see the aggression she she, she put into that? I mean, her, fa her fa whole facial demeanor changed. As she came close, she really made sure to try and get a little surge to hopefully not take Lucy with her. And this is the first time we've seen a change at the top of the leaderboard. What a way to take the series with both hands and rip it and grip it. She definitely put in a surge yarn and Lucy did get gapped by about five or six meters, but it's now back on her shoulder. So that little surge from Indy Lee, it hasn't quite broken Lucy Charles Barclay, but I don't think we expected it to because of all of the athletes in World Triathlon, I don't know if there's a mentally tougher one than Lucy Charles Barclay. She is the definition of never give up, never quit. She doesn't have a quitting bone in her body. She'll, yeah, she'll, she's a dog with a bone here and, and um, I don't think this battle's anywhere close to done. There's not even any change in her demeanor. She, it's almost like she's indifferent as to whether she's leading or in second place. She's uh, just showing such mental strength here and like, okay, this is a race, the gloves are off and I'm going to have to raise my game here if I'm going to stay with Indy Lee and take this victory. But eh, maybe as I say that, yeah. <laughs> Indy Lee's now opened up a little bit of a gap, but uh, Lucy is not going to give up. Lucy has been losing time through the aid station for the last three laps, or two, three laps. Um, I don't know whether that's like on purpose, she's trying to take her time, or whether Indy Lee's actually just really attacking them and being aggressive through them. And now we should see Lucy Charles Barclay slowly try and work herself back up to the, the shoulder of Indy Lee after having lost that time in the aid station. That could also be something to watch play out throughout the race, whether that keeps happening. Because if she does have to work her way back up too many times and burn matches to get 20 metres back down to 2 metres, 1 metre, eventually that will add up, that surgy nature of, of losing time, gaining back up, losing time, gaining back up. Or the apex of those turns on the bike. Look here. Does I've, catch up? I, well, I mean, it's certainly a, a energy spent, but there are a lot of things right now that still play in Lucy's favor. For one, she is in the position that she hates being the most. Let's be honest. I think mentally that will be a huge driver. Indy Lee is, of course, also flying on cloud nine yes. because yeah. she has just gone past the reigning world champion, and that is a surge that gives you that kind of extra energy. The problem is <laughs> that also she has limited capacity. We are not even, well, we've, sorry, we've got 11K of the run. So we've, we've only done seven. We're not even halfway, right? And, and a surge hurts your opponents, but it also it hurts, hurts you. you. Yeah. <laughs> and the consistency of the pace is one thing. 
I mean, she's, you know, continuing, I think, in the trend that we've seen the last three aid stations, that she's gaining meter by meter by meter. But there's definitely a long way to go. And her facial expression has definitely changed from one of relative comfort to starting to grimace a little bit. I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said she's just flying on cloud nine. This performance will be the greatest performance of her career. And when you're on one of those performances, you can just find something extra. And so Indy Lee here just looking really good. Obviously, game's not over by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, that gap seems to be hovering right now. Uh, Lucy Charles Barclay just taking on a little gel. Um, and it actually looks like she's running back up to Indy Lee. So, I don't know. It's it's a race, guys. That's oh, what, we, what we signed up for. 15 meters. Uh, she's going to close the gap on that, I'm sure. Or we'll see. She's uh, got good posture. Her body leaning slightly yeah. forward. There's still an aggression there. You know, I think, yeah, everything's lining up for her. She showed us her new race suit that she designed herself. And, um, you know, she's... She she's absolutely flying. She's had a good training block along with Kat Matthews as we've heard now. But I think it's just amazing to see that kind of young spurting on the scene exuberance and innocence and just it's it's a place in a career that I really envy. You know, she's at the very, very beginning and she's got a whole journey ahead of her leading what is the World Championship Series? This will catapult her into uh, the number one ranked athlete, at least for the world title this year, if she were to take this. And, you know, what a beautiful place to be in. It's always good to be on top, right? It's a great way to start the year, yes. Rick. <laughs> in terms of motivation when you're running, you guys have been in both these positions where you're the you're the sort of first time uh, you're, you're finding yourself taking the lead of a big race for the first time and the wily veteran who's been there a million times and doesn't want to lose, like expects themselves to come first. What are the differences in what you're like thinking and what's going on through both uh, Lucy and Indy Lee's heads now? Like, wh Where are they different? Well, I think, as you said, uh, Lucy just, she's aiming to win and anything less is almost a failure. Um, it, you know, it certainly isn't a failure by any stretch of the imagination and getting on the podium. Uh, I'm sure she'll be happy with, but she goes into every race to try and win now. And Indy Lee hasn't won one of these races before, so it's a completely different mindset. She's got that young, excited um, energy that she's bringing into the sport. And it is very hard as, you know, one of the older uh, veterans of the sport, um, you know, to defend titles, but to have that target on your back. Uh, Lucy, Lucy Charles Barkley has been bridesmaid so many times, though, so I think she still feels like she's that... I, I, I feel like she still has that mentality of I'm still yet to have my best years. And, you know, winning this T100 series and winning these races um, is very important to me, but I think just the excitement to get into the lead for the first time and that's what India Lee the position she's in right now and I think it's pretty exciting to to see and I think she's on cloud nine as you said Jan. There's Holly Lawrence by the way uh, running third right now she's about two minutes 47 seconds behind race leader India Lee and if we go back to the bike like Holly Lawrence was losing a bit of time then she did manage to stick on to that Paula Finlay, Lucy Byram, uh, and Kat Matthews group. And now, because she was able to stay with that group, we're seeing her be able to take advantage of that on the run. And like, uh, maybe she can't win this race, but a podium finish for Holly Lawrence would be massive. And I think, again, above what a lot of ex uh, people were expecting and predicting, I didn't see many podiums that had Holly Lawrence on them. In fact, I didn't see a single podium predicted that was India Lee, Lucy Charles Barclay, Holly Lawrence. I didn't see a single one. Uh, of probably a, a few hundred. So this is it shows the nature of T100 racing. You literally never know what's going to happen, and both races today are showing that. That's why you run the race. I mean, we can have all the predictors of this person's going to swim this fast, and this person's going to be able to ride the bike uh, to this level, and this person's a better runner than this person. The problem right now is, is 
Lucy Charles Barclay is saying, wait a second, India Lee's not supposed to be this much faster than I am, and now she's pulling away from me. That mental game has to be, okay, what do I need to do to resurge and take back over where I'm supposed to be in this race? Yeah, and there's only so much you can do, really. Like, all that Lucy Charles Barclay can do is fight and dig in and try and now the gap's been settled a little bit and it, it's sort of establishing itself as Indy Lee has taken control of the race. All Lucy Charles Barclay can do is go internal and run her own race and run her own tempo and try and try and try to hold Indy Lee. But it's up to Indy Lee to get aggressive and continue building the gap and make it so there's nothing Lucy Charles Barclay can do about it. India Lee actually shaking her arms out there a little bit, just trying to stay loose. She's finding her rhythm and asserting it onto this race. I mean, I, I am I am genuinely impressed how she's just gone and taken the lead and, 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 and owned this race. She's, she's taken over. She's worked her way slowly, basically almost, well, it took her 80K to get and even out that swim deficit. Then, you know, first she had a slower transition, caught up to Lucy and now she's running and and really asserting herself onto this race and the only one who's running the same pace seems to be Holly Lawrence in third she I feel like they got off around about a similar mark of about 245 we really and haven't seen Holly race this well in years 2018 2016 maybe? Yeah. yeah I feel like round yeah. 16 she won the world 70.3 world champs in Malulaba yeah. and she raced very well for a couple of years after that and then she's kind of had a lull so you, you alluded to a few you know personal issues that she had um and and those were sort of sorted out but uh it seems like La Holly Lawrence is, is back and, and and showing tonight that you know she is an athlete to be watched as we move through this T100 series she would be ecstatic, and you know she will have a wild night if this goes her <laughs> way, and deservedly so. Deservedly so. Holly likes to have a good time, and and you know she's got uh, um, her her family and team here, and uh, and I think that could be a, a wild celebration, and justifiably so. But let's not call on it with only half of the run course being done. It's Paula Finley, Paula Finley. Um, looking though as though she's kind of set into her rhythm. She doesn't look like she's got the belief to run forward as yet, but who knows, maybe a, a Lucy Byram coming from behind could shake things up. Um, Daniela has lost a minute since transition two, so um, my prediction there was uh, was quite far off. <laughs> Just a bit off. Just a bit. Just a bit off. But you know what? You hey, look, it's the first race of the year. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. But I am, again, famous for eating glass shards, <laughs> looking into the crystal ball. But Lucy Byram here, uh, only, what, 20, 30 seconds behind Paula? That's, uh, you know, within striking distance. And if Paula's not careful, uh, Lucy Byram's going to come on by her. But uh, Punching yeah, far either. above her weight two in terms of her rankings. Yep. Yes. Yeah, as we see down the bottom there, third, 11th in the run um, is Lucy Byram. But again, she's a very young athlete. I think her, well, definitely, don't even, you know, for sure her best years are ahead of her. So, uh, Daniela, in her last year of racing professionally, uh, the, the goat in my opinion, um, and many's sitting in sixth place and having a solid day out there today. It has been a great race and a great start to the season already for Daniela Reef. Uh, I think, Jack, you have touched on it a little bit that not a lot of people maybe would have predicted this podium. Uh, as a matter of fact, some people didn't even think Andy, or India Lee would be on the podium. And she's definitely in a position right now where she could win this race to start off the season as the first winner of the T100. Well, yeah, I might go as far as to say that most people didn't think she would be on the podium. There's definitely some big India Lee fans out there who know how capable she is. Uh, I know we talked about it earlier in the race, and there is some people who for sure would have said that India Lee could have a big, big year. But 
the general triathlon fan, the majority of triathlon fans probably would have said that a top five result for India Lee would be a really, really good result. And maybe that fifth, sixth, maybe even fourth is where we expect her to be today. But this, <laughs> like this is, this is definitely above what most even like dedicated India Lee fans would have, would have expected. It's the rising of a new star, and I think what a time to do it, you know, where the evolution of the sport is. What a time to make a breakthrough over a winter and, and, and put your mark on the sport. I mean, this is, this is exciting. I mean, this is as good as it gets in terms of, you know, a, a springboard of performance um, for, a, for a young athlete to go and beat her compatriot. I mean, it is so hard to make your mark on the sport of triathlon when you're from the UK, male or female. It feels like it is just a talent factory of churning out athletes. And, you know, if they can stay injury free, then this like could be an amazing year. Yeah, for over 20 years, I feel like Great Britain has just punched out yeah. just superstar after superstar after superstar. And India Lee might be the next one. Just in line, India Lee's doing a little bit later, though, starting at 35 years. Yes. <laughs> I mean, better late than never, Rick. Yeah. Some, you know, obviously many athletes never get to the top and never get to win one of these races. So uh, really cool to see India Lee at 35 years old. I feel like that's sort of peak time for, you know, uh, I, I'm going to eat my words now because <laughs> there's so many younger athletes now, and especially on the men's side when, you know, you think about Laidlow and, and Rico Bogan, both world champions from last year, very young, but um, 35 was sort of the sweet spot, I feel like, for endurance athletes. I know Jan I and can. myself uh, won our, our big world titles in our mid-30s, so um, Indy Lee right there with us. She's still got six years to be at the top. Jan won one at 41 last year, so <laughs> six years to win what's six by eight to ten PTO. She could still win at least 60 PTO races, so <laughs> plenty of life left in her. <laughs> Well, yeah. and, and maybe this is the stage because Paula Finley, who's, you know, three places behind her, it was in 2020 where Paula Finley really burst onto the scene winning at Daytona uh, at the end of a COVID year where nobody had raced and everybody was chomping at the bit to get out there and, and see some competition. And Paula Finley went out there and made her mark. And maybe this is India Lee's turn. It most definitely is that way. I mean... It feels like, you know, it's it, it, it's an early stage of the season, but certainly a dominating performance that could show us more for the upcoming races. The gap now 13 seconds separating India Lee and Lucy Charles Barclay. Is there a kick still there? Could we see... <laughs> a resurgence. I mean, I think that's one of the questions. In the men's race, the question was, could Alistair Brownlee hang on? Could he continue doing what looked promising? Uh, and you guys, there was a little bit of doubt. Now is there a possibility that we could see a resurgence out of Lucy Charles Barclay and, and catch India Lee for this win? Oh, we've got 7.3K to go. At, at that, that's just over two seconds per kilometer. And, and things can definitely still happen at this stage. We're seeing how profusely these athletes are sweating. And a cramp can easily cost you 20, 30 seconds any day of the week. If there is a slight mishap in a transition, you miss, you know, personalized nutrition, which is available to these athletes here. Um, you know, that's the blink of an eye. So I definitely wouldn't shut this race down yet, despite India Lee looking <laughs> gold. I don't, front. yeah. I. I, yeah, it would have to be some sort of mishap, I think, at this point. Um, not, not a mishap, but like a, a cramp or, you know, misjudging nutrition or something like that. Uh, India Lee seems to be in control. It is only 18 seconds and there is a ways to go, but it just seems it's not like Lucy Charles Barkley is going to break into a sprint and, <laughs> and catch back up. Uh, Lucy Charles Barkley's on the rivet and so is India Lee. So it's just a matter of can they hold it through to the finish line? Keep in mind, this is triathlon. <laughs> How many times have we seen races like this where it's like, yep, this race is done, and then it's just not done. Yarn told the story earlier in the night that 
he passed Alistair Brownlee with 100 metres to go in a race, and I know Alistair Brownlee was a fair way ahead of him in that race. So it's triathlon. That's the beauty of this sport. It's why it's my favourite sport in the world, to be honest. It's so unpredictable, and you get yourself... When you watch enough triathlons, so many times you see this position. Yep, this athlete's won. Yep, that athlete's become second, third. And then it just doesn't play out like that, and you look like a you look like a fool. <laughs> uh, and so, never say never in the triathlon world. That's the beauty of the sport. How good was the intensity on Holly Lawrence's face there? With yeah. what she's she's fairly safe. She's a minute ahead of the next. She's two and a half minutes down on second place, and she is giving her all. She's yeah. not playing it safe. She's chugging down all the water she can get, and she's really, really intent on, on, on making this podium think, yeah. and not playing it safe. Yeah, and that's what it means to be on the podium, right? You'll you know fight. You'll give it your all. You give it your everything. And that's obviously Holly Lawrence on screen right now, uh, really working hard to hold on to this third-place finish. And as we said, this is a big performance for her. We haven't seen her race this well uh, for a couple of years now. So really great to see Holly out there just crushing it and she's about two minutes and 30 seconds behind Lucy Charles Barclay so probably not enough time still for her to take down the world champion but you have India Lee who continues to set the pace up front here Indy Lee taking on a little bit of nutrition there. Uh, a bit of, bit of calories, still 7K to go, so still a little ways to go in this race, so making sure she's still topping up those calories and uh, not making any mistakes there. To touch on a point that Jan started making before about Holly Lawrence and how she's still digging deep, and there's a bit of a, like a dichotomy in triathlon where... You're, you're racing against other athletes and so so much of your motivation can at times be about racing other athletes and like just catching someone who's 10 seconds in front of you but Holly Lawrence finds herself here almost you know two and a half minutes back from the next person in front of her and this is the dichotomy of it so much of your motivation can always be intrinsic and the whole battle for 18k can just be within yourself and it actually has nothing to do with anyone even though you're racing them for tens of thousands of dollars it can just be about getting into this battle internally of never stopping never quitting digging deeper and so many of these athletes that you don't realize when you're watching it like paula finlay for example it would be happening to her right now is having a constant conversation with herself in her own head that conversation can be things like don't stop don't quit if I can just run to this point at this pace, I'll be fine. Like she might look at her watch and go, okay, I've got seven kilometers to go. If I just get down to three kilometers to go, or, you know, some athletes count to 10 in their head. You just would be, unless if you've never raced a race, if you've never done an endurance sport, the internal dialogue that goes on in your head and what would be happening for so many of these ladies right now is such an unknown part of the sport. And let's not forget, they don't have the splits we do. So out there, despite this being extremely professional and, and, and one of the, the greatest setups triathlon has ever seen, as an athlete, you're still very much on your own. So you don't have those splits, and that plays exactly to what you just said, that the dialogue is internal. And I think it's different for each athlete, but I think what most of us tend to do is break it down into small pieces, break it down into laps, break it down into, yeah, like you said, the next straight, um, and just making sure you get yourself there as, as quick as possible. Because another thing I used to find anyways is that backing off a little bit on the intensity doesn't actually make you feel that much better. And mentally, I was always like, all right, well, let's just make it over as quick as possible yeah. so I can go lie in a nice bucket and feel sorry for myself. Totally. The sooner you get to the end. Yes. So I've got to run Indeed. a little bit faster because I'm going to get to the end sooner. Indeed, because very often it's not uh, a kind of... Uh, breathing problem you know that you're not getting enough oxygen it's your muscle fatigue at this stage that's hurting you your legs are just tired they're heavy you want to get there it's not the fact that you know in a in a thousand meter sprint or a thousand meter run where you or in a mile that you just can't get enough oxygen into your lungs and backing off a little bit just helps you to go into that aerobic level where you're able to you know metabolically work a little bit better right now it's just fatigue and tired legs that want to get to the finish line as quick as possible. 
You saw Holly there grab some ice and she put it in her mouth and in her hands. And those are two areas that help you cool. So, so surprisingly, holding ice in your hand really does help bring your core body temperature down and having some in your mouth. I never liked having it in my mouth because I felt like it just was harder to breathe. Um, but doing, you know, tricks like that help keep the core body temperature down. Obviously, it is nighttime, but it's still very hot. It's very humid out there. And we saw, obviously, sadly, Emma Pellant Brown succumbing to the heat on the bike um, this time here in Miami. So still very hot, still very important to keep the body temperature down. Yeah, currently it's 24 Celsius outside still. And uh, Eastern time is coming up on 8 o'clock. So I know those of you that were watching in uh, mid-Europe, uh, it's very late in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so early. But so, 24, yeah. 24 degrees is not an imp impressive number, but it was only 31 this afternoon. Right. Compared with the humidity that's also present, which I don't know what it would be, but my guess is in the 90s, it did feel very pressing. It did feel very humid out there. And that combination is just something that, you know, we can see it here on our commentators' windows that there is the humidity just peeling condensation. off. Condensation. <laughs> condensation, exactly, forming. And that's the kind of thing that makes Hawaii such a hard environment to train in. Rico Bogan's coach alluded to it earlier, saying they've been to Namibia, they've been to the heat, but that the humidity is something that they just underestimated, and he was toasted at the finish. <laughs> he, like, was. he was done. Well, that's the uniqueness about this series, this world tour, T100. It's not only here in Miami, it's going to go around the world and stop at so many beautiful destinations. opportunities to be on the podium and we take a look it started right here today in Miami next stop will be Singapore then San Francisco London Ibiza Las Vegas Dubai and the grand final which will be released as far as the uh, location for that uh, very shortly but you don't have to win every race again it's points accumulated your top three races uh, but to secure a championship, if you went out and won three races and the grand final, you're pretty much locked. <laughs> you've well, got it. You got it locked up. No doubt, especially. I mean, the grand final is points and a half. I believe yes. it's 150 percent. So that weighs in significantly. If you look at the overall, of course, you know, yes, Lucy Charles Barkley and Holly Lawrence, they got great points on the board today in terms of securing an overall title. It's a it's a decent basis. But I think the story of the day is just Indy Lee and how she has come through late in the race. She's played her cards extremely well, but she's looking very determined. Her eyes are still wide open. The stance slightly forward, and she is just making her mark on not just this race, but the series and therefore the world title that will be handed out. Two laps to go. Two laps to go, and the, the gap we can see has gone out to over half a minute. I mean, that is huge, and now it's like you, was, you were saying, Rini, that, um, yeah, unless there's a mishap of some sort, which we certainly don't wish upon anyone, no, it's looking very, very good for Indy Lee to make her mark on the sport of triathlon. I think the most surprising part maybe isn't that it looks like she's going to win. It's how, like, just how dominantly she's winning. She's 35 seconds ahead of Lucy Charles Barclay in second, and then it's three minutes to third. So if this is to be India Lee's first ever T100 victory, that it wasn't a close victory. She's completely dominating this race. And in a sport where we had, or what seemed to, to be such an established top four in Lucy Charles Barclay, Annie Haug, Taylor Nib, and Ash Gentle, India Lee might have put her name in amongst that. Yeah, on the screen here we have Lucy Byram and the GOAT, Daniela Riff. It looks like Daniela is just about to pass the youngster for fifth place. And we were kind of mentioning earlier, obviously, this is Daniela's last season as a professional athlete. But with Daniela, we, in historically in the last few years, I should say, it's either been a Daniela that's dominant and winning 
or Daniela's sort of outside the top five, more likely 10th to 15th. So Daniela coming in, obviously not as dominant as we have seen her before, but really solid um, all around today. So moving into fifth place, Daniela, I mean, this is kicking off the season very well for her. And obviously she knows it's a long season. She's also planning on doing uh, the Ironman World Championships this year. So a lot of racing for her this year. Both of you retired just recently. And so how difficult was it that final year when you made the, the conscious decision that this was going to be it? How difficult of a decision was it for Daniela Reed? I think it's very individual because it depends on where you're coming from. I was speaking to Daniela about it at the race briefing and she's like, I'm not sure if I maybe may have called this a little bit early. You know, I'm still hungry. I still want to. And personally, I think that's a great time. You know, the best meal in life you're going to have is never going to be an eat all you can buffet. Right. It always has to be a little bit too little. You know, you're always left wanting at the end of the meal a little bit. And that's where she is. And it, it's a great position. You know, personally, I had a very different position. I was coming from years of injury and, 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 you know, really it was almost a little bit in spite of not wanting to finish in the way that destiny seemed to have written on the board for me. So I think that's very individual. But from what I can see, Daniela is in a, in a good place and a happy place in life. And, you know, that can be a good place to, perf to perform really well. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head in saying that she's in a happy place. I, I got to sit down and chat with Daniela after Kona last year, and, and she finished fifth, I believe, there. She just seemed happy. I mean, she's obviously done everything she could have ever dreamed of in the sport. Obviously, the T100 C series coming up is a, is a new goal and something to reach for. But uh, you know, phenomenal career from Daniela, and when you've been able to win that much, you can walk away and be happy. And I think that, you know, she definitely will be at the end of the year. Uh, for me, when I retired, I, I think once I had my children, uh, my first daughter, um, Isabel, I was pretty much done. Um, I kept racing because I, I still wanted for one more great performance but um, in, in, in Kona at the Ironman World Champs. But uh, I, I didn't really perform as well after children. So, yeah, for me, I kind of raced a few more years, but it was really sort of a, a winding down. Kind of on the other side of that spectrum is right behind her, Lucy Byron, 24 years old. You know, it's funny because a 23-year-old on this racetrack got his win as the youngest NASCAR driver to ever win a race here at Homestead Miami Speedway in William Byron. And just uh, three races ago, William Byron won the biggest race in all of NASCAR. He won the Daytona 500. And these athletes, the winning athletes, are going to receive a helmet uh, on the podium, and it will have been signed by William Byron. Uh, so kind of that crossover between you're racing on a track that is famous for NASCAR, and you get uh, the biggest prize as far as the helmet signed by the Daytona 500 winner in William Byron. And I think that's an interesting point that you sort of started to make, that we've got a young Lucy Byram here and then the retiring Daniela Reef, the 10-time world champion, greatest of all time, you know, maybe even better than Jan Fredino. It's definitely those two. The thing about Daniela Reef, she changed women's triathlon forever, and Lucy Byram might be, like, the biggest representation of it. Women never used to ride the way Daniela Reef rode. And if you wanted to be the best in the sport, well, now you have to ride like Daniela Reef. She won most of her world championships by getting off the front of the bike, being in an unreachable position, as Rini can attest to, <laughs> having been on the end of that a couple of times. Uh, and Lucy Byram, we now saw her at the US Open and then again here today. She rides just as strong as Daniela Reef, as does India Lee, Lucy Charles Barclay, Paula Finlay, all of the women, Taylor Nib. It's because of the legacy that Daniela Reef left on the sport. She changed it, and that's what the truly special athletes do. They change the sport. They don't just come in and win. They win, and they change it. And again, announced Daniela Reef. This will be her final season, and she's looking forward to running as many of the T100 races as she can. India Lee is looking forward to hearing a bell the next time when she gets to the finish line area. They will ring the bell because it'll be one more lap around this track here at Homestead Miami Speedway. 35 seconds, that's a fairly comfortable lead. She's definitely still not looking like she's managing. She's still on the attack. I think she's 
not counting the eggs until they've hatched. And uh, well, the chickens till they've hatched. <laughs> the how, does, how does the saying go? The eggs don't. Anyways, well, we're off sure. down to watch the live finish of these very fast ladies. Oh, we'll let you do that. We'll let you head down. You can enjoy the finish once again as you did with the men's earlier. And so, Rennie, you and I are going to bring them home. See the athletes continue to work on their hydration even as they're coming up on this final lap. Again, Lucy Charles Barclay in that second position. She's just coming up on a lapped athlete there. That was Pamela Oliveira, the Brazilian athlete. But we have India Lee here moments away from just her best performance. And first, first place in the T100 series. And this is a this is a stepping stone. This will catapult her into the spotlight. So no longer is Lucy Charles Barkley going to go into every race and you know be the favorite or uh, any Haug say okay you know the favorite is going to be either myself or Lucy Charles Barkley. India Lee has now thrust her name right in the middle of this competition uh, as far as she is showing. As long as she can go one more lap here at Homestead Miami Speedway, she's showing that she is going to be a competitor fighting for this world championship in T100. But what it also does, Rick, um, yes, it does put a, a spotlight on her as one of the favorites, but it gives her a lot of confidence. A win like this really does give the athlete so much confidence that, hey, I can be one amongst one of the best in the world. I'm in contention for a win in this series. And so... Uh, I think that that goes a long way um, in just the athletes' confidence and their inner, um, yeah, just confidence and, and belief in themselves. So I will say that the number next to Charles Barclay was 35. It's now 33. Is there a possibility? Is there something still in the tank for Lucy Charles Barclay? A lap around here, again, that's 1.5 miles or 2.4 kilometers all the way around. Is it possible? You know, I think if it keeps coming down and then it's 15 seconds um, with a K to go or something like that, then I think she could do something special. But it needs to keep, you know, creeping back down. And, you know, I don't know if India Lee has anyone out there giving her splits, uh, giving her any, any information, but I'm sure she is not taking her foot off the gas one iota. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch in this last, you know, few hundred meters. Well, not few, few K, uh, and see if Lucy does start to bring that gap back down. But, you know, I think if, she, if Lucy gets within 10 or 15 seconds, then, yeah, it could be a sprint finish because that carrot is just a little bit too far right now uh, for her to really, you know, do anything much. But if, if she can creep back up to India Lee, then it, it will be an interesting finish, that's for sure. Holly Lawrence hasn't been able to keep pace. She's fallen off just a bit from what... India Lee and Lucy Charles Barclay had been running. And again, that's the gap. You can see India Lee, race leader, back here to Lucy. And Lucy looking down now more than looking forward. Yeah, she'll be well aware of where India Lee is. I think she's just willing herself forward, seeing if she can just, you know, every little ounce of energy, she's trying to get that out of herself right now, knowing that the, the end is near. They're only going to be hurting for another two and a half kilometers. So oh. what else do you have? What do you have left? They're in the only going to be hurting for two and a half kilometers, and then the race will be over. So you're saying you won't hurt after the race? No. The pain, <laughs> <laughs> the pain after the race pales into, you know, insignificance. Uh, honestly, okay. the pain that they're in in this moment is much worse. In an Ironman of full distance, yes, the 24 hours after that race, there's a lot of different pain. Um, with you know swelling and, and yep. all that sort of stuff, but in a, in a race of this distance, uh, yeah, the pain stops. You cross the finish line, um, and the pain stops pretty quickly. A little grimace there out of Holly Lawrence. She's running in that third position right now. And the expectations we talked about this, uh, especially when we were talking about India Lee, the expectations of what we thought she could swim what we thought she was going to be able to go out there and ride on the bike and then the run 
this race was expected to take about three hours and 41 minutes. And the pace that we're seeing now looks like they'll be well under that mark. Yeah, it looks like they'll be very well under that mark. I think the, the men were around 3.15 or yes. a little less. So, yeah, this is very impressive, actually. Um, whenever I, you know, we used to race, we would always sort of look at our times in comparison to men's. And obviously, it's a bit difficult. It almost feels like we're, you know, two different days because the men raced and it was, you know, much, much hotter. We had wind. The women's race came around and obviously, you know, we had nightfall, um, which brought the temperature down a lot. And also the wind dropped as well. So it's not exactly apples to apples, but we, we do like to look at the men's times in relation to the women's times and um, t just to sort of see how competitive the women's racing is. And, and I think that time is, is telling. That number went back up to 35 seconds, the gap between India Lee and Lucy Charles Barclay. Under two kilometers to go for the women. Paula Finley still back there in fourth, Daniela Reef in fifth. Yeah, I was just going to say, earlier we just saw a little bit of a grimace on India Lee's face. Uh, she's had sort of the same relaxed facial expression. You know, a little bit of pain on it, but you're seeing it, <laughs> a grimace a little bit more, just pushing that, you know, every ounce that she has and all the way to the finish line. She's empty in the tank now. This is the back stretch here at Homestead Miami Speedway. There's Paula Finley. Paula Finlay in fourth place. She's just such a consistent athlete. She always, obviously in Daytona, she won both of those a few years back, 2020, 2021. Uh, but Paula Finlay, always in the mix, always an athlete that is there or thereabouts. Um, you know, she was my favorite for today. But, uh, you know, I think she'll be one to watch through the series. She'll be one contending for the world title or at least a podium in the, in the overall. There's the gap back to fifth. Daniela Reef. Has put quite some distance now between herself and Lucy Byron. There's a little more of a grimace now out of India Lee. She can hear. Is she starting to realize? Yeah, she can. <laughs> she can hear the the crowd. She can hear the announcer here in the the racetrack. Yeah, I just wonder if <laughs> it's a grimace or if it's like the emotions starting to boil up as well. I think. Um, as I said, this is just the best performance in her career, and she is moments away from crossing that finish line and, and holding up the tape. Um, that moment, I can I can tell you, she's dreamt about, and she's visualized so many times in training, so many times going to bed at night, so many times on hard sessions, and for it to be coming becoming a reality right now, it is emotional, and oh, we'll see as she comes close to the finish line. I think there'll be a bit more emotion, but I think it's, it's starting to bubble up for her. Coming in with a PTO World Ranking of number 15 in the world. India Lee going up against the best of the best. And Lucy Charles Barclay. Inside a K to go now for India Lee. So three and a half minutes, three, probably just over three minutes actually for India Lee. So moments away. Under a 330. Very impressive. Digging deep, she continues. So, so cool to see a new face. A new star is born in India Lee. She's asking for splits there. You heard uh, a little bit of the audio come through. How far behind is she? She's, she? She doesn't want to make any mistake here. Yeah. Uh, can I take my foot off the accelerator a little bit? Am I clear? <laughs> I think that was a, just a little expletive <laughs> that she... Possibly. <laughs> she may have uh, yelled out there, but uh, I think you're clear, Indy. Just... The home stretch. Just finish it off. Drinks are on you tonight. She was able to take the top spot away from Lucy Charles Barclay on the run. She surged. We thought Lucy would be able to stay with her. She wasn't able to. The gap became over 30 seconds. And India Lee now <laughs> making the turn. Look at she this. can't believe it. <laughs> you can't believe it. I, lo I love that emotion coming, coming in. She's like... 
India Lee looks back. She won't see anyone. <laughs> yeah, the, this is just mind blowing for her. I think coming in, I'm, I'm sure she dreamt of this and, and you have to have had some belief that you could do this, but to actually have it happen. And especially, as we said, no one picked Indy Lee to win. The 35 year old Brit makes it onto the carpet. She's given the high fives and she has just stunned the world. India Lee is going to win the first ever T100 and it starts here at Homestead Miami Speedway. She'll walk across and grab the banner. India Lee wins T100. Yeah, a lot of emotion there you can see. <laughs> She, she always can't believe it, and you know, a, a hug from the goat, a hug from from Jan. Um, <laughs> tears of joy at the finish line in Miami. Here comes second in Lucy Charles Barclay, and still a smile on her face as she's thanking the fans for being there. Yeah, I, I think Lucy Charles Barclay will be happy with that performance. The second place is nothing to be, you know. Ashamed of, as, as we said, it's a long season, a lot of racing ahead, and, and she led for a lot of that race and almost pulled off the victory. Indy Lee had a special performance, and, uh, and that's what it takes, special performances to win at this level. Holly Lawrence still holding on to second, but she's still back a little over a minute and a half. It's Kat Matthews there with Indy Lee. Training partners and, and very good friends. Um, really sad to see Pat not finish, but really great to see her there celebrating her training partner and a friend. And, and Mark mentioned earlier, Kat's husband mentioned earlier, uh, if Kat couldn't win, uh, the athlete that she would want to have win is India Lee. So it's just cool to see training partners celebrating each other. The emotions overtaking her in it. It happened before she even made it to the finish line. The reality sunk in. <laughs> she still can't believe it. You look at the look at her face. She's like, wait, what? Do I wait? Am I pinch me? <laughs> Is this a dream? There's Holly Lawrence. Good strong kick here to finish out. <laughs> Trying to figure out where she gets to cut in. <laughs> Where's the finish line? Yeah. <laughs> show, me, show me to the finish line. Make the pain stop. Um, zipped up her suit. Um, obviously wants to make sure she shows off her sponsors and does the right thing there. But Holly Lawrence. Are Phenomenal performance today. Really great to see Holly back up on the podium. And it's going to be an all-British podium. Yes. One, two, three. Such a powerhouse nation. Uh, one, two, three. The Brits. They've done it at one point in time. They had the top five, top six. And it's going to be one, two, three. As you see a smile breaking in there for Holly Lawrence. And this will do it. Rounding out the podium with a third place finish here at T100 Miami. It is Holly Lawrence. I think that's Jan cheering in the, <laughs> in the background. <laughs> uh, so good to see Jan. Such a fan of the sport as well. Paula Finlay here coming in in fourth position. Ever consistent, strong across all three, Paula is. A great start to the season. I don't Definitely. think she'll be unhappy with that performance. The way to kick it off here in March and again Singapore in April. Paula Finlay, one glance over her shoulder just to make sure. She thanks the fans as well as she comes 
down the tunnel and she'll cross the line in fourth today. Paula Finlay in fourth place there. Interestingly, she traveled out to this race without her husband, or fiance, I should say, Eric. Eric. They normally okay. travel together, and he's normally at every race with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about this sport, is fourth place Paula Finley knows that India Lee, this was a life-changing win for her, and the smiles on her face and how happy she is. Yeah, the, you know, the athletes, they're enemies on the course, but friends off, and... It is great to see the, the ladies just, Daniela Riff here coming in in fifth place. A very strong finish for Daniela. Great start to the season, and this her final season. So Daniela Riff is fifth at T100 Miami. As we said, a very long season ahead, finishing in November. A lot of racing ahead, but uh, a great way to start the year. FaceTiming? I think we're FaceTiming. Is face that what's happening? <laughs> I think, uh, is she FaceTiming back home? They're, are they awake? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> the question. <laughs> that's great bit right Lucy now. Byram coming in, the youngster. Also from the UK. Coming into the finish here. An incredible young talent. Uh, I think one to watch for the future. Lucy Byram. Six across the line. <laughs> Haley Chura. The oldest athlete in the field, I believe. Barely, but yes. <laughs> A couple days. But yes, Haley Chura. She dressed appropriately for a night race. The night race. <laughs> That's right. Haley Chira coming in there in seventh place. The 38 year old. And a great finish for Chira. Great race from Haley Chira all around. Daniela Reef talking with Sam Long down there. They had finished their race. Some of the men are back out here supporting the women. Yeah, it's great to see that. The pro men finishing their race, getting cleaned up and coming back to, to cheer on the women. We'll have the podium. That ceremony will be coming up here very shortly. Here we have Sky Munch coming in. She'll be in eighth place. A solid performance from Sky. She's always such a tough competitor, no matter what she finishes. Typically, tends to more more towards the Ironman distance, but a very strong 70.300k distance racer as well. A little smile on her face, yes. I think. That's always good. A <laughs> wave and a smile. She comes down through the tunnel. Sky Munch is eight. The race is from the U.S., but is born in Canada. 
lived in the U.S. for a long time. She lives up in Park City, Utah. So you're saying right now they're not hurting? No. <laughs> I mean, there's there are a, a there's lot a of moment. smiles. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you on this no, one. No, the pain stop. I mean, they're so fit, Rick. They've yeah. they've trained so. I mean, yeah. There's a few moments right after when you catch your breath that it's still a little bit painful, but no, the the pain's gone. <laughs> they're so fit. They bounce back pretty quick, especially for a you know, three and a half hour race. No problem. Yeah, very impressive. Three hours, 27 minutes, and 12 seconds for India Lee. That's Pamela Oliveira from Brazil. I believe she was a wild card. She was. Yeah, that was the other factor that plays in that you know, some of these athletes were not made aware that they were going to be competing in this event until a little bit later than others. Yeah, there were some athletes like Annie Haug, uh, a late withdrawal. Yep. So wild cards were given out. Pretty late. I know Jackie Herring was one who was told a little bit later. She said she kind of had a, a crash two and a half weeks of trying to get ready to be in race pace. Yeah, it's almost like if you're on the cusp there, you just need to be ready in case yeah. of a call up. Because I feel like there, there's going to be instances all year where athletes uh, at the last minute can't make it or um, for some reason have to pull out. So you just need to be ready to be called off the bench. Ninth for Pamela. We have heard Jan's voice a bit, but Rachel down there as well. Let's go down to the finish area for Jan and Rachel. Thank you so much. I mean, I think we're all lost for words here because a star has been born in the USA tonight. India Lee, take a bow. That was spectacular out there. Are you pretty much speechless right now? Yeah, um, I, yeah I'm speechless. It feels like um, I'm watching myself like in a different entity. It's, yeah, it's, it's mad. <laughs> Take us through that moment when you passed Lucy. Like you had so much determination on your face. You were leaning like a little bit forward from the outside. It looked like such a, I'm here, I'm floating on cloud nine. Yeah. I want this. Take us through that moment. Um, well, I was just, to be honest, I was just looking at my watch and I had my coach's voice in the back of my head saying, don't go out too hard because it's better to be steady and um, consistent rather than try and just go for it. And so I was thinking, okay, I'm like going steady. Well, not steady, but I'm going to target, but I'm also catching Lucy. And then I was like, don't overthink it, don't overthink it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, I went past her and then I just thought, oh, if you go past her, you can't just settle down again. Like, just do 100 steps, like, with a bit of bit more force. Yeah, that's <laughs> So what I did that and then just settled them again. So. I think I overthought it. I said to Jan, I was like, she went with 12K to go still. Is that a long way to go? I know you have a running background. We actually used to run together back in the day. You went, obviously, to university over in the USA. Did you ever expect to make this transition and make such a successful transition from track now to triathlon? Um, no, to be honest, um, pretty much my whole triathlon career, I've been frustrated with how my runs always turned out because it's been a bit bit average to be honest but i knew that i had it in me to be able to run well because on one-off runs i can run well and so in my head it was just a matter of time to put it all together and maybe just learning about being more consistent being more sensible on the swim and the bike and races and i guess now i've got the confidence to do that which means that when i get when i get onto the run i'm not totally cooked so I think today was the first time that I've had a run that I'm actually proud of. Well, you can be very proud of it. Not to take away from your T100 Miami Championship win, but how does it feel to lead the race to be a world champion? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's <laughs> the first race of a very long season. So um, I'll celebrate it for today, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to start um, 
yeah, getting too far ahead of myself. Oh, of course not, but it's a, it's a great place to be. I think it's a great basis for the season. Have you planned it all out yet, where you want to go, where you maybe want to do a tactical pause? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to do the majority of the races. Perhaps I won't go to San Francisco just because of the travel that's involved there, uh, being based in Europe. So, um, yeah, off to Singapore next, then a bit of a break, and then crack on with the rest of the year. And where are you preparing Singapore, considering the climate? I mean, today was hot and humid. It could be more humid there, and it's obviously a hilly course. Uh, yeah, I'm anticipating it to be a, a bit more humid than here. So I'm actually just going to be preparing in a plastic shed in my garage. <laughs> Very cool, like Rocky, nothing. Rocky style. <laughs> uh, one final word as well. How special was it to have Kat at the end there and being able to celebrate with her? We know she's such a good friend of yours. Yeah, uh, I, I saw her on the side of the track on lap two and um, I saw that she was with Mark, so I, I didn't um, bother her. And I was also like, okay, like, concentrate on your race. You'll see her at the end. And then... Um, I was actually hoping that she'd be at the end, and then I saw her at the end, and then I just started crying, so <laughs> it was pretty emotional. <laughs> well, India said to us she's not going to sleep for days now. No, we hope you do. <laughs> Too much caffeine. <laughs> Congratulations. You are the leader of the T100 World Tour. <laughs> India Lee, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Congratulations. Phenomenal, Thank phenomenal you. achievement. Well, India Lee finished number one today. Well, let's have a look then win. at some of the more results Sorry. from the women's race. So, well, that is uh, obviously oh, well. round one then done and dusted. So much drama only in the first round, Jan. We have seven more still to enjoy, of course. We go to Singapore next on the 13th and 14th of April, then San Fran, then two European legs before heading back to the US, then to Dubai, and then a grand final, still TBC. Cannot wait for that one in November. Okay, well, I believe we can now chat to another one of our athletes. Uh, Lucy Charles Barkley in second today. A, a fabulous result. I know you'll be disappointed with that, but it's tough. The conditions are tough out there. We never know where any athletes are. Obviously, it's the first race of the season. How satisfied are you with second? Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that, to be honest. I mean, I've had not a massive block of training leading into this after Hawaii so I'm yeah just pretty chuffed with that I think I can definitely build on it now and I just really wanted to get through it in one piece and I feel like I've done that um, I had a great battle out there I mean Indy what a performance she put down super happy for her and amazing day for the Brits as well and you bring out the battle braids I mean it's one of your trademarks and I feel like you raced in true fashion of that you just t seem to take the race by the horns and go for it you led the race for the majority of it um, you got to be happy like after that kind of off season yeah for sure I mean I love the race I felt like I was having fun out there the bike was super fun and yeah I didn't want to back down on that run I did keep fighting and I was like could I get Indy at the end and I just couldn't quite get her and yeah I'm always willing to put up a battle and have good fun out there it looked really odd, I guess, as a spectator, how dark it was. Did you feel that it was dark? In patches, we were struggling to even see you on the camera. <laughs> it definitely got dark pretty quick. I felt like I made the smart move to wear a clear visor on the bike because I could just about see, but you felt like you almost needed car lights, to be honest, because it was getting super dark. But, um, yeah, it made the atmosphere a bit different for us. Conditions were a little bit more favourable for you. Did it actually feel that hot and humid out there? Yeah, I think we got pretty lucky compared to the men. I mean, seeing the men's race was quite worrying because it looked like a war zone out there and you could see them really suffering. But I think the ladies had it a little bit easier today and once that sun went down, it really did cool off. How did you feel about the technicality keys of the course? I mean, it looked like in the beginning you were very tentative around some of the corners and I was like, you are, you're, you're losing too much time here. You are, you're giving away your hard-earned effort. By the end of it, it looked like you'd really found your groove on those turns. Yeah, I hadn't done a great deal of TT bike riding before this race, and I definitely improved my confidence as the race went on. And I was like, yeah, I can take this corner way better than that. So, yeah, I feel like I just really got into my groove as the race went on. Uh, what do you also make of a Brit 1, 2, 3? I mean, domination from our country, hey? Yeah, we have got some really badass women in the UK, and I think, yeah, you just show that the Brits will always put up a battle, and it's amazing to see what we can do. And I think throughout this series, you're just going to see the Brits hopefully dominating. And again, we're asking a lot of the athletes this, where are we seeing you next? Are we seeing you kind of contest all eight of the series, or are you going to kind of pick and choose a little bit? 
Yeah, I think if I can stay healthy and do a good training block, I'd like to be at all the races. I think that gives you the best chance of actually getting the world title at the end because if you have a bad race, you've got more chance of having a better one in there as well. Exactly. I'm, still, I'm sure as well the fire is still there to win your first 100. Lucy, we hope it's next time. Fabulous racing out there. Congratulations on second today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right then, well, obviously we've spoken to the top two. We're going to still speak to our third place athlete, but for now, let's head back to Rick and he'll round out the leaderboard for us. Yeah, we'll take a look at uh, the finish of the top ten. You see the fastest on the swim. This is Charles Barclay. The fastest on the bike was India Lee, and then it was impressive. The run that she was able to put together, India Lee, Forging her name now as one of the favorites here in T100. With her win, it was Charles Barkley and Holly Lawrence rounding out the podium all the way down to an impressive finish for Kaidi Kiwioya, uh, finishing in 10th today. The pace well, got definitely blistering at 3 hours, 27 minutes, and 12 seconds. And we'll go back down to you, Rachel the PTO as well. Fabulous result. Uh, tell us how tough it was out there to get that podium, your first podium. Yeah, I mean, I think I just raced super smart and controlled and um, it paid off. I'm not often described as a smart racer, so I'm proud of myself. Really? I don't know. I don't think you give yourself enough credit. <laughs> <laughs> I think your race really started off well with the swim. You really asserted yourself in the front group there and we haven't really seen that from you in the past couple of years you've kind of been a little bit further back but you were on the front of that pack and driving it and yeah we haven't seen that from you so really great to see you back up there thanks um yeah i definitely lost um some feet of like the faster swimmers and that was my goal to kind of be a bit closer to the you know like lucy i think there's Haley chura sarah perez i think i caught up to um but yeah um I managed to like lead and like I that's my kind of safe space where I'm just like I get to cruise control but you know you've got a few touching of feet and stuff but yeah it was I think it's more of the swim that I should be doing than I've been doing for the last like couple years absolutely Holly we've seen you be at the very top you've had probably a few years of a little bit of struggle where you kind of probably haven't performed how you could be it's so good and wholesome to see you back. What did you change over the winter? What's, what's gotten you through? Yeah, um, honestly, I've just had a super consistent winter and I haven't had that for a while. Um, I'm definitely undercooked kind of coming into this and was super unsure of myself because like, I've not been doing threshold work really yet. I've just been kind of come out of winter training. So, you know, like I, it was my biggest tempo run today in the race. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I like it's just a good place to start the season from. It seems like one of the most brutal courses we might get on the calendar. Are you happy that it's now kind of out of the way and you got on a podium and you're very much looking forward to going to some of the other courses we have, which might not be so mentally challenging, the fact that you have to do so many laps around here? Yeah, definitely. 22 laps on the bike was something that I was not looking forward to. Um, but weirdly, um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a typically a great like technical rider, but I just took every lap as another opportunity to like nail the corners a little bit better than the lap before. So it kept me like more engaged. So I was actually really enjoyed out there. What do you tell yourself after five out of the 22 laps or 10? I don't know, but it seems like a long way out there and it seems like a lot of laps. Yeah, there's definitely ups and downs. And, you know, I had a little lull in the middle of it. And then, you know, when you've got other people to kind of pace with and yeah, you just have to just stay in it and stay like, present and that's the hardest thing sometimes and Sean your husband he's got something written on his whiteboard do you ask him to write anything on that whiteboard did he have a whiteboard I, um, did he have a whiteboard a lot of partners have whiteboards did Sean no and I, I didn't see him for a, for a while so I think he sometimes he hides because I think he doesn't want me to be like oh it's it's getting tough I'll just like you know end it with you but yeah if he was missing in action, we did get an interview with him, so he wasn't just having a beer, OK? But that's why. Uh, Holly, congratulations. Your first podium here at the T100. Uh, well done. I hope this is a sign of things to come for this season. Right, Please well, let's go then. Cold champagne for us. Oh, <laughs> we know you and deserve that. it, and we know you know how to party. You'll enjoy it, yeah. <laughs> Have a party. You'll enjoy that. Right, Jack Kelly is somewhere for us, chatting to Daniel Arif. 
We're here with the 10-time world champion, the greatest to ever do it, Daniela Reef. You've announced your retirement recently. You've decided the T100 Tour is where you're going to finish your career. You've done everything there is to do in the sport. Can you tell us about your decision to not only wrap up, but to wrap up at the T100 Tour? Yeah, when I heard about the T100 Tour, I just thought it, was, it would be a really great opportunity um, to push myself one more time. Um, I did feel it gives me that um, extra motivation to really work hard on myself and you have to work really hard because it's the best in the world you're competing at and um, I could see it today I'm still I'm, I'm solid but not not quite there yet where I need to be to be able to perform or fight for the win and um, I think I really want to even it's my last year and I want to enjoy it I really want to give my best and also perform at my best and so um, that the tour really gets me out of bed in the morning to work hard on myself. That's uh, one of the reasons. And talk to us about that, Daniela. What is it that you did today that got you fifth place versus what you need to do to win one of these races? Yeah, I mean, in one way, I'm a bit disappointed, but I think I also I, I have to just be realistic. It's been, um, I mean, I was most winter at home, um, training in, in Switzerland in the cold and a lot of indoor, of course, but I just need to get um, a few more months of, uh, you know, that speed work also outside. Um, it's the level is super hard. And um, yeah, today I could feel on the bike as well that I'm not not there yet where I need to be. So, um, yeah, just a few more uh, months of hard training. And then um, I hope uh, with a bit more altitude fitness um, that I can also compete in conditions like that because it was super humid, humid today. And will we be seeing you in a month at Singapore? I won't be able to do Singapore, um, so I have to leave out that because I'm doing the Ironman in South Africa. Um, and then I'll be back for uh, the uh, T100 in San Francisco. Daniela Reef, the greatest of all time, fifth today, an amazing result. Hopefully we can see you a little bit better than that throughout the year and win a T100 Tour race because that's all you've got to left to win in the sport. There's nothing else left for you. Uh, and once you've done that, I mean, there's no one else who can claim to be the greatest of all time, not even Jan Frodeno. So thank you for being here. Well done today. Back to you, Rachel. Yeah, thanks so much, Jack. Well, from one fifth place finisher to another in the form of Alistair Brownley. Alistair, thank you for waiting around because I know it's been quite the long day for you. Um, I'm going to go back to where it probably hurt a little bit. Uh, the fact that you went off so, so hard on the run. This man here in commentary said... I'm not sure he should be doing that. Is he going to blow up? You kind of did. Do you regret out going out so fast, even though it is typically Alistair Brownlee fashion? Uh, obviously, it's really easy to say with hindsight. Uh, I went out a bit fast, but yeah, at the time, um, I was really happy. I'd got through the bike pretty easily, I thought. Um, been very diligent with taking on water and cooling myself down. And um, yeah, I actually set off at what I thought was quite considerate in terms of uh, my pace. So I was like, yeah, this is good. I can't believe I'm pulling away from everyone else. I feel OK. And yeah, then I started to get very hot. <laughs> yeah, and I've got to bring you in there. Got to bring you in your thoughts, because you were saying a lot up in commentary. Alistair's I, here now. I, I was, absolutely. But I was really just wanting to come down and wrap you in cotton wool so nothing <laughs> breaks. So I'm first and foremost super happy that, you know, you, you got through unscathed. How are you feeling about the rest of the season? Um, yeah, I'm feeling good. Um, and I always knew that today was uh, a very early race and I haven't had a chance to do an awful lot of training. And um, as you could probably say, see, not a lot of kind of heat preparation coming from Europe. But um, yeah, I'm feeling good. And at the moment, the plan is to go to Singapore just to see if I can um, prepare for the conditions there a little bit better. Well, it seems like the course will probably suit you better as well. A lot more climbing, your kind of style of riding. We definitely, yeah, another month of fitness to keep it together. That's the, key. On the board. That's the key, isn't it? Not getting injured. Um, I actually enjoyed the, the course today, apart from the last few laps of the run. Um, yeah, I think um, just the corners on the bike actually have a bit more of an impact than you think. And um, yeah, obviously the, a bit of wind, the 20 metre draft rule, you know, actually makes the bike fair and good. And so, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. It was great to see you out there, Alistair, being so gritty, as we always know you're going to be. Uh, congratulations on fifth, I'm sure. It's not what you wanted, but hopefully you can go better in Singapore. Thanks for chatting. Thank you. Right, well, let's go then to the podium. So he's going to go off and I'll move this way. Um, the podiums now with Rick Allen. Please come and join us for the award ceremony.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the medal ceremony of the 2024 Miami T100. Presenting awards today will be Gabriela Gallegos, Executive Board Member, World Triathlon, and Sam Renu, CEO, Professional Triathletes Organization. In third place, representing Great Britain, Holly Lawrence. In second place, representing Great Britain, Lucy Charles Barclay. And in first place, and the winner of the Miami T100, representing Great Britain, India Lee. today to be presenting the champion's helmet from NASCAR Cup Series Homestead and Daytona 500 champion William Byron. Presented by Bill Christie, President and CEO Clash. Please join us for our athlete celebration. Congratulations go to all the winners of the 2024 Miami T100. Well, what a moment for India Lee then. I've got Rini next to me. And Rini, I actually haven't had your thoughts yet on what was such a spectacular moment. And as you said, nobody expected her to take the top spot today. Where on earth did that come from? I mean, I bet it's many years much, in the ladies. making, honestly. Uh, yeah, you don't get to stand atop of any podium without doing so much work. So happy for India Lee. And yeah, I, as you said, no one picked India Lee for that first place, but I can tell you, we'll be picking her moving forward and she'll be a favorite uh, moving forward. But yeah, just a breakthrough performance for her. A uh, uh, new star of the sport is born in the first T100 race. It was absolutely spectacular, wasn't it? As was the men's race, which finished many hours ago now. And with that in mind, let's go back to their podium with Rick Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the medal ceremony of the 2024 Miami T100. Presenting medals today will be Gabriela Gallegos, Executive Board Member, World Triathlon, and Sam Renu, CEO, Professional Triathletes Organization. In third place, representing France, Matisse Machirier. In second place, representing the United States of America, Sam Long. In first place, the winner of the Miami T100, representing Denmark, Magnus Dietler.
We are also honored today to be presenting the champion's helmet from NASCAR Cup Series Homestead and Daytona 500 champion, William Byron. Bill Christie, President and CEO, Clash. Well, Magnus Ditlev, then, he is your men's champion, the first ever men's T100 World Tour champion. And as I mentioned to Indy Lee a little bit earlier on, he's leading the tour as well, which must feel pretty sweet going to bed tonight, even though India uh, really did say she's not going to sleep for days. So let's hope she does <laughs> recover well and then uh, get to see her again, because it was absolutely phenomenal, as it was for these guys, which seems like a completely different day. But I do want both of your final thoughts. If we're not getting sprayed by the champagne, uh, Jan, I'll start with you and the men. A fabulous race, just your thoughts. What a race, honestly, so many ups and downs. We saw a tremendous performance, even though the overall favorite pre-race prevailed in the end, he didn't have it all his way. And I thought it was absolutely, it was a beautiful race. I got so excited. I had adrenaline, I had goosebumps in between. There were ups, there were downs. I'm exhausted. And really one final thought on the women as well. Oh, just India Lee all the way. Um, bummed to see Kat Matthews have to stop, but India Lee, incredible racing. Looking forward to watching her the rest of the year. Well, thank you guys at home for watching. We've made a little bit of history today, and I'm going to say it was pretty fun, and that's just round one. We have seven more to go. We'll see you in Singapore next month. We hope you'll join us then. Goodbye.